All right, hi everybody. We're gonna get started. So I just wanna first start by thanking you all for being here today. Um, this was a pretty fun thing to, to um, organize here, Jason and I, and um, some other people. <laughs> but um, yeah, so this is the, the DOD Cloud Post Processing and Verification Workshop. Hopefully that worked on there. Okay. Back one. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we just wanna introduce a few things first. Um, for Wi-Fi, it's password, no password Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi name is UCAR Visitor. So if you get on there, it shouldn't be any problems. Um, yeah, and so we have a note down here. We have a full house, as you can see. Uh, we do have some overflow rooms. I'll give some more information about that in a minute. Um, but yeah, we're gonna be nice and comfortable with each other the next two days. And so a little bit more on the participants and you know who we are, who this organizing committee is. So my name is Erica Dolinar. I'm at the Naval Research Lab. We have Jason Nechampkin here also at NRL. Jim Doyle was also one of the organizers. He's online attending virtually. And then Xuan Nguyen here also from NRL. Um, so we are from the Marine Meteorology Division. Um, this is code 7500 for those who care. Uh, and we're located in Monterey, California. And so we we first want to give a thanks to the Office of Naval Research and Josh Kosseth, who's here in person for sponsoring this workshop. And then a big thank you to Kerry Don and Fletcher, the AV team here locally at NCAR CPAS for hosting and all the logistics of this workshop. And I think these numbers are basically correct. Uh, we have about 60 people in person and um, about half of that are online. This is just a list of the, the different affiliations of people that are attending here today. Jason will okay. go over logistics well, or objectives. objectives. <laughs> so why do we bring you here? Uh, well, we really it's really important as you might expect for the DOD uh, to know where the clouds are and uh, what what's going on in the atmosphere, and especially lately, that uh, it's been really a hot topic. And so, uh, we ONR has been very interested in this, uh, as, as some of the other uh, DoD funding agencies. And uh, as you might have seen from the uh, uh, flyer, the, the main things we want to talk about today are you know, probabilistic cloud forecasting, statistical post processing, cloud an analysis techniques, cloud diagnosis, uh, and verification and operational verification uh, operational requirements so that's a big thing you know a lot of the scientific community may understand or know what what is needed operationally in the DoD and that's part of the reason we brought everyone together and uh, since we do have a really full agenda today uh, I think one of the big things that that happens during these workshops is is during the breaks you know that's where everybody collaborates that's another reason we brought everyone together to talk get to know one another and maybe have some uh, collaborative uh, opportunities here and uh, some other big picture items that I was thinking about, uh, and maybe you might be thinking about also, is like, how do we co cope with observational uncertainty? That, that's a really big thing when you're looking at clouds, because, you know, what, what is a cloud? How do you even define it? Uh, you can talk about cloud fraction, which is, you know, you can have a 100% cloud fraction, but if it's just cirrus cloud, you know, that's still pretty transparent. So maybe opacity or optical depth is better. And another really big one is, uh, what do we do? How do we prioritize uh, the funding, the methods uh, for the future to improve cloud forecasting. Is it better NWP, better post-processing, or just better communication? Uh, ONR is very interested in knowing uh, and interested in funding ideas that, that may further cloud, cloud forecasts. And now into the logistics. So we have the, the agenda online, there's the link there, um, it's also on the back of your name tag for those here in person, you can go on and look at it there and follow along. Uh, we have just a couple um, changes to the schedule. The timings are all the same. We just have a few people that are that were not able to attend in person. So now they're gonna be talking virtually. So for the talks, the lengths, the normal talks, they're 20 minutes long. And then the invited talks are gonna be 50 minutes. We're going to have cards up here that will um, let you know of your your timing. 
So for the shorter talks, we're gonna give you a notification at three minutes until um, your talk time is done. And so back up for the 20 minute talks, we'll have 15 minutes of your talk and then five minutes for um, questions and discussion. And so at that 15 minute mark, um, prior to that, we'll do the, the three minute warning and then a one minute warning. And then for the longer talks, we'll do a five minute warning and a one minute warning. Um, yeah, for out there for the virtual presenters, please be online during the break prior to your, your presentation so we can make sure all of the, the AV is working for you. Um, the next point here, we're, we're going to be having a panel discussion at the end of the day today to talk a little bit about operational requirements or, you know, some of the requirements that people within the DOD um, are needing or things that they're looking at. So we have a list here of those people that are going to be um, on that panel. Uh, at the end of the day today, uh, you know, after that panel discussion where we have this icebreaker event, um, social event at, here locally offsite um, down on Pearl Street at West End Tavern. So we have the whole rooftop reserved for us. So everybody that's here, you're welcome to join us for, for heavy appetizers and there's gonna be a cash bar. So everyone's welcome to that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have breakout rooms um, on the second and third floor. So if you guys want a little bit more, it's, it can be a little crammed in here, I'm seeing already. If you guys wanna spread out a little bit, you can go up to any one of these rooms um, at any time today or tomorrow. Just note that the room on the third floor, we only have until about lunchtime tomorrow. Um, on Thursday, so tomorrow afternoon at the end, when everyone's done their talks, we're gonna have some breakout discussions to talk about different topics here. Um, now, just in general, for the coffee and snack breaks, we're just gonna have 20 minutes. So like Jason said, these are really great times for everybody to get together and talk and collaborate, talk about science. So we can use that time to do that in addition to some of these um, breakout discussions. And we'll have an hour for lunch um, on both days. And so regarding lunch for, if your organization requires you to pay for lunch, and this is for federal employees, uh, we ask that you go online and pay for it um, through this link. You should have received the link in an email you know, earlier um, this week or previous weeks. Um, we just ask that you keep your name tags with you um, if you leave the building so somebody out there can let you in, they know that you're here for us. And one other comment, we're gonna do a group photo. Uh, when, when is that? Just before lunch. Just before lunch today. So stick around, we'll wanna get all of your smiling faces. Proof that you were here. <laughs> and then the last thing, yeah, just a little bit more information about this icebreaker social event that we're having at the end of the day. Um, it's at West End Tavern, it's on Pearl Street. Um, there's plenty of parking in the area. I'm told that there's a bike station right out front of the restaurant and out here um, by the building. So if you wanna take a bike, um, you're free to do that. But like I said, there's plenty of parking around there and whether they're metered or parking garages. Um, heavy appetizers, so come hungry and cash bar. And so the timing we're planning is from six to eight this evening. And so with that, I think we need to move on to our yeah, first speaker talks. Yeah, right. question, yeah. If anybody, restrooms, used to, yes. <laughs> that direction, which is south, we're facing west, that direction on your right-hand side or straight behind us, turn left at the corner and there's bathrooms in those two spots. Great. Yeah. And a cafeteria, fashion credit card for breakfast and lunch. Yeah, lunch is, is you paid for lunch, so there's more than one area that ends here. Yeah. So you know, it just goes and goes. <laughs> but you can go get a drink from, from there any time of the day. You can usually just get a drink too if you need it. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that is the end for us. We're going to get into talks now. Yes. And Josh Kossith is going to be our session chair for that. So we're going to start with, uh, I think, Evan Kuchera, um, who's got an invited talk. Hey, Evan, so come on up. Uh, we're going to bring up your talk. 
Um, I think that you said the slot was about 50, 45 minutes. So I don't know, around 35, 40, I'll be like, all right, let's wrap it up. Yeah. So I don't have that much prepared. So hopefully we'll get back on, on track. And then I really, you know, I like workshops because it's back and forth, you know, and so I've encouraged that throughout my whole talk. Feel free to just interrupt me. So, so yeah, 16th weather squadron within the Air Force. Test that out. Very good. Um, wanted to introduce the folks that are here with me. So I'm Evan Kachera uh, from, from the squadron, the chief of science and services. And I'll we'll get a little bit more definition of what that even means as we go through the talk. But then Berkeley Gallo, if you want to raise your hand for me, Berkeley, is she's the, my deputy there. Jamie Foote and Willie Sedlacek um, work in our group as well in all things data simulation, clouds, and post-processing verification, run the gamut. Also want to point out our program office came to this, this meeting, which we really appreciate. That's Jen Luce, Lila Lotson over there. We got a whole row of us Air Force geeks there. So, um, so I often explain what we do. We're, we're similar to NCEP EMC in, in, in that we have you know, a heavy modeling mission. So we're running global models, regional models, land service models operationally. Um, the difference for us is that we we spend a lot of time tailoring all of that to specific problems in the DoD, whereas SEP EMC is more of just general purpose, you know, information for everybody. And a lot of the talk here will be focused on on some of those details. So so operational organization, um, you know, we're we're trying to automate everything that we do um, on a day to day basis within the military construct. It's um, you know speed wins. Um, if you look through the through the history, you want to be faster than your opponent at, at everything. So we want to be faster at, at producing the good weather information. Um, and that's what we do to supply everything within Air Force. Uh, also, we support the Army, lots of uh, intelligence applications, which are very interested in clouds, as you might imagine. Um, and so just a quick overview of, of some of the things that we do. Um, it's Is there a way to, to cut off this? Yeah, there is. Excellent. Oh, wait. Yeah, very good. All right, now we can see the whole slide. Um, so like I said, kind of the basic modeling mission, we run uh, global land surface, uh, global and um, atmospheric land surface Analyses and forecasts out to 16 days, and and I'll I'll detail you know these things a little bit as as we go in here, um and and what I want to do is just kind of overview who we are, but then we'll quickly get into the specifics of clouds because I want to make sure we under, understand what we are as an organization. Um, we do a lot of ensemble modeling, very important for us to do the probabilistic piece. So I, we've been doing that for a long time. We have um, it's all wharf based at this time, one kilometer ensemble uh, domains, and also larger uh, four kilometer uh, domains. For a long time, I'll talk about the history about this um, rapidly updating uh, global cloud analyses and forecasts. Um, we've we've been people that have been doing this for a very long time, but it's got, it's gotten stagnant and stale, and uh, we we need to improve it uh, desperately. And we're working on that a lot. But we'll talk about kind of that stale capability and where where it is right now. Um, and uh, we we use the the Met Office's model, and um, with the ensemble stuff that we do, we feel like we're we're providing a lot of value in the operational space. We also focus a lot. Um, against our will most of the time, but a lot on cybersecurity, because yeah, of course, if it's if our stuff isn't cyber secure, um, you know, there's a the potential it won't be useful when it's needed. Um, again, against our will at times, but we realize that's important. So. so, people might be familiar with the concept of DevSecOps in our organization. We've had to fight quite a bit for this to get to where we can make modifications to what we do um uh, as needed um and not be something that that requires a lot of meetings and and, and process sign up so that if somebody needs a, a small modification to something for a military purpose that we have all of the, the the checks and tools in place to be able to make that change make sure that we're not introducing cyber vulnerabilities make sure that the quality is there um and and so that's a a big part of what we want to be in our organization we want to be responsive to the to the the, the things that are happening so the example image there is a, a product we collab, uh, kind of cobbled together to produce um, a long range ensemble soil moisture forecast. Well, not just a soil moisture forecast, but it's basically a mud forecast. Um, so for you can think of the trafficability issues in Ukraine, um, that they they wanted a long term look uh, at that. And that's not something that we as an organization, it's not like we're a lab where we could like thoroughly research that. What we did is we, we found the things that were out there already that, you know, played into that, the variables that existed, the uh, NCEP GFS ensemble had a lot of you know, relevant variables in that. And then we developed something quickly, got it out to them. And then and then they turned that around and, and used that for decision making this past spring. Um, so for, for that to happen, we have to have really good collaboration with the users. This is one thing, again, that we we focus on in our organization that's different than say an NCEP EMC is that we are we are directly working with the, the people that are that are using our products and we're then modifying those uh, those products based on the feedback that we get and also working with them to make sure that, that the information is integrated into their decision processes properly so that they understand what they're what they're getting, especially with like a lot of the probabilistic stuff, make sure that you know they understand what that is and, and how to get it in there. So um, 
again, a little bit more about, about our mission. Um, we want to provide those, those operational insights both to our users, but also back to groups like this, our program office, or even research organizations. So I, I was happy to see that one of the focus uh, areas of this workshop is that operational perspective. We are more than happy to provide it, and we want to provide that uh, because we want to help make sure everybody's, all the research work is um, you know relevant to, to things that are coming. I know everybody that I've ever worked with in the research communities, they want their stuff to be useful, right? Um, and so we want to help make sure that we're steering things in that regard. Um, people are everything for what we do. Um, we're one of the rare federal organizations that's doing uh, remote work. We've got about 10 remote staff now and growing um, because we want to make sure we get the right skill sets and people for the, spe uh, the specific mission that we've we've got. Um, and as like I mentioned before, you know, making sure that we're, we're educating our users on how to use our products and, and, and ways to leverage. So getting into the capabilities a little bit. Just wanted to kind of touch on the history of clouds. I had to do some homework on this because I'm not old enough to remember <laughs> these things. Um, you know, all the way back to 1971, I've got the link there that you can look at that paper. Um, you know, not long after satellite data was, you know, actually starting to be, you know, a thing, um, we started to do the short-term forecasting. You know, very coarse resolution you can imagine, but um, but but really since day day one of these capabilities, we've been um, looking into uh, trying to do cloud verification. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why we still have separate capabilities. So we have a, a, a cloud system that is not based on NWP at all still in 2023. Um, we have a lot of modeling capabilities that I'll show you that are, um, there's there's a lot of operations tied in the, the, the legacy systems and, and others in operations might might recognize this um, th this issue that like you, you do a good thing and everybody gets used to that good thing. And then it becomes really hard to change it because if you're gonna change something, everybody else has to change. Um, and so we're struggling with that. Uh, but we're uh, putting more energy into trying to trying to get past that because we feel like at this point we're not serving our users with the best possible information that's there because the technology has progressed so much. Um, some of the use cases, as I mentioned before, uh, intelligence surveillance, reconnaissance uh, missions, um, both both the safety of those missions, uh, you know, the the drones will crash if they get icing on them, you know, that sort of thing. But also, obviously, whatever missions they're trying to do, um, just normalizing aviation hazards for for the other you know aircraft that the the military uses. Um, a use case, there's there's more use cases in this, but I just wanted to give an example. Does anybody know what triggered lightning is? See that before? Yeah, a few people, right? So um, it's a pre pretty neat thing that I learned about a couple of years ago when I went down to visit the space launch stuff. So, so if you have mixed phase clouds that otherwise would not produce lightning and you send a rocket through them, um, it will make lightning. And so they learned this the hard way back in 1987. And again, that's kind of a special use case to where, where, where our typical lightning algorithms wouldn't be picking up on a threat here. Um, but because there's mixed phase clouds in, in a certain you know, region you know, that they might be sending the rocket through, that that's very dangerous for them. Uh, so there are these, like I said, call them kind of edge cases, like unusual things that we also uh, have to account for um, in what we're doing. So and this is where I have to skip a slide because I put them in in the wrong order. Uh, so this is... Um, the, the capabilities we have now that are that are mostly not uh, numerical weather modeling based. Um, people may have heard of WIMCA before. It's the world, Worldwide Merged Cloud Analysis. So that's taking like all the current satellite data we can get our hands on, using some background information from NWP and the land surface analysis to try to assess where clouds are. Uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, that uh, The products are produced every 30 minutes. And um, the we actually have a, a tuner that will look at the, the seasonal biases in the, in the satellite data uh, to make sure that it's... Uh, being tuned proper. We're trying to automate that um, using some AML, AIML techniques, but it still is a, a human input process there. And so, so this product is is reasonably good if if you're looking for you know where are the clouds at right now from like a stitched together global scale. Um, the stitching itself causes problems. You can you can see the seams sometimes in the products. Um, and and so and the other thing here is that the resolution is like 24 kilometers, which is not all that different than it was back in the 70s. Um, and so so we're not again we're, we're we're kind of not giving the best foot forward here. We have Advet Cloud, which is um, just a simple advective technique that takes the the analysis clouds and and blows them around. And you'd be surprised that in the first couple of hours that does all right. But of course clouds evolve on relatively short time scales, and so it's it's not. But three or four hours into the forecast that that starts to become degraded compared to what you can get from numerical weather prediction. And then we have a, a, a statistical correction forecast. Again, this is a very old capability um, that creates a, a, it basically takes the, the numerical weather prediction model outputs and tries to make a cloud picture that looks like WIMCA. Um, and that goes out to 144 hours. So these are, again, the, kind of the legacy capabilities that we're trying to move on from um, and, and, and in some cases uh, improve um, as we go forward. And so now I got to remember to go back a slide. Please do. I encourage everybody to to do that. So uh, I want to learn more about the seasonal biases. Is that just because of the um, 
you know, in the winter, you got cold air that starts looking like clouds, or is there other things that you're talking about? That's a fantastic question. I'm not really real um, smart on this, but it is that sort of sort of a thing. I mean, I've, I've seen the, the uh, Kelly Courtney who does that work where there will be, you know, it'll claim there's a satellite and then she'll, she'll be like, no, it's not not right. And, you know, kind of kind of watch it out. And I think it is that kind of kind of a thing. Okay. So, and so those biases then are, are caught. It's not like she has to do that every day. She basically like tunes the satellite. So like a new goes bird goes up or whatever. And she'll look at a whole bunch of stuff and kind of set the set the parameters. And then that'll become, you know, what what's there. Uh, sometimes the, 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 the data sets drift a little bit. So she kind of monitors that. But this is something that we're real prime, like AIML should be able to do that kind of a problem. Um, we're just we're not real good at like setting up like the, the data curation storage piece of AML yet, so that's why we're struggling on that a little bit. So, yeah, I was curious about the uh, diagnostic cloud forecast. That that sounds like something that also could be yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and I know I've, I've read the agenda for this, this meeting. Like lots of people are working on that. <laughs> it's way better than what we're doing, and so we're, we're super interested in, in learning about that. This is something where we haven't. Um, you know, somebody back in the day did something really, really you know. Technically advanced for that time, that person's now retired. Documentation is not good, and so the rest of us are just trying to make sure that the thing keeps keeps going. Um, but we we certainly like see a use case for the, the statistical correction of a global model. We'll talk more about that as we get into the meat of, of the cloud piece of this. Um, but this is kind of real basic and not uh, not state of the art at this point. Okay, right, others. I, I got one other quick one, which is that the advict and the the uh, okay. Diagnostic cloud, they do they overlap in time, or do you make sure that they're not uh, there is a twelve hour forecast from different products? Yeah, there's there's definitely you've got a twelve hour forecast coming from our regular model from yeah, the Advent Cloud and DCF, and so okay. you've got you've got different conflicting you know products, and we don't like that, of course, but that's just a legacy thing. Do you have any guidance on that, or you know how does that get interpreted for the user? Uh, so that's that's a great question. I think most people are using so so most of our use case is the short term, which is that Advent Cloud time and and then the other use cases that are longer like the the, the user community sort of know what they're what they're looking at so there's not people at it okay so most people don't use the that. model for sure i had a um, major king yes so actually used to work that mission so to be clear the the advent cloud output is provided in hourly and so it's only the the one two and three hours is essentially that are pushed forward to the customer so oh okay yeah so so the so customer DCF, doesn't see out the 12 hours the, yeah so the dcf will use for further out mission planning Okay. But the Advent Cloud, it's the, it's the early hours that are used. So if there is a failure, then the 12 hours are used for subsequent now pass. But ultimately, it's two separate products that they get. Got it. All right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And it's still the case that that very short term is, is like the primary. There are use cases beyond that, but it's that really short term. Like people are trying to make a decision to do something very soon. Um, and that's where we get into where my opinion is like the most technically challenging piece of this because it's right where you're trying with rapid refresh modeling like you're trying to bring the model back to being valuable in that zero to three range but these things that are designed specifically for that are hard to beat because they were designed specifically for that so and that's where we get just so many challenges um, but again excited to be here to talk to people about this and you know people have done similar things um so I wanted to talk a little bit more about Wicca, even though I didn't put the slide in the right order. Um, so you've got the, the the variables there on on the right, and then some more details um, on on the left here. And so one of the things to note about this: some people have used Wicca, including ourselves, as a verification data set. But the challenge here is that it uses Wicca as a real time product, and so it's not going back and time syncing, you know, a satellite that came in four hours late, like that went into the operational product, like it's still four hours old. Um, there's no thing that goes back and says like, oh, some 12Z data came in late, you know, remake the 12Z product. So that's just something to be aware of that this is it's meant to be like the most operationally relevant thing it can be at, a, at the time it's issued. We've talked a long time about making, um, we call it reanalysis WIMCA, but then as we've talked about, you know, moving forward with our capability, we kind of are, are getting away from that a little bit. Um, so again, lots of uh, different satellites that, that go into that. Um, and then... Uh, Kind of getting into the, the rest of my talk here, and I know it's you know, you already brought up Jason about like what is a cloud? Right? We're gonna talk about that all quite a bit in this talk. Um, because it, the way with the way we historically have done things, it's a problem <laughs> to just throw up a word that says cloud or not. What is that? What is that? Right. So um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we're going in that direction on this talk for sure. So for people that aren't familiar with the capabilities, GALIM is our, our global air land weather exploitation model. This is our version of the UM that we run locally, the, the United Kingdom's model. Uh, so really good like synoptic model, which we run ourselves mainly so that we can 
determine the resolution and cadence and products you know that we want from that so we don't even do data simulation on this we used to we bring in um, their initial condition files you know, straight from them on that i have on here that we're doing an 18 member ensemble at the 384 hours that is not operational yet we've had some issues um, with the, the comms on that uh, so that's still a capability that's, that's going to happen someday we hope how the ensemble perturbed is that just based on the uk med yeah, so we're the, this is the problem is that the, the Met Office is sending us their perturbed analysis files, which are big, and, and we're, we've been running into problems right. with trying to get that uh, that through through the pipes. And so, yeah, we're we're very heavily black box is a little bit too strong of a word, but that's kind of what it is for us on this is that we're, we're, we're leveraging our partnership with the Met Office uh, because they have way more resources than we do to, to be a global modeling center. And so the fact that they partner with us is nice. We, we appreciate that. Um, from that, we produce you know, NWP versions of total cloud cover, cloud fraction, ceiling height, and then some other things that are in development that I'll, I'll touch on uh, here in a little bit. Um, we want to get the longer term forecast you know, to, to Galwem um, in, in lieu of things like uh, DCF so that we can uh, focus uh, MPAS capabilities on, in the short term. Um, so then lists our land information systems. So this is four times a day. It's an analysis only right at this moment in time, but a forecast component is, is in the works. Um, 10 kilometer uh, soil temperature, soil moisture, ice, and snow analysis. Um, it, this is a, a something we do our own data simulation on. And uh, it's fun that the, the, this serves as a background for WIMCA because WIMCA's got to know what the land service background is to do its analysis. But then WIMCA is the analysis for this to determine the radiative properties. And so, so there's like a dance that's going on there in, in terms of how these, uh, how these products are, are created. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's uh, it's something that... Um, it, it, we've done this for a long time too. It's important uh, when the Air Force and the Army broke up after World War II, the weather all came to the Air Force. So we support Army, and this is key, you know, for for them because they need to know lots of information about the the land surface. Still not full global coverage, or has that changed? It's full global. It is not yeah, full global. Yeah, used to have like. Started stuff at like whatever. 60 yeah. stuff or something like that. Yeah, and that was that was something that the ice piece kind of got moved into this, and, and that was such a problem for people that <laughs> that they, they they solved that. I'm not the subject matter expert on this, Jen, but actually know more than I do on this this topic. But yeah, it's full full global at this point. She's laughing because none of us, I think, are consider ourselves to be experts in this. So all right. All right, so this is something I worked on a lot in, in the earlier part of my career, the our, our ensemble suite. Um, and so this is uh, a couple of things. The global ensemble that we do is not run the, the, the underlying models. We just get from the other centers to include uh, Fenmoc that's here. Um, and then we just we create products off of that. That's been really useful for you know long, long range forecasting for us. Um, what we do is we run WARF in a 16 member regional ensemble. Um, it's it's a unique setup, at least from what I've seen, that we, we run a single member every two hours and then we just time lag members in to get to a 16 uh, ensemble total. Um, and as I said before, we get down all the way down to one kilometer resolution. So this one here on the right with the Korean Peninsula is an example of one of our one kilometer domains. That's kind of on the on the larger side of what we can afford to run. You can imagine one kilometers. You know, it's a decent you know cost you know to run those. Uh, so a lot of probabilistic products, a lot of thresholding products. You can see here on the bottom right, probability of ceiling below three thousand feet. That's a threshold. You know that, that people make decisions off of. So we try to get all our, our probabilistic information into the decision space to the extent that we can, uh, so that the interpretation of all of this is is fairly straightforward. Um, let's see if I wanted to say anything else about this. So uh, so we do actually move these around and and stand up and and tear down you know these domains all the time. It's one of the main things that that we end up spending time on on doing. Um, because, you know, recently you had some things that were going on in Africa or you have like a natural disaster somewhere and we need to you know do support. Um, so we want to um, we can't run a four kilometer global ensemble yet, but we can run a four kilometer ensemble anywhere um, as long as it's you know not the full globe. So so we, we want to be able to do that. Um, this is heavily used by our, 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 our uh, community. You know, we, we can look at the access stats. It's on the order of 10,000, you know, unique, you know, verified users that are that are looking at these products. Um, and the lessons we've taken out of this over the years is that it, it's the ensemble design is, of course, important because you've got to make something that's reasonably capturing all the possibilities. But it, it's tailoring the information to their decision space is, is where I think the most value is, is because then there's the interpretation piece is relatively straightforward. Like I have a 40 percent chance that I can't do my mission today because the variable is you know directly tied to the decision that they're trying to make. So, so on this specifically with clouds, um, there's very um very simple uh, stuff that, frankly, I came up with kind of back of the envelope thing, just use uh, relative humidity uh, computations to, to see if there's cloud. 
Uh, it works reasonably well um, because the, the the diagnosis of uncertainty is there. So it's not like we're saying relative humidity at 89% no cloud, relative humidity of 90% absolutely cloud. Like there's actually a curve on there, so that you know there there's there's a, a steady increase in the probability of cloud when relative humidity increases. You also have the flow dependent members of the ensemble. Again, there were 16 members of the, those ensembles, and so you can see an example on the top left there of of a single forecast coming out of that, and then a couple of the probabilistic forecasts for ceiling and, and uh, cloud cover. Um, we do probabilities uh, for 20 to 80 percent sky coverage. Again, those are those are user specific needs. Yeah, go ahead. Do you use the microphysical clouds at all? Nothing. It's just completely relative humidity based, and so very basic, very simple. <laughs> like, d can I emphasize that? <laughs> like, very simple. Um, uh, but but it comes out in in the wash because you're accounting for the uncertainty in the relative humidity. You're accounting for the uncertainty in the ensemble members. Like it comes out looking like a reasonable product. And so I, I view this as kind of like the this is the low bar that something else needs to clear, right? That this this does reasonably well, and that other things you know that are that are being proposed and and, and done should be able to beat this if they're doing well. Uh, but it, like I say again, you know, tied to user specific things. Um, ceiling heights, particularly, we have all sorts of thresholds for ceiling height because different aircraft, you know, are flying at different levels and they need to know if I'm able to see through, you know, down to the ground or they need to know if they can take off and they have their minimums for, for landing. So um, I think we're getting into more of the cloud discussions now. Yeah, so this is the philosophical piece of the, the, the talk. I apologize to all of you ahead of time. This is the stuff that I get interested in and into. Um, I, I started at the basics, like, let's look at, see what definitions of cloud are, right, in the in the, the various things. And so right off the bat in the AMS definition, it says a visible aggregate. So I'm like, I guess if they're at night, they don't exist because <laughs> you can't see them. Um, I, I, I interpret that to mean that they can be sensed, right? It's something that can be sensed by something. So that's what we'll, we'll say what they meant to what they meant to say when they said visible. Uh, but in both definitions, you know, minute water droplets and ice particles, that's, you know, I think that's pretty intuitive to all of us. It's in the atmosphere, you know, it's not in the, in the ground. Um, and uh, the WMO uh, definition is uh, a little bit more thorough and it also includes uh, aerosols. And so that's a part of this that I'm not talking about too much today, but it's something that we're definitely interested in. Not, not just that aerosols act like clouds in a lot of ways, but they also interact with the clouds in a lot of ways. And so it's part of the equation that we've got to be thinking about as we try to improve cloud forecasting is that there's aerosols in the mix in, in that in a lot of, a lot of ways. And so, so my notes here on the bottom, you know, the um, just kind of a thought exercise of, you know, we use the word cloud the way we use storm in a lot of times. Like everybody kind of sort of knows what that means, but in different contexts, it's a different thing, right? And so I, I put to all of you, you know, imagine if we had a chart and it just said today's storm forecast and just had areas, you know, that were outlined with storm. It's like, that's, that's something, that's information because that's where weather is probably going to affect you. But like, that's not the level of detail that people need. And I think we want to start looking at clouds that way too, to say that, you know, clouds is a concept, but we got to get more specific about what we mean um, when we're doing that. And so um, this was the way I'm, I'm framing it. And this is again, like, like, this isn't really my background, so I guess there, there's good and bad reasons to, for having me thinking about this because I, I come from a, a, a little bit of a uh, not not having all of the information. But my experience, you know, we kind of work in hydrometeor space. You're looking at the particles themselves, whether they be the the phase of the particles, how big they are, how much you have, and then you have um, and, and that's the modeling world. And I think that's like the physical, like the most physical relevant world. Like that's the way we should be if we we could. But the reality is is that we sense clouds in radiation space, and for us in the Air Force, at least. 90% of our use cases are also in the radiation space. So you have to translate between the two uh, when you're doing data simulation, when you're making post-process products, like there's, a, and so you're, you're introducing a degree of freedom there, um, but it's a necessary one, right? But then we do this thing where we, we're, we're talking about somebody's you know, specific case and we just kind of call it a cloud. And that's where, and, and we're the most guilty of this <laughs> out of anybody, where it's like, well, what, what was the definition of that? Like, what threshold did you use for amount of mixing ratio? Or what was the brightness temperature difference that you defined that as? In, in the code, like somebody had to put that in the code, so it's there. But it's not like when you go look at these products, it says like cloud, you know, parentheses definition of what that was, right? And so that's what we're focusing on. Like, we're trying to clean this up in that, like, we absolutely want to make cloud products for users, but we want to define what they are for their use case so that everybody is clear. It's like, this is a simulated IR channel eight image, or, you know, that's the channel 14 image um, and not just say cloud. And so, so that's one of the ideas I wanted to put out here of, of trying to, to get cleaner in how we, we go about doing this so that we can understand what we're doing. 
when we look at a lot of the verification data sets, um, you know, that we've we've used before, you know, one of the strategies we've come up with, I'll talk about this in a little bit of of using, you know, multiple verification data sets. And the reason we have to do that is because they're all defined differently and there's no clarity in that, right? And so I'd like to get us all, you know, in the direction of, of having more clarity on what we're we're saying. Um, and it also reduces the degrees of freedom um, when trying to actually, you know, figure out if something is performing well or not. Um, not saying any of this is easy by any means, um, but I did want to kind of frame frame the problem. So if I can add one thing to that. So one thing yeah. that was kind of baffling to me at first, but I get it now, at the DOD SM side, I don't know if you or some other folks. Some of our team was there, yeah. Yeah, there was an Army guy. He said that for them, like, cloud includes, like, a big bubble of water. Right? There's a lot of TPW, cloud. Right. Like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. But for him, it was that in the microwave or some other space in the EM spectrum, yep. it was, you know, it was optically thick. Yeah, that even spectrum problem, which again, like that's where a lot of our use case lives and it's where our sensors live, right? But then we have to model, right? So we got to move, you know, move over to that space because for a lot of people, like they're, they're, at a, they're at a wavelength where they can see through the cloud, but if the precipitation is really heavy, then that's when they start to call it a cloud, right? So it's really about, from a use case perspective, it's about signal disruption. And then there's also the, the aircraft icing. We don't want to forget about that one, right? That's still a thing, but it's really about signal disruption um, for a lot of the growing use cases that we're seeing. Uh, yeah, any other comments on the philosophical? <laughs> All right. So some of the development efforts that we are, are doing, uh, we're partnering with uh, specifically with MCAR on, on both um, all sky data simulation, which we view as like, if that can be done quickly, that's kind of the end state, right? That we, we get to the point where we're just, we have a, a, an analysis of clouds right now that's correct um, within NWM. Um, and, and there's challenges there from the science and technical and then this, just the speed, right? Like to be able to do that fast enough to be able to, to, to be close to current. Um, but also some intermediate steps. Um, I have it listed later as a WIMCA direct radiance insertion, but we're actually, the last report they gave us was about IR direct radiance insertion. Something that can give you like a, a, a quick, look at what the clouds are in an NWP sense so you can at least make some steps in the right direction to, you know, before you get to the all sky piece. Some of the things we're working on, I mentioned before, we want to replicate all of the variables that we make with those legacy systems with our Galwim post-processor. Um, you're going to have a problem with the time lag issue there because Galwim, like other global models, there's a good three to four hours that you're doing the data simulation cycle. And so you're already three or four hours behind reality um, in that respect. And then those models are not tuned to do cloud analysis uh, for its own sake. Um, but as a backup capability and a step in the right direction, we're trying to at least replicate those variables so that for our legacy users, like we could switch to the to the Galwim and at least they would get the same grids and the same variables they're used to getting, probably with different characteristics of performance, but at least they would, you know, their missions wouldn't break. Um, and we're looking a lot at using the CRTM uh, with MPAS outputs. Uh, to really build our build up our wavelength specific simulated satellite products from a user perspective, that's where we want to go. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we're doing lots of stuff, um, and so from from there, as as you were talking about, like like we have weird use cases sometimes. I think visible IR and water vapor are probably going to be the three that we focus on from like a verification proving ground standpoint. But there might be other flavors, you know, that we would would put out. So. Um, We'll give some examples on some of this. So this is the Channel 8 water vapor um, image. And so you've got the, the impasse thing that we're doing on the left and the, the, the real image on the right. And so it's it's nice eye candy, you know, to, to look at these trying to match them up. Um, and, you know, I won't dwell on this too much. It's just kind of an example of, of some of the stuff we're looking at. Um, here's an example of Channel 14 uh, IR. Um, the same sort of thing. You can you can you can see that the the forecast doesn't match up perfectly, but you're you're getting something that looks similar. Um, our forecasters, when we talk to them about um, you know situations where we may have communications problems, or, or say we get into like a, a no kidding fight with a with a peer where we're starting to to lose you know some of the capabilities we take for granted, like what what would be the thing that you want the most? And they always say it's a satellite image. So they can get a satellite image. They can use their interpretation skills to figure out an awful lot of what's going on in the, behind the scenes. So we're looking at that as one of the use cases of like, well, if we can give them a simulated satellite image as just one product that they can, um, you know, do an awful lot with that. Um, and so the nice thing with MPAS too is that, um, you know, we can we can set the resolutions, you know, and, and to the things that we want. Um, we're also looking specifically at um, some of the characteristics of of, of what thing, what happens when we make the assumptions about the radiation transfer. So I think. The, the basic assumption, and, and this is not my area, uh, Sam Baker is the one that works on this uh, with uh, Jamie back at uh, our, our shop. 
Um, this is the standard assumption, 20 micrometer droplet size. Um, but then if you go to the, you know, getting the, the, the droplet size distribution from the MPAS microphysics, um, it's, uh, it's a different picture. And I can't toggle back and forth because the response time is too slow, but we have a difference field um, here that shows that there's some, you know, some dif dif decent differences in what, where the clouds are just based on looking at the different, you know, assumption of the microphysic droplet, right? So we're, we're at the front end of this where we're really trying to scope out like what matters, right? Because we don't want to spend time researching things that, that don't have a lot of effects. We're trying to figure out what are the things that have a lot of effect in the radiative space so that we can we can focus on that. Again, we're, we're at the outset of this. Uh, we have some, you know, some kind of prototype products that are running, you know, 24 seven on this. Um, and we're also trying to use those prototype products to get them in front of users and start to get that dialogue going with our users about like, well, what do you really need, you know, out of, out of these products? Um, so verification, um, outside of the operational things that we do in our squadron, um, in my role as the, the chief of science and services, I've told everybody like cloud verification methodology and, and capabilities are, is our number one development effort. Like it is the foundation to which everything else is built off of. It also happens to be like really hard. <laughs> so, um, and, and Berkeley joined us about, about six months ago and, you know, my, my, uh, welcome gift to her was giving her responsibility for the hardest problem <laughs> and most important problem uh, of the squadron. And so she put together some of these these slides on some of the initial efforts that are in this space. I know lots of other people in the room are thinking about this too. And so like, this is our great word of workshop. Let's, let's have conversations. Um, I mentioned before about the multiple truth sources, um, where we're at right now with kind of the confusion about what is a cloud. This is the best way uh, to go about um, getting a good look at, at performance characteristics. We're also very interested in the stratification piece um, so that we can understand from a modeling and then science perspective, like where the capabilities are at, but also communicate to our users that like, hey, in these situations, you know, your product's going to be good. This situation, your product's not going to be as good. Um, and uh, can see some other things noted there um, in terms of, uh, you know, looking at looking at frequency distributions is another thing. Uh, that we've seen a lot a lot of value at in the initial stuff we've done if the frequency distributions of brightness temperature are like way off you know you've got something there that you need to you need to look into um so but yeah we're again more questions and answers in this right now um i think the next slide we talk a little bit about the kind of doing the scorecard um potential here uh and then also you know the object verification object-based verification you know, stuff is on the table as well um we, we want something like this um as we as we develop models and capabilities and we compare old to new like we want to be able to do scorecarding so that we can get you know succinct um reports on on this to be able to to summarize everything and really give us you know insight into go no go way back at the beginning of the talk i know it's been a while uh, we talked about this automated process we want to be able to to make a change to our system crank out variables uh, metrics that we trust quickly and then be able to implement like we don't want to spend a long time like like analyzing these things so it's just really critical that the met that we get the metrics right which is why we're spending a lot of time and energy uh thinking about it so ideal in state for us we get a lot of requests um you know wanting to get down to a thousand foot layers in the clouds and so this can be that's a lot you know layers when you stack them up especially when you go up into some of the high altitude flyers we need to know hydrometeor by phase also we need to know the aerosol piece um, the distributions of size for hydrometeors uh, is important, uh, again, both for the radiative signal that you get, but also for icing potential, because that varies by the, the hydrometeor size. Um, I mentioned before, short term is definitely more important than long term to us. And then a lot of the short term forecast challenges are because convection is going, you know, coming and going. And so that's important, whatever we do. So you start talking about, you know, convection allowing models, you know, being able to, to do that. Um, I showed some examples there of the post-processing. We want to get to wavelength specific cloud so that we're clear about like what we are looking at for that, whether it be IR, visible water vapor or, or the rest. Um, and then, you know, as we talked about verification methods that identify the specific characteristics of, of NWPR observation systems so that we can know what we're getting clearly and, and can make sure we're moving towards uh, stakeholder needs. So, I think this is my last slide. Just a couple of notes on the future for us. Um, you know, rapid refresh modeling is definitely where we want to go. We want to improve um, in that in that regard because we we view that as like the convergence of all of these things is going to be in rapid refresh modeling capabilities. And you know, some notes there about you know bringing these things together. Um, and then one last little piece is that we want to use the commodity computing that's available in the cloud um, to really go on demand. And so what I mean by that is that like you know the example I give is. 
say you have a tropical cyclone that's in, approaching a valuable location, like let's run 100 members at one kilometer because we want to spend the money in that case to get the best possible forecast we can. The way we work today, we have a fixed supercomputer with a fixed amount of processing, and so we can only do so much. We want to get to the place where we can really you know, situationally be able to expand what we can provide from a modeling capability as much as possible, um, which you know is just relevant to the clouds discussion. We love talking about clouds in the cloud. That's one of our favorite <laughs> favorite things to talk about. So, all right, uh, that is that is the end of my talk. Thanks for the engagement and, and attention. I appreciate it. Oh, great. This was this was a perfect introduction. I think Thank you. Most, a lot of the points that um, also mainly relevant. I'm sure for all the DoD services. Like I think this was a great overview. Um, I can tell you one one difference that maybe we'll talk about later is um, I think we are more interested in medium range or long term. Sure, it sounds like than you guys are, but um, mm -hmm. we'll, maybe we'll talk about that. Um, okay, so I want to bring it up to the audience first. We've got about ten minutes. So any questions? Want to go back through slides? Um, just a minute. Hi, actually, very nice talk. I yeah. learned something about the, the in your idea of the cloud definition. So uh, when we do the really transfer calculation, the cloud is really big problem. And uh, if we bring out uh, because we have the spectrum surface albedo, we have yeah. spectrum dependence of aerosol. Why not we uh, can have the spectrum dependent of cloud? So that probably bring very new idea to do the really transfer. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Appreciate yeah, that. Thank you. Yeah. So much. Thank you. Yeah. I want to ask about your I guess, computational capabilities, either cloud-based or on-prem, because the like in the in the space of like cloud advection and other sort of now casting algorithms, there's been a lot of pretty recent advances with like precipitation now casting that can also be applied right. to the cloud problem on the, on the deep learning side. So. Well, some of those can be kind of intensive to run. So, so uh, I was curious, like, like, do you have access to GPUs, or, or, or is the, where, where, where are the, where are the limits and bottlenecks that, that you're that you're running into? Yeah, we do have that. Our supercomputer. I didn't really talk about this. Um, we call it HPC eleven as an Oak Ridge National Laboratory, with all the other you know big supercomputers that they run. Mm -hmm. We have both. Well, we have GPUs and we have expansion because we sort of anticipate that there's going to be there. I can't give you the exact numbers. Gen might. Exact numbers. Exact numbers for what? Like GPUs on uh, HPC 11? Oh, God, I have this number last week. I think we have 10, but we're adding like 11 more. So, okay. Um, so, there, there's we have some capability and we plan to grow it um, because we, we kind of saw that that was coming. Um, I would, I would, I've been doing modeling for a long time. HPC 11 is a capable machine that can do a lot of things. Um, for the for us, the cloud is a lot more about, like, say, kind of this this on demand piece, and then also as a backup, you know, in case something happens to our primary. So, so yes, um, we we have resources for that. Our issue from from the standpoint of those capabilities is like we are not doing a good job on like data storage, data curation, like the infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, because that's hard work, right? And we just haven't done well with that yet. All right. So when we talk about the cloud, is we need to define what is the true cloud. Right, and from ground-based remote sensing of that light, if you just say cloud, yes or no, that's fine. But when we talk about vertical distribution, you say that's different from surface satellite. And recently, we are working on using the same radar, 94 gigahertz radar, from surface and compare with cloud side. They right. say the different types of cloud. Yeah, you know, it's the same cloud, but vertical distribution different. That right. means when you are using the well, the ground-based mm -hmm. or satellite remote sensing divided by your result. Be careful. There is a observed different type, different vertical distribution. Yeah, and that's and I mean that's that's an example of what I'm talking about. Like I, I almost want to expunge the word cloud from our vocabulary, right? mm -hmm. like, like, because we we all think that's something else, right? right, right, and, right. And, and it's a conceptual like as human, we have conceptual models of things. We play fluffy thing that's a cloud. Right. But you're talking about like a radiative, you know, a, a wavelength hit something, mm -hmm. right? like, and just being careful about the definitions there. Because right. I think if we're going to untangle this problem if we get more careful about how we talk about this. That's the exact point of view again. Yeah, if I could expand upon that, what I saw in your presentation. So one thing that's cloud is you said storms. So in particular, it has to do with um, precipitation, lightning, you know, hazards when it comes to respect to convection and other things. Talk about the visibility. Um, so that's not just clouds with water vapor and water liquid droplets, and ice, but that's um, uh, aerosols and there's other haze, other things that attenuate, you know, visibility and the visible spectrum for other spectrums. Um, we talk about water vapor. Um, so there's use cases I think really do tell us, you know, what exactly. Depending on what we need to do, we have to do something different. It sounds like there's not a one size fits all cloud, even within your current 
legacy capabilities. Right. And let and, alone what we should be doing now. Yeah, and then it's it's time for us to, to sort that out, in my opinion. I want to say one thing I was gonna mention this and forgot it. Like, like we are very anxious to collaborate on this. Like these are hard problems and they're and we've just seen, like I know from the Navy side, the interactions we've had, like we we were surprised last time we visited like how much you guys were doing it in cloud space. And I know there's other things going on out there. Like let's work together on all this stuff and find ways to work together because um you know this is a hard enough problem. <laughs> yeah, we need to help yeah. each other. That's why we're all here. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Very good. Okay, so we've got a few more minutes. So any other questions? Oh, hey, Evan. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that you're trying to streamline it into one capability. I know in Second Weather Squadron, they were operating off of one good at the cloud and DCF. So is there a new a renewed timeline as to when, when that capability, especially on the high side, is going to be like put forth? I, I wouldn't want to pin down a timeline yet. Uh, we're, we're not talking months. It's going to be years right. still. Um, the, the thing I mentioned there about Gala and being able to replicate the variables, and so something where there's probably a skill decrease because of the time lag there, that we hope to have by the end of the year. And, and that's really a play towards like we need to have a backup capability. And you probably understand yep. why that is. Um, uh, and then from there, it's sort of a launching off point. Like we hope to learn from that to really get into that impasse work because that's where we want it. That is the future, is that I, I really wasn't clear about that either. Like, we're all in on impasse, and we're going to use that capability for this problem uh, for sure. So when you say all in, does that mean a replacement for Gala, or do you mean all in for the for, cloud? For this for the, for the short term cloud forecasting problems, and, okay. and cloud being all the things <laughs> that we've talked about. Gala is still going to be. You know, we almost talk about Gala as like that's like our freeware. Like that's the thing we run to hopefully solve most people's needs, and then impasse is going to be our way to solve the specialized problems like this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, freeware that we spend a lot of money. I don't pay for this. Right. Basically, you got the biggest deficiencies right now in the cloud forecasting. Say, is it the MWP? Is it the operations? Is it all the above? That's a great question. One I should have thought about a little bit more. Um, I think the deficiency right now is that. Is resolution based like the resolution that is exists in things like we don't get it at our product? Like, go what's the resolution that goes now? It's like three kilometers, two kilometers, right? IR two, and then we make a 24 kilometer stitch together product. Like, like, so, so we talk about deficiencies from our perspective, like, it's that we just aren't taking advantage of, of a lot of those capabilities. The main deficiency that I see is that. Um, you have a dynamic physical atmosphere that is changing those clouds in the short run. But we can't get our model analysis to match that, mm -hmm. right? That that to me, and that's the rapid refresh piece, right? So like, that's I don't know how long it's going to take to get to that point. But everything I see with science technology, like like it's all getting like going in the direction where we're going to get there someday, to where it's like our NWP analysis will have the clouds in the right place with the right characteristics, you know, to the extent that data simulation can do that, and then we just have to run the model at that point, right? So, but we're we're a long ways. Like our our now casting capabilities are completely unable to evolve clouds, right? And our NWP capabilities, I don't say are completely unable, but they're just not that as good at, at analyzing where the clouds are. So it's like, there. Um, actually, that cloud's fast. We got a few more minutes. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to comment real quick on, you were mentioning the scorecard. Yes. The need. So um, DTC is, uh, does have scorecard capability with mm -hmm. plus. Um, and we are under our NOAA name uh, developing an inter interactive scorecard. So. I think the fact that Air Force and Navy is both uh, adopting that plus, those capabilities will be available for you because everything we develop goes out to everybody that's, you know, using the software. Absolutely. Like, like if it wasn't implied there, like that's that's what we're going to do. <laughs> yeah. so, um, I think Tara has a talk in a few more uh, okay. talks. So, yeah, uh, yeah. If that wasn't implied, I think we're all. Yeah. <laughs> plus is a way that we're going to. I sort of thought everybody just knew. No, that was a good, good dropping net. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, since that clock's a little fast, I got. I want to talk a little bit one more point, which is um, you said the now casting piece, where that's you said that's the most important for you, and that's particularly challenging because all you really do right now is back. Yeah. Right. So, um, so where have you noticed problems as far as uh, formation dissipation, or like what parts of the cloud problem is it? Convection. Where does it break down? So convection is the obvious mm -hmm. one, um, but also like terrain. Like you can have you can have like clouds in terrain that are like forming because of upslope, but the, 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 it will try to move it. <laughs> it's like the injection stuff doesn't know that they're coming down there. So those would be the two main things that jump out. Um, I mean, clouds even without convection they tend to grow and dissipate right pretty quickly. 
Um, and so, but it's, I think convection is the main thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the use case for that is um, aviation safety, or is there other? Well, that you have the cloud itself still. You know, if you get a serious field mm -hmm. starting to form, or you did for a model that have that, that somebody might be trying to do something there. Um, I would say the aviation hazard piece of it is um, particularly for um, you know drones okay, is okay. is an issue. Like like human pilots can be like, oh, there's another storm there, <laughs> gotta be around it. But like uh, the drones. Um, there's there's just issues there that the the, the the problems can sort of snowball if they're not keeping track of where the storms are going. So okay, so I think we'll be talking about that some through the later in the conference. Um, but um, I think that's something that we've been wanting to talk about too amongst the group is that uh, the human in the loop has been a very important part of this, mm -hmm. right? Being able to identify things that are important to you, be able in your mind to uh, you know you have your own bias correction and experience. And if we're going to do something that's completely automated, right? We're going from a forecast and satellite data, and we're making algorithms. It's going to the drone. It's making all these automated decisions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do we bridge that gap from the now casting that an expert user has to encoding absolutely. Yeah. algorithms? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I believe there'll be more talks about yeah. some of that later. Cool. Okay. Um, I just please. one comment that Kevin, great talk by the way. Uh, I'm uh, a professor at Apit, and. Um, one of the things that I've noted in terms of what what's the big efficiency, mm -hmm. um, and this speaks a little bit to what Jason was asking, is is that uh, we basically say we have upward motion and we produce condensation, right? Um, but as you mentioned, there are aerosols and there are cloud condensation that play, that play a role in that. Mm -hmm. Numerical models don't track those nanoparticles that come in the CCM very well. Yeah. Um, and I think if that's improved and that microphysical process of actually producing the clouds from those CCM and then mixing that in with the larger particles is something where we can really improve. Yeah. Uh, making clouds by any definition, right? <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because it is it is like the next logical. I mean, it is part of this already, but it's just like how much do you want to bite off at one time, right? Like it's it's lingering there, of just like it's 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 aerosols on their own sake, but then also like you said, how they interact with, with the larger aerosols. We're tracking in models now, but the smaller ones, the ones yeah. that photochemically diurnally vary right. that become cloud condensation nuclei, not so much. Right. Yeah, and it's that's from like the research piece. That's the fascinating right. stuff of trying to get all that figured out. Because from my perspective, like modeling that stuff that costs two minutes <laughs> and to go through the roof. So then you guys start thinking about that too. So all right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. The next up is Ray Lee from uh, Finmock, the uh, Navy Fleet Miracle Meteorology and Oceanography Center. There we go. Uh, so, good morning. My name is Raymond Lee. I'm at Fleet America Meteorology and Oceanography Center. I am working with the Regional Modeling Division, the COEMS model, and then I'm also the Department Verification Lead. FEDMOP generally is an overview where the Navy's Environment Modeling Center, sort of like 16th Weather Squadron, is supporting the Air Force and the Army. Uh, we cover weather and ocean, so atmospheric and ocean forecasts. We're actually a pretty small organization. Uh, the key point at the bottom there is of the 35 people in the modeling department, only about five of us have a, about 15% of our time at max to work on verification. So we're doing lots and lots of verification work with very little time and resource. So our verification work pictures won't necessarily look as nice as some of the other pictures you've seen, so because that's what we can do with the time we have. Uh, generally, this is also what I call the eye candy slide on the right for when we're descri describing ourselves to the Navy uh, of what we can do, just generally going all the way from global all the way to tactical coastal type littoral environments. Part of the reason why our verification can kind of look a little outdated at times is with the few people and the massive amount of stuff that we do. Uh, the global models on the left, the regional models on the right, we have 120 static coamps areas that we have to deal with trying to verify. We've got upwards of 100 wave watch areas for waves. We have 100 plus Delft models for coastal littoral modeling. It's a lot of data that we're trying to go through and get through. And with individual people, like I'm the atmospheric regional expert, we have an atmospheric global expert, and we're one deep we're in charge of helping make sure the model runs and then telling how well the model does. So 
So what we have currently for the model verification, we have deterministic model verification. Generally, we're trying to produce this information both to go to the customers in the fleet, so the forecasters out on the ships, and also try to provide the information back to NRL. Jason and I have worked very closely on all the verification for a long time, of which we're trying to get the information that these are where we notice deficiencies in the model back to NRL Monterey so they can work on trying to improve it for the next cycle. We have real-time ocean verification that's just recently been developed. We're still working on trying to figure out how to get that information released to the fleet. We have the atmospheric and the wave verification available. We just have a very generic looking web page sampled on the right here. And then one of the other issues that we have is, and I think Evan mentioned it right at the very end of his last slide of his presentation was higher classification levels, like different enclaves. We work in both unclassified and higher classification levels and trying to get that information out on higher different classification levels when the observations may only be unclassified. That can also be a difficulty because that means we could have multiple data sets of basically the same thing that are classified differently. And how do you apply that to the same model and get that information out with the classification markings being correct so that you're not creating spillage issues or national security issues. The ensemble model verification, that is unclassified as we're part of working with the Air Force and NOAA and the Canadians with all of the new OPSI and NAFES modeling support. And then we also provide support to the Joint Typhoon Warning Center and tangentially the National Hurricane Center with tropical cyclone verification. Uh, one of the nice things I like to call out for that is, is that we'll be verifying the storm in real time. So every six hours, that information will update with the new forecast. Unlike most of the other verification I can see for tropical cyclones, that tends to be done well after the storm has been finalized and best tracked. This one kind of gives forecasters a sense of how certain models are doing while the storm is still active. One of the things that we always love to try to get to at Fenmock, and unfortunately due to the staffing issues, always kind of find ourselves permanently stuck in development with is model trends and tendencies. This is kind of where we start moving towards more of a climatology of verification idea. Uh, the idea is, is that we want to be able to get the information out to the forecasters so that they have the model data and then they also have, this is how we've seen the model tend to perform in certain situations. Does the model over deepen lows in certain locations in the world? Does it have not weaken the winds fast enough after a cold front or something like that? Uh, that's in conjunction with the climatology department. That's a sample picture of, I believe it was over San Diego, trying to do a long-term sort of this is also where we look at like the monthly to seasonal type verification. And one of the things that we've always struggled with is, is that we try to get feedback from the fleet, but when they're on a ship, they don't necessarily have time to be telling us, but your model did good, your model did bad. We usually get that seven to 10 months later, at which point all that data has now been moved off onto the archive if we were able to archive it and trying to go back and figure out what exactly they were talking about. Yeah, your models did really bad on this day. What happened on that day? Where were you? So trying to get that sort of response back from the forecasters is pretty difficult. One of the other really unique challenges that we have is what we call moving co-amps. Uh, their co-amps area is the regional model that actually follows something. Since we're the Navy, they typically will end up following a ship. One of the things that really becomes hard is, is how do you provide verification for how that model's performing when that model's moving? If it moves across the entire Pacific Ocean over the course of a month, what does that actually mean when you say the model had a certain bias or a certain tendency? Where was that certain tendency? Uh, one of the other examples that you could use here is, is that if you had a ship leave the west coast of America and over the course of a month go down towards South America, well, now you've just changed hemispheres and seasons. How does that do? If you're looking at an, well, the model did this over the last month, what does that even mean? 
And of course, again, classification levels really comes into play here. One of the other unique challenges we have is open ocean wind verification. When you're dealing with land stations, you have surface observations nearby. When you're in the middle of the ocean, you might be lucky to have a buoy nearby. More than likely, you have nothing. Trying to figure out, well, what are the 10 meter winds like? If you're dealing with an aircraft carrier, you need to know if it's safe for the aircraft to take off from the aircraft carrier. So one of the things that we started with in 2015 is, is that we took the scatterometer retrievals and instead of using those to compare to the buoy to see how well the scatterometer was performing, we, we accepted that there was going to be some bias in the scatterometer retrieval, but we take that as the truth. From that truth, we then compare that against the model. That drastically increased the amount of coverage we get for being able to verify these low-level winds. One of the things that we haven't really done yet is, is trying to work out the observation error from that. So we don't use these specifically for the model was X knots too strong or too weak. We take that more of as a general trend right now of the models trending well and typically Of course, my first time giving a presentation like this, and that was going to happen. I figured that much. So we don't use these as the straight result numbers. We're taking them more as the trends and the patterns. Uh, you can see pictures on the bottom there of kind of like we're looking at line of best fit and like slope. Make sure we're, the model is at least trending the right general direction. And this has been pretty interesting. Uh, whenever I've talked about this, people kind of perk their ears up. This is a unique way of looking at a problem. One of the last things before I actually start talking about clouds a little bit here is the machine learning. Uh, the machine learning aspect is we have one person who's working for like 2% of their time on investigating this. Our senior leaders are always obsessed with stoplight charts. Was the model bad? Was it uh, okay? And it, or was it good? How do you boil all of the information that makes up a model into red, green, or yellow. When I run the verification meetings, I personally let my the group that where I work with have five or six colors. Like we have orange, we have blue, we have purple. Like just because it's at least somewhat easier to identify when you're trying to, well, we talked about the bias. We're talking about precip. We're talking about waves. We're talking about 10 meter winds. Like it's very hard to get one color. One of the ideas that this machine learning is, is that if we can take all of those various different aspects of all those different parameters and combine them all into one program and give a, hey, this is where you were in your normal distribution sort of thing, we might be able to better define what that color of the stoplight chart that we're never going to get away from actually represents. The co-challenge that we have for cloud and visibility verification, we had in 2015 to about 2018, dusts, aerosols, hydrometeors for visibility. It leveraged five different code bases. And as soon as one of them updated, the entire house of cards kind of collapsed. Um, we've never really had the direct cloud verification there. We did get delivered a program from NRL for cloud verification. We weren't able to promote it to operations due to information assurance and I, the security standards, uh, which kind of hurts. One of the things that we do have for the ensemble is we have ensemble cloud verification, but that's just leveraging UK METS analysis. We were looking at trying to leverage WIMCA's analysis in there, uh, time constraints and other priorities. We still stay with UK MET. All of these different cloud and visibility and fog verification that we're also really interested in trying to get they're all different program bases. They're all their own separate little piece. They only talk to one specific model when we're running 10 or 12 different model types. They don't, they don't work well together trying to point them over. So one of the things that really gets to be a problem is, is that it becomes a great difficulty to try to have 
one program rule them all sort of thing, which leads to where we're heading. Uh, that bottom spider web of all the different code languages is currently what we have. It's pretty hideous, and I have to maintain all of that. And I don't like that. Um, so one of the things is that NRL Monterey is working with NCAR here to take MET+. Plus. Their NRL Monterey is working on making an information assured version of MET+, Plus so that we can install it on all of the classification levels. And we're going to be moving, as it seems like everybody is, to MET+. Plus. Uh, so kind of part of the other part of the ulterior motive of the presentation of all this lead-in stuff to clouds was, hey, can we have these types of features in MET+, Plus, please? <laughs> uh, we're hoping that this will allow us to expand the verification support because now we'll have one program that kind of does everything that we need instead of, I don't even know, 15, 20 different programs that don't do one part each. One of the big things, though, is, is that we continue to be faced with our issue of we need simple information so we can get it out to the fleet. The fleet forecasters basically are going to be high school graduates with three to five years of METOC experience, and they're not going to use the verification and the validation if they don't understand what it means. But we also need high band, high information, detailed information, so that we can get that information back to NRL so that we can work on improving the models. And then we also need low bandwidth images so we can get it to the ship, but we need the very detailed high bandwidth images so we can get it to NRL and the data. We also need the unified code. It has to run for many areas, that some of which can move, some of which that don't, and it has to be able to work on multiple different resolutions, nests, that sort of thing. And then ideally, we also would hope that it can do oceans, waves, and the atmospheric model all together. One of the examples that here, and this is the last slide I have, that right picture that's inside the red box, all of that data actually goes into making that one little red dot that's in the circle. That's a simple low bandwidth image on the left. That's a more complicated image on the right, trying to make sure that people understand that and forecasters can apply to use that is where one of the things that Fenmock really kind of needs ideas and help to best to get that information out there. Because what we've always heard is, is that they, the fleet forecasters have seen the products, they've heard about the products, which is good that they know they exist. They then say they don't use them because they don't have time or to spend the time learning and understanding them. So that's one of the things that definitely I'm interested in seeing what we can come up with at the workshop to help improve those things. All right, thank you, speaker. Um, so when I saw a couple of things, I think the biggest thing I want people to take away is uh, resource limitation, right? We're limited on personnel. Um, we're limited on the computer we have. We're limited on the amount of funds we do. And maybe that's a lot of different things. So when it comes to the cloud problem, um, so I want to ask one question before we take it out to the audience, which is that um, what exactly was I not IA assured about some of the stuff that NRL did? The, what do we need to do in the code? To make the it? cloud Python package that Jason put together used one Python module that was not allowed, was not existing in PyPy. And unfortunately, the decision came down was it doesn't exist in the PyPy database. It's not IA sure. Okay. So that's helpful to know. We're trying to move towards open source. Python, you know, we're still doing Fortran and C, but there's a, Python can mean a lot of things to different people. Um, so as we move forward, that's one thing we might take into account. So saying that, there's a lot of more, there's more package managers out there other than PyPy. That was not my call on that. That was our N6, our information assurance and information technology team. Um, and again, it also came down to with different levels of priorities, the time spent arguing for, hey, can we get this? was not going to be cost effective to the resource limitations that we are experiencing of needing to move all of those models to new computer hardware for the first time in the better part of a decade. So with the limited time, I've basically not really even done any real verification work for most of the last couple of months because I've been focusing on moving models. And I'm the lead of the verification team. <laughs> Resource limitation is is really a problem for Fleet and Arrow right now. Uh, it's part of the reason with uh, with our previous commanding officer, we actually 
invited 16th Weather Squadron out a couple times. We went there a couple times trying to see where each group can focus its efforts best. We've at the FedMap, we've always known that 16th Weather Squadron was always leading in cloud over us. So I'm very happy Evan and his group are here and talking is trying to leverage whatever they produce is an option that we could end up looking at potentially at Food America. All right, one more question. Yes, ma'am. I just want to make a comment on so I'm the program office for numeric weather modeling, and uh, we work with the DTC on trying to make the code more information assured. Um, we've been working for the past like year and a half or so on uh, correcting sonar cube bindings and uh, applying STIGs. Um, I'd love to sync up with you um, to get the Navy input on it, because um, yeah, we have a monthly meeting with them just to talk cybersecurity. So yep. back it's today. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, as we switch presenters, DJ. Yeah, one, one question on the, the data transfer side. Um, I, I've been doing a lot of work with basically trying to find ways to, to do more client-side visualization. Um, so, so basically try to minimize how much data you, you, you transfer to the client, but then if you have a robust client, being able to do all kinds of interactive stuff. Um, how much capability is there on, on the but like, I guess if you're out, 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 in, out at sea to like, do you have a nice, a decent laptop or tablet or other compute device that would, that would be able to handle that if you could get the, the data bandwidth down? It's more of getting it to the ship than the laptop or the computer type thing on mm -hmm. ship is my understanding. Um, they have relatively decent computer capability actually on the ship is what I understand. Okay. And I don't know for sure. There's some ships that will obviously have more than others, but as far as I can tell, it is mostly trying to get the data to the ship. Yeah, I agree. The dissemination piece is the largest. Okay. Okay. So thanks, Perry. Talking about NASA's ground station observation network. Yeah. Thanks. So my name is Lewis Wynn, and um, I'm at NASA Langley Research Center. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, GSON, which is our uh, ground station observation network. Uh, this enables us to um, deliver um, real-time, low-latency uh, satellite cloud products. And this is a work towards um, uh, producing a, uh, um, a global um, cloud composite from both uh, GEO and LEO satellites. So our motivation for um, creating GSON is to actually reduce data latencies from, from LEO satellites. Um, this data latency occur, uh, usually is between three to four, three to six hours, and it, propose, it poses a significant impact on data optimal use. Um, we need, uh, we need um, lower latency data um, and low, low, lower latency um, occurs at um, the reception at the ground station, the uh, transfer to data center and the processing center and the, um, the data access. So what we, how we saw this is to bring all these components to the cloud. And to do so, we, um, we first create a uh, framework um, that is on the cloud and um, sorry, uh, which is a uh, um, which allows us to um, put the data locally to the uh, resources, and we utilize um, the uh, open data repository um, uh, for for our Leo data, and then we also utilize uh, direct broadcast data from um, from the ground stations that are provided from a commercial ground station provider like uh, Azure and um, and uh, Amazon um, ground stations. So these are the four major uh, um, GSON components. Uh, we have our commercial ground station, uh, which uh, right now we're using uh, Amazon and Azure. Um, we have next is the, uh, the the planner and scheduler. This is our uh, um, our task and a scheduler, where it allows us to um, order the uh, direct broadcast data, 
Um, and then we have our uh, Amazon cloud services and uh, cloud watch services. And then um, the next major thing is the uh, the processing framework. This this has uh, various workloads um, that does our reception, our processing at certain levels from um, the level zero all the way to the level three. And then um, as well as a workflow for uh, for providing the data access. Uh, this is an overview of um, of the uh, JSON architect. So at the center there in the cyan is our, our processing framework. This connects to um, to the three data fees that we have. Um, we have the uh, connection to to the geo data from um, University of Wisconsin, where we access our uh, five geo satellites. Um, we also have <clears throat> access to the Leo data via the uh, Amazon um, repository where we get our global data. And if we want uh, much lower latency data, we have access to the uh, direct broadcast data via uh, the ground stations from Amazon and um, and Azure. And so um, any given sense, instance, the user can request uh, low uh, data and depending on the uh, requirements, whether they need, the, they need low latency or not, it will select a certain um, uh, data feed that are that are needed, and then in terms of um, the the uh, science data products that we produce in real time, uh, we're able to produce uh, the VIRS active fires uh, from VIRS and also the flooding uh, detection. And we also currently doing um, uh, data simulation work where we simulate the uh, polar hyperspectral uh, sounder data into the WARF model for uh, improving the uh, forecast. And then last but not least, the um, SATCOR um, global uh, cloud composite from uh, the, both the GEO and the LEO. So how does uh, the ground station as a service work? Um, basically the cloud provider, the ground station provider provides us with uh, the ground stations that are located uh, worldwide. And then from, from these ground stations, we um, are able to uh, onboard the satellites of interest. Here we, we're using um, MPP, uh, NOAA 20, NOAA 21. Uh, we, so after scheduling that, we have access to, um, to, to, uh, to receive the direct broadcast data. And um, the, the ground station service also has a capability to uplink command and control uh, to the satellites as well. So when the satellite flies by over the ground stations, um, a VCB instance launches up and it receives the uh, the uh, direct broadcast data, and then from there it's uh, it's processed and um, the products are delivered uh, to the S3 bucket for uh, distribution. So this this is a map showing um, where all the uh, commercial ground stations are located. Um, Amazon currently has 10 ground stations that are operational right now. Uh, Amazon, uh, Azure only has four that's operation. And um, the, um, all of these uh, data here is uh, where we test it on all of the uh, ground stations where we were able to capture um, direct broadcast data, run it through our GSON system, produce the products. And this just shows this kind of um, what the coverage may look like from one single um, overpass over each of the ground stations. So the coverage over the, these ground stations is much larger. We're just showing, showing one of the pass for each of the ground stations. So we deploy the GSON system on the uh, NASA uh, Science Managed Cloud Environment, which is part of the ASWS. Uh, JSON is a data-driven processing architect where a user would request um, the data, and um, as the data arrive, this this triggers the the, the processing. And so, um, based on what the user uh, criteria are, um, like um, the date, time, the area that they wanted to uh, monitor, um, it it will uh, plan and schedule and match the um, the overpasses over that area. And so when the satellite passes over that area, 
um, it will uh, launch the VP instance to make that contact, download the data, and then um, as the data arrives to the bucket, it triggers um, more processing to the different level products delivered to the landing zone. And then from there, a message to dispatch to the user that the data and the products are available. So now that we deploy this system, we can um, put in a subscription service to, uh, in this case here, deliver low latency VIRS um, fire product. We did this uh, demonstration um, a couple of years ago with the uh, group out in uh, Boulder, uh, Kyle Hilburn, where we provided them with uh, low latency data. We monitor uh, area over California, where we said any overpass in that area, process it and deliver um, the VIRS um, low latency uh, active fires, and then and deliver that to the uh, worst uh, fire um, <clears throat> model. And they use the um, the active fires to initiate the the fire perimeter. And we found that um, if the uh, forecast uses the low latency data, we got um, a much better uh, results for the 24 hour forecast. And not only that, we were able to produce uh, the fire um, three hours earlier. So this this generation of the fire uh, active fire, we can do this in under 20 in under 12 minutes, which is um, pretty amazing. Another demonstration is with uh, VIRS flood data, where we uh, did a demonstration um, where we uh, helped, we were the, the low latency VIRS flood um, node, um, and we conducted a demonstration with the AIST um, new observing strategy test bed, where our system was triggered. Um, like when we sense a uh, flooding over um, the flood, gauge or the model says there's a flooding, it triggers our uh, node to um, deliver low latency um, virus flood products to the forecast. And then it uses that to produce a much better um, forecast. Now we're gonna talk about um, more of our, our satellite cloud products that we derive from our um, from our system. Um, here we, we um, we derive, uh, you know, standard cloud products like the cloud mass, uh, cloud high optical depth. Um, for, with more uh, channels, we are able to uh, derive more innovative um, pro uh, cloud products such as uh, icing and and um, cloud top. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, convective um, overshooting top, etc. Uh, Dave Panama, my colleague, would be talking about more about the satellite. Um, SATCore Cloud Products tomorrow morning. Uh, he'll get more in depth um, uh, talk about that. And then, so we're able to retrieve these uh, cloud products from from all the five uh, geostationary um, satellites that are currently operating. And from all these um, <clears throat> products, we're able to fuse all the um, geo data and to create this uh, geo global composite, three kilometers um, gridded every half hour. So we're working towards a, a more of a, a global cloud composite. This is what the LEO added to that. And so our, our goal here is to combine the radiance and to derive cloud products uh, from, from multiple geos, multiple uh, LEO satellite as seemingly as some possible. And um, so the top uh, left image there is, is showing our uh, cloud top height. And we, we derive this at uh, three kilometers every uh, 60 minutes for uh, both daytime and nighttime. Um, the bottom image shows um, what satellites are being used for that composite. Um, and each pixels are, are based on um, a ranking system of which, which pixel to use from which satellite. And so again, uh, our uh, with the GSON system, we were able to use that to to deliver the, the lower latency LEO data to create this uh, global composite. And we hope to um, to start using this operational soon and, and have this data available for uh, um, near real-time applications. And we're gonna talk about a little bit about the uh, data registry where we acquire um, 
the, uh, the geodata um, goes east, goes west, is available um, in uh, Himarari. But not only that, uh, the uh, viewers data from uh, MPP, Node 20, Node 21, these data is um, global accessible. I mean, it's a, it's a global data set, it's free, freely available. And one of the things that we, we want to assess is the latency of, of this data set, since latency is a, a key um, thing for, for us. And we found out that the, um, the latency in the, um, the virus data and these uh, granules that comes in on this S3 bucket ranges from <clears throat> anywhere from uh, 15 minutes to two hours for a given you know, 24 hour period, which is the left image there. Um, but the right image, if we zoom up a little bit, we can see that the latency for v, for uh, NPP is between 30 to 120 minutes. And, and that's because they're using um, one ground station. Um, and the latency for the um, NOAA 20 and NOAA 21 is, um, is, is less because they use, um, they use two ground stations, one in Arctic, one in Antarctic. So the latency for this, these um, granules is between 15 and 55 minutes, which is, which is pretty good. So that's, that's, that means that we can really get access to global data uh, from, from these uh, VIRS, uh, VIRS data uh, within, within that time frame, which is, which is great. So this is all I have here. Um, JSON uh, is a flexible and scalable framework. We are able to use this for driving um, cloud products from Leo and Geo. Um, we can process other uh, science products. Um, latency is can be reduced if we combine the data and the resources together. And we hope to have our global cloud composite go operational by the end of the year. That's it. Thank you. So yeah, from Hyperflex, you said a few things that are important that I want to tie back all the other projects. One is the low latency. Mm -hmm. So as uh, Evan mentioned, that the now casting piece is important, and Ray talked about how our users want to be able to verify and now cast, you know, on very short time scales. Um, and so that for that end, another um, objective that we have is that we're trying to improve our direct broadcast capabilities as well. Um, the Navy's environmental satellite uh, receiver processor program (ESRP) is being updated this uh, this decade. We're trying to improve our the algorithms that we're using, so this definitely ties into efforts that are happening across the community. So, yeah, let's take a moment. Questions. That's not that's how it is. It's one year is to retrieve cloud property from Geo and Leo. Did you find any bias from these two satellites? And if so, can you provide the uniform unified products to community? Yeah. So, so um, yes, you're right. So, Geo, there is a um, a slight bias between the Geo and Leo in terms of uh, calibration. So we do our best to uh, calibrate both all the uh, Geo satellites to then tie that normal normalize that to uh, to one of the uh, Leo satellites. Mm -hmm. That way we get a more uh, consistent um, retrievals across Geo and Leo satellites. <clears throat> Thank you. Other questions? So one thing I want to know is that um, you said you're being uh, near real time operational. Who are your new operational users? Uh, NSEP users are uh, data set, and then we're also going to be supporting um, NASA's uh, Airborne Sciences for fuel campaigns. Okay, so NASA fuel campaign support and NSEP. So who would, are you interacting with NESDIS, or how does this interact with NESDIS um, processing? This is the, uh, I believe they do uh, the RUG model. There are. Okay, so yeah. this is for data simulation for the, um, the um, short term forecast. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Awesome. Yes, sir. Sir, does your cloud composite um, does it use ML at all? And what are you using for VNV? Especially ML? For, yes. Yeah. So so we have um, we have issues in um, retrieving optical depth at night. So we use ML to um, to help us evac the um, the daytime optical depths to the nighttime. So that's where we use ML. For Your verification validation? Yes, sorry to do that. Um, we've, we've verified with um, CloudSat and Calypso in the past. 
on cloud side, or because I think that's the same boat we're finding ourselves in is trying yeah, to find a good replacement. That's the next, yeah. yeah, the next satellite that comes out. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. All right. It's like our speaker. All right, so for our last talk of the session, I saw Tara pop up there. Let me see if I could stop sharing and let her take over. All right, so uh, I guess I, I get the honor of being the first virtual presenter, so hopefully this will go fine. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about the use of MetPlus, um, the verification and diagnostic capability for evaluation of cloud fields. Um, as was stated, my name is Tara Jensen. I'm with both NCAR RAL and DTC. Um, and let me get it going. Um, right now, uh, we have a, a large group of, of folks that work on MetPlus. So the ones that are listed here are primarily the, the scientists that are working on MetPlus, but um, they're supported by a, a huge team of, of software engineers. Um, you know, everybody's kind of like working part time um, on MetPlus. Um, and just wanted to give you some examples beyond um, just looking at clouds of things that could be done um, with MetPlus. Uh, you know, we have the ability to have spatial representation of, of errors, um, both uh, for point data as well as in, in gridded, um, you know, format. Um, I'm going to be showing a little bit of object-based um, approaches. Uh, we, you know, have support for ensemble measures. Um, we have, uh, you know, basic ensemble products, um, even like um, some of the neighborhood um, ensemble products uh, that have been used in, in short-range weather prediction. Um, for model developers, we've recently added in, um, you know, some of the diagnostics um, that will help them take a look at things like tendencies. Um, and uh, we also have a, a, a host of synthesis tools, including um, on our analysis suite um, side of things, uh, you know, having performance diagrams um, and scorecards. Um, but here in the middle is also being able to look at, you know, two different um, uh, fields and, and looking at the joint, um, re, you know, uh, uh, PDF of, of um, their uh, relationship and and see how they um, they uh, relate sorry relate to each other. Um, one thing that uh, I know was mentioned um, uh, was the scorecards, and we do have um, uh, interactive scorecard in development um, that uh, has been um, funded through some of our work through um, with the short range weather. Um, forecasting applications. Um, and, and so we're pretty excited about that. So what that means is, um, you know, once you have a scorecard, um, you can drill down into it um, to, um, you know, see the underpinning data. Um, so then um, MetPlus itself, this is just a really broad brush overview. In fact, this entire talk is very much a broad brush overview because um, we could spend hours and hours talking about MetPlus. Um, but basically, MetPlus um, started with its core um, suite of statistical tools called the Model Evaluation Tools, MET, which is represented here over in the schematic. Um, and that, um, you know, has uh, pre-processing and um, statistical capability and then some analysis tools as well. Um, and then uh, we've started we, what we have done in the past six or seven years is put Python wrappers around everything um, to make, um, to provide like a low level workflow um, to be able to pass data from one tool to the next. Um, so that um, if you don't want to write your own um, set of scripts to, to do that, um, then you can just use, um, you know, what our, our engineers have developed, which are highly configurable and, um, you know, make it easy to um, you know, set up and, and use it um, both in an operational and a research sense. So the wrappers are, are kind of um, represented here by these black arrows, kind of moving things um, within the MET tools um, themselves and then um, through the, the rest of the, the MET Plus um, software system. Um, and so then we have these analysis tools and um, we actually have two different user interfaces. One's MET Viewer, one's MET Express. MET Viewer is intended for really deep dive analysis of data. Um, MetExpress is, is more for like a quick look, um, pre-configured um, analysis and, and so forth. And actually both of those um, uh, capabilities now have that interactive scorecard um, to, um, to work with uh, the underpinning um, uh, libraries that, that we have um, to do the, the aggregation, the statistics and the plotting and, and um, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, so I also want to point out that we just recently had a, a coordinated release on August 1st. Um, it was actually just kind of an incremental release. It was um, a lot of the focus was on addressing um, the some of the STIG and um, sonar cube requirements that Jen Luce um, just mentioned um, for the Air Force um, in trying to comply with their cybersecurity um, requirements, um, IA requirements, and, and so forth. Um, and then um, we we had some other um, additions. Uh, kind of a lot of it was focused on tropical cyclone um, diagnostics and so forth. Um, oh, and I forgot to say um, all of the the inner workings of Met Viewer and Met Express. We're now kind of like bundling that together and just talking to talking about a Met, the Met Plus analysis tools because that, that's what they are. Um, so. Okay, so the overview for this talk is um, I'm, I'm really going to talk about cloud fraction um, because much of this work is based on um, some projects that we did with the US Air Force as well as with NRL. All the results are from it plus um, I'm just going to kind of give you um, it, it's kind of like um, showing you what you could do with Met plus but also kind of just talking about broad brush um, best uh, practices potentially. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, first off defining your truth or picking your truth, it, you know, it really does matter what you you choose to compare your forecasts to, whether you're um, looking at observations, point observations like salometers, um, you know, satellite-based satellite um, cloud analyses. Um, the example I have here is WIMCA, and this is, um, you know, from uh, multiple years ago um, before it looked all pretty like what Evan had in his presentation, um, or model-based cloud analyses like the RTMA, um, and then, you know, clearly just straight up observations, once again, um, through the satellite. Um, and, you know, when you're picking those truths, um, you also need to then think about how you're going to um, uh, juxtapose the, the forecasts, um, you know, to, to match up to the either observations or the analyses. Um, and so you have to start thinking about your interpolation. And do you need to do any subsampling? And and you know those those decisions um, are can be can be kind of cr critical. So within Met Plus, um, we have multiple interpolation methods, everything from nearest neighbor to unweighted means to budget if it's a mass conserving um, you know type of interpolations, um, say like for precipitation and so forth. Um, one thing that we learned in our conversations with the Air Force. Um, for something like WIMCA um, was uh, learning how the, the analysis that they had um, was being mapped onto um, a particular grid. And, and, um, and so in doing so, um, we also added in things like um, just map everything to the upper left-hand corner of the grid or the upper right or the lower left or the, the lower right. Um, we also um, added in their um, best, um, not necessarily uh, the the um, appropriate um, selection for interpolation sometimes, but if you wanted to just try and have um, an interpolation that best matches, um, you know, what's going on around the, all the um, different grid points, you, you could choose something like that. You can choose different um, shapes, either circles or squares. And then we do have some tools that, that provide for um, subsampling, both for point observations, that would be like ASCII to NC, and um, some of that is also embedded in the point tools like PointStat, but also point to grid. Um, which is um, kind of set up to either handle very data sparse data and, and turning that into a, a gridded um, field or data dense, um, such as satellites and so forth. So we do have the ability to, to kind of manage those um, dense data sets as well. Um, another thing is, you know, if you're talking about cloud, especially cloud fraction, something that, you know, goes from zero to one, um, you know, you should be leery about using things like continuous statistics for clouds. Um, uh, similar to like precipitation and other fields that have a minimum of zero, you know, continuous statistics just don't really um, sometimes give you the best rep representation of how the model is performing. Um, but also um, this here gives you an example of the source, the source of truth, once again, um, influences the results. So we have um, raw fields and statistically post-processed fields. The raw fields are kind of like the, the um, dark blue and the pinkish color here. Those are kind of um, you know, the higher and, and lower um, mean error percentage-wise. Um, statistically post-processed are, are the ones that are kind of sitting closer to zero um, in the light blue and, and you know, the green and, and so forth. Um, and then the dashes and, and the solids are from different um, observations um, and analyses. And 
And you can just see that, um, you know, across all three of the, the pink lines, um, you know, the, the mean error really does vary quite a, quite a significant amount, um, depending on which analyses or, or observations you use. So just um, pick your, your truth once again wisely, um, but be cautious of using continuous statistics. You may want to um, turn those continuous statistics into like a quasi-categorical um, statistic for something like cloud fraction, because it already kind of has that um, implicit um, category built into it. Um, so here's an example of looking at mean error um, for um, conditional thresholding. And you know you can see once again that, that there are differences um, when you do verify with those um, conditionally thresholded categories. Um, you know, for cloud fraction, once again, categorical, categorical statistics is probably um, the better option to go with. Um, and so, you know, just throwing out, um, you know, you can just look at probability de de detection and false alarm ratio and just a couple of the, the different categorical statistics, um, which are shown over here on the left-hand side, or you can use something like a performance diagram that, um, you know, pulls together four different categorical statistics and you can really um, tease out some of the relationships that you're looking at. Um, once again, here, um, the raw uh, model fields um, tend to not perform as well and, and not be as close to this optimal value for a performance diagram as the ones that are um, post-processed. And then um, we have definitions for cloudy and clear um, based on um, percent of, of cloud fraction. And, and you can see that there is actually a distinction between how well um, the, this, these models perform um, both for cloudy and clear or partly cloudy. So then spatial methods are, um, you know, are also an approach. Um, this is mode, um, but it, you know, they can be useful, but they, they, you have to spend a fair amount of time just trying to get things set up. Um, so you, I would suggest you have a lot of data um, examples um, to figure out the thresholding that you need to use. So down here in the lower left is the, um, the WIMCA, um, you know, uh, analysis and applying um, uh, different thresholds of greater than 60% cloud fraction, 75, 80, 90, and 100. You can see that um, if you just went for like fully cloudy, um, you would you would only actually get um, possibly one object. But if you kind of like loosen up your, your definition of cloudy a little bit to 90 or 80%, you probably have a better representation of the the cloudy fields and the, the not cloudy fields. So you, you need to kind of play around with that. Um, in this case mode, um, the, the radius of smoothing, convolution radius was five. Um, so then that was regional. And then if you look at um, what happens when you, you take um, something similar, like a radius of five and a convolution threshold of 75. So that would be kind of like um, having this for a regional type of application. Um, when you get to, to looking at it globally, um, the the size of those um, objects that are cloudy um, and the number of objects can can become overwhelming, and and so you may need to um, play around with um, possibly using like a different convolution radius or, or something like that. So here's a comparison between convolution radius of five versus convolution radius of twenty. Um, and, you know, here I would say that, you know, clearly the, the cloud, um, cloudy areas are very not, um, very misrepresented, not, you know, covered very well. This, um, once again, is a little bit more complex. So somewhere in between is probably a little bit better, but you, you need to have that in mind as you're moving forward with your verification. Um, and then if you um, really, you know, have a global area and, you, and there's like a particular region of interest um, that you, you're most um, interested in, um, MetPlus does have masking, um, which you can apply, and then you can look for objects inside that mask. Um, the question is to, to you, to um, your users, are those partial objects useful? Um, here, um, this is an example of, of finding the cloudy objects, and then this is the example of finding the clear objects, um, where it's the dark blue. I'm not quite, I, I mean, to me, I say that the, the, these are still useful, but I'm not quite sure if, if the end user um, for um, NRL would find those um, to be useful. So it, it's something to, once again, keep in mind. So um, MetPlus, um, you know, besides having what I already covered, um, we do, you know, have support for a lot of other um, uh, cloud fields and um, sources of, of um, cloud uh, observations and, and um, 
uh, analyses and so forth. And, and we um, have these examples or these use cases that you can look at. Um, and there's actually um, a new category um, called clouds um, that right now is populated with um, some examples of a project that we did with NCAR um, M cubed um, for uh, a project called Panda C. Um, it was also with the Air Force. And that just kind of shows comparing, you know, setting up, um, looking at GFS and, and WARF and some other models and using um, other um, uh, observation sources and analyses and, and different um, fields and stuff like that. So you may want to go check that out. And um, I just want to take one last minute to talk about some, um, some of our collaborations um, and just also point out to you that um, one operational center that's probably not um, represented here um, very much is EMC, because that's, you know, NOAA, not DOD. Um, their MetPlus is um, the core of the um, EMC verification system, um, which is coming by the end of the, the calendar year. Um, and, I, you know, when, when talking about um, trying to meet all the requirements of operational centers, um, we, you know, we're working with the Air Force on the cybersecurity side of things, and then we're constrained by the requirements of um, NSEP central operations, and they um, have very strict um, guidelines on Python requirements. So um, for those that were um, bemoaning, um, you know, uh, some of the Python libraries and trying to work through those requirements, it's, it's very possible that MetPlus will fit within the footprint of, of what your, um, your cybersecurity um, people are, are looking for, um, because it, we, we have to be very careful about the Python libraries that we allow into MetPlus. Um, but our collaborations, you know, we're working with the Met Office, um, on looking at subsampling of high resolution output for neighborhood methods, as well as um, on observational uncertainty. Eric Gilliland, one of our statisticians, is kind of working on an approach um, that goes beyond what we already have for ensembles for um, looking at observational um, uncertainty. You know, we're working with um, the Air Force on the cybersecurity. Bureau of Meteorology just started contributing to, to MetPlus. Um, and then we have these really large collaborative efforts across. Um, NCAR, Met Office, NOAA, NRL, um, once we get um, sorted out with NRL and on a, a statement of work, um, uh, to work on supportive evaluation of native or unstructured grids and the use of JEDI libraries. And then we have a, a whole bunch of new um, capability that's coming in in the S2S, the seasonal forecast system arena, fire weather, space weather, land, marine cryo, um, air quality, atmospheric composition, and, and so forth. So with that, I will take questions. Can we unmute you in the room? Can you hear us, Dara? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Um, really appreciate it. I think it's tied together the session really well. We've got another minute or two for questions. So any questions around the room? Jason? That was a great presentation, Chuck. Thanks. Yeah. Um, having worked with Quay, um, we found that there are a lot of dependencies on the parameters that we're using for both. Um, yeah. Is there other plans to do any kind of synthesis from different groups talking about these parameters and maybe giving some uh, ideas for for people who start using those? And like, what? How? What are we? What are we looking for? Like, what is a cloud? This kind of goes to the what is a cloud question. You know, how, yeah. Is there um, some way to do that? You know, I we haven't had a specific <laughs> request to do that. However, I, I do feel that um, uh, it, that would be ben beneficial. I, I know that um, that's part of what our use cases are supposed to maybe help show. Like you can go in and, and say, you want to see all the use cases that use mode. And that might help you with getting started with some of the configurations. But I, I, I do think that that's actually a really good idea to add into um, our user's guide, maybe um, some additional documentation of of suggested places to start. So I that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. In the back. Hey, Tara, it's Matt Wandish. And it, related to that, I've, I've had an idea that floated around, but I haven't had a chance to explore kind of similar fraction scale score and you grow your neighborhood and see where how the scores behave as a function of that. If you did the same sort of thing with the settings of defining objects and defining your, so you're not, you're not interested in the scores themselves, but the settings that achieve scores. And that's gonna tell you something about the nature of the objects in the two fields. And it seems like 
some sort of optimization of that could uh, could be useful. Um, yeah, so so we do have the ability to, um, in essence, kind of define a um, an array of thresholds um, and like um, smoothing, you know, the convolution radii and the convolution thresholds, um, so that you can come up with like a, a heat map or you know something like that, um, or you know see a, a, a wide variety of um, you know what everything looks like. And, and we actually recommend if people are, are exploring a new field that they may want to do that. So I think we already have the starting point for that. However, um, there may be some you know nuances or, or some tweaks that we could do to make it more useful to um, you know model developers. So once again, let's let's chat offline about that. All right, I think we've got one more. What gridding are you guys currently using and are you looking to move towards an MPAS grid? Okay, so we right now um, we can handle a fair amount of um, standard projections for standard like atmospheric models. Um, the MPAS unstructured native grid, um, we are actually uh, working on um, adding in um, support for that right now through a project through the DTC, working with Craig Schwartz um, and, um, and some other folks. Um, from Jedi um, to to provide support directly for like the MPAS grid. Once we um, crack that nut and you know get that capability in place, then um, in, then we're moving on to um, Elfric, which is the UM the new UM model that's coming in, tripolar for oceans, um, and then UFS, um, and that is listed in order of um, funding sources and deliverables. Great, thank you. Yep. Tara, one more time. Thank you. All right, so let's uh, take a break time and um, we are, let's remain on time for the rest of the uh, meeting. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Going to talk now more about uh, statistical post processing and machine learning. Uh, with chat GPT, machine learning has been a big deal lately, and uh, a lot of this that is now bleeding into the cloud forecasting arena. So we're going to start soon. We're going to start now. <laughs> so our next speaker is Philippe Tissot. Uh, he's from the uh, uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, Conrad Blucher Institute. I've uh, known him for several years now. He's uh, really good at machine learning. Uh, his Talk is uh, machine learning for coastal fog predictions and the AI to ES National Institute. Uh, take it away from me. Super. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for inviting me, Jason, Chuan, organizers, and great talks to start with. Um, yeah, Evan, Raymond, I, I get a better idea about the clouds. So, uh, <laughs> or the fuzziness of it, the multiple wavelengths, the, I love it. Uh, so, um, my, my talk, so I'm Philip Tissot, I'm at Texas A&M University Corp Corpus Christi, and uh, this is uh, our coastal university. We work on coastal AI. AI. Um, the co-authors are students and colleagues, Hamid Kamangir, Evan Krell, PhD students, Waylon Collins is at the National Weather Service, uh, Brian Colburn, a student, and Scott King, my, uh, my colleague here, professor of computer science. And I'll have, uh, I'm gonna talk to you about three topics during this um, during this talk. First, uh, three slides about the National Science Foundation AI Institute uh, that I'll be describing. And the reason I'm doing that is that it's the NSF AI Institute that is the most overlapping with the with the work of, uh, of this workshop. Then I'll spend the bulk of the talk on talking to you about uh, machine learning, deep learning architectures that we're using to, to predict visibility and uh, and fog. And I'll, I'll finish with uh, three slides on our, on our pipeline of students. I think, I think something we probably all agree on is that we're not gonna have enough specialists to really ramp up AI, AI is performing, but I got people, people are gonna trust it, how well it's gonna work. And we need a lot more people who understand it that can uh, help us there. So the AI Institute. So we're the NSF AI Institute for Research on Trustworthy AI in Weather, Climate and Coastal Oceanography. So great overlap with this workshop. Uh, I'm pointing out the trustworthy, and that's where when we deploy those methods, when we start interacting with the users, this is this is key. And then I think there's a lot more work that needs to go into in, into it 
and uh, I'll have a couple of comments later. The first row is the academic institution. The second row are the private sector institutions that are part of the Institute. And uh, the third row is uh, you have NCAR, you have NOAA. Um, and uh, so it's a big, there's well over you know, maybe 150 people are collaborating uh, on this. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big institute, one of the five original one. A few, a few faces. Uh, on the top left, Amy McGovern, he's our PI, uh, our, the director of the Institute, and in large part, the driving force be between this convergent effort. Uh, you meet, uh, well, you'll, you'll hear from David John Gagne, who's giving one of the invited talks for the, uh, for the, for the workshop and other folks. If you know them, we'd, lo we'd love to collaborate, talk to, to any, any of us. And finally, about the AI Institute, this, this is the model. And uh, we work uh, in uh, in circle. There's the broadening uh, participation and workforce development that I talk a little bit at the end. And uh, otherwise, it's a convergent effort. And we got sort of three focal areas, but ex extremely mixed uh, to, together. Trustworthy AI. It's the algorithms. It's the the methodology to make AI more more robust. Uh, more more understandable, better uncertainty quantification. Uh, David John's one of the leaders in in the in that areas. The environmental science is folks who who work at the intersection between AI and their own field, atmospheric science, coastal coastal oceanography, and risk communication. It's a critical part that's usually is not as formally there in those convergent efforts. Is risk communication efforts uh, experts who work with us very closely from the beginning of developing a model. I think that's that's what uh, one of the messages that you gotta have them from the very beginning interact measuring. And I'll have one slide that shows the kind of instruments that they're using. So that's for AI to ES. In terms of our work at Corpus Christi, we're coastal. Um, I'm the chair for coastal uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, we've been doing AI for a long time, since 1999 focused on uh, on users we've been operational since the mid the mid 2000s and presently uh, this is picture that kind of says what we're working on coastal inundation very important along the coast coastal fog which i'll be talking about today sea turtle conservation we've also done some lightning and the rationale for for this is that uh, the coast is kind of a tough problem nonlinear problems interactions of atmosphere land ocean and numerical models sometimes have trouble communicating with each other so it's a great place for ai particularly if you're doing forecast you know local operational forecast for your user you can really tweak them uh, so now fog so uh, for us, FOG started four or five years ago, and uh, the, uh, the, the first publication is a model called FOGNET. And I'm gonna talk about this first arch architecture. So uh, this is a 3D convolutional neural net, and I'm gonna start with the, with the maps here. So we're combining, uh, this is kind of a, on the, in the middle there, this is a sea surface temperature map from, from satellite. So one of the products, um, then we have, we'll use a lot of maps from numerical uh, uh, weather, uh, predictions, the NAM uh, here, the, the, we also augment the sea surface temperature between, we create um, mixed features between the sea surface temperature and the lower lower atmosphere. So we end up with a stack of like a big cube of 384 maps. And we want to use, and they're, they're in different times, so up to 24 hours. So different times, we have the spatial from the map, and we feed that into a, um, a deep learner, but how to do that. And so first we go with the physics and we decided that we want to split, sort of guide the model with the physics and the, the cube of maps are split in those five groups. The, the fifth one, for example, is the sea surface temperature, the one that also has the satellite imagery based. Uh, once we have those five groups, each of them at a time, we feed them into an architecture where we do the 3D uh, first by doing convolution, uh, CNN convolution on the feature maps themselves. And then the 3D comes by having uh, a vertical convolution, a 1D vertical convolution uh, across the variables or the different levels of the atmosphere. And then we, we combine them before, uh, we, uh, before we use a classifier. The, the results are, are quite good. This is the, the table on the bottom left here. Uh, Fognet is, is our model and we compare it with the uh, with HREF, an operational model used in, in Corpus Christi. So we do, we do significantly better. Um, and this is for up to 24 hour lead times and uh, for a threshold of 1,600 to uh, 3,200 and 6,400 meters. So we have something that works well. Uh, the next questions, of course, can you improve it, but also why? 
Uh, and if people use it, they're going to ask what, what is really happening. So we're doing a lot of explainable AI. And uh, Evan Krell, who's in the room there, will talk to you more this afternoon on, on XAI. But I'm going to give you a, a sort of a basic example. That's a, a publication from last year. So we asked the question, do you really need to do 3D? Or maybe a bunch of 2D uh, you know, analysis will, will work. And that's the, the graph on the top left. And yes, 3D gives you an, an advantage. Then we, we split based on the physics into five groups. Is it worth it? And uh, we also rank sort of order the features. Does it, make, does it make it easier for the deep learner to identify features that then they, it can extract predictability? And the answer is again, yes. And then the last one that I'm gonna point out, this one Evan's gonna talk about or something similar. And on the last is uh, for some features, we saw that the, the location itself, the, the importance to the model of what's happening right at the location where we predict is really larger. And so that is gonna lead to a simplification and a competing model. So that's for FogNet, our base model, and the XAI that we uh, do. Uh, talking with uh, the organizer, said, oh, talk to us also about the latest things that we do. So this is not published. Uh, it, it's on its way. Hopefully, we'll have a, a manuscript by the end of the year. And uh, so FogNet's good, but there's a lot of work on the transformers. And so this is our work on trying to use the, the transformer type architecture to predict fog and, and visibility. And uh, so we use self-attention. Uh, we use the um, uh, visibility vision transformer and uh, the, where we do most of our work is on the tokens. How do you pick the tokens to get good performance, one, but also possibly do XAI, do the explanation a little differently. And so I'm going to show four different type of architectures for the for the tokens. One, the, the first one, so the it's the vision transformer. You feed your tokens. Uh, the embedding is, uh, I think, uh, 1,024. Uh, neural nets. Uh, it's multi-head. It's got eight heads and it's got six layers. That's Hamid's, uh, Hamid's design. And for the tokens, which what I will emphasize, we have slabs. So in this case, we have 16 tokens, each one of them being a slabs that go through all the different maps uh, to try to extract the information. And then a 17th token for, for, the, for the ordering. Another one uh, is just instead of taking slabs, we take one map at a time. And so we have a lot more tokens, 300 then any four tokens plus the uh, another one for the ordering of the tokens. Um, then another version is to take the slabs again, but then split them in, split them in time group. We have condition at zero uh, zero uh, at the prediction time, and then six, twelve, twenty four hour predictions, and you can possibly give a better hint to the deep learner of the progression. And um, we first uh, process that into groups, and that will give us the, the goal also, also is to look at the attention scores that possibly is going to give us uh, insight into how the model works, and we'll, may, we may be able to do XAI uh, based on that. And then the final one, we're doing the tokens are the maps themselves. Um, but uh, we split them in physical group and also in temporal group, and then we feed that into the, the, vision, the vision transformer. So this is the results we have so far. Um, it works as well as, uh, as FogNet, maybe a little better, maybe we'll be able to improve. Not a major, major improvement, um, but um, this is, we've got our architectures, and we're going to start looking at DXAI and can we, can we get. All right, so done with that. Um, I showed that the location was was important. This is an alternate. We're very focused on operational. And so FogNet would be difficult to, to implement, possible but difficult. And this is a version, an autoencoder version, where you take the HER, because our partners told us what well, we prefer use to use the HER, the um, uh, high resolution rapid refresh model. We feed that into an encoder. Uh, we get the, um, the, the the predictions. And uh, we do that. The model that we have now is it's a, just one model for the whole Texas, Alabama, Louisiana coast. And uh, the observations are the METAR observation from all these uh, from all these uh, uh, locations, from all these airports. Um, the graph on the left here uh, tells you that it's working pretty well. It's actually overall overperforming uh, the the her or we work with IBM uh, weather weather company there. Uh, but where it counts the most on the bottom left there, not so much. We're more like a tie, so we, we're not primed for for operation. And uh, so that's our sort of that's our competing model. Uh, I said that I was gonna just briefly, oops, uh, talk about the, uh, yeah, talk about the risk communication. So the risk communication team worked with us to develop a um, 
um, an, an instrument to talk with forecasters. And they've uh, picked randomly forecasters around the country. Uh, they've gone through 13 interviews and uh, they were looking at uh, would they trust Fognet or not? Uh, is the explainable AI component important for them to trust it, to understand the models? And uh, this is ongoing work. We probably within, within six months, uh, uh, starting at AMS in January, we should have some answers. So I'm gonna finish the talk with the with the pipeline, so we need we need more folks. Uh, so for us, we're ideally located. We're in South Texas, um, and uh, so we looked at how can we get as many students and broadening also the the type of students that are getting into science um, and and AI. And so we we work with uh, a community college, and I love this pairing uh, because when you so we work very early on with community college students. Their faculty send us to 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 us. We've hired ten of them as undergraduate researchers of, uh, so so far, and I'll give you an example that some of you are familiar with. <laughs> um, and we we have, we really it's the same city. It's about thirteen thousand students for both institutions, but we target a, a different type of of, uh, of population. A lot more first generation URMs. Um, and then we, we do research with them as part of AI2ES. And that first slide that you saw with AI2ES, where you have the private sector company, what they see and particularly what their families see, because if you go to a first generation on a URM, you got to convince the whole family that studying the clouds, can you believe you can make a living studying the clouds? <laughs> <laughs> All right, wrong crowd to ask the question, but it's a good question if you want to broaden your your. your friend. Um, and then, and then the, the the internships. The internships are are critical there. I'm going to show a few smiling faces after their their internships here. Um, uh, you'll you'll hear from Evan, who who uh, who did a uh, who has good good track record on internship. I think these past couple of years. And then uh, Beto Estrada and and Christian Duff were at an NRL during the the summer. Uh, Beto was at Del Mar. Uh, spent the last two summers at, at NRL. He's graduating this semester with um, a bachelor's in computer science, a minor in atmospheric science, and he wants to continue research. Uh, there's no way he would have wanted to do research if he hadn't gone through this type of, uh, of progression. And uh, another, let's see, another few images of the, the team uh, interacting with middle school students, uh, Evan at, uh, at a poster or at another event. And then I'll finish with questions with two. Uh, so this is the whole AI2ES team at NCAR this January. And uh, a randomly selected, I'm not quite sure why, uh, internship picture there. So thanks a lot to, to Jason Schwen and Rob. <laughs> That's very good talk. And you can put up a couple of really important point that we have had problems with is that that's a crew map. Uh, especially when we're located, we're just down the road from the Bay Area. So it was a lot of people to, to Google. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you might you comment. How, how do you do it? How do you get people to, 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 to come work for something you know, like the government or the military or, or the university center? So I, I think for, for our students, I don't think the, I mean, Google would be great. And I think that very first slide that I, uh, that I show, uh, well, yeah, I'm not going to go much further. It's, it's very important for them to see the, the potential progression. But once they once they get into research, and I was actually I, I started in Corpus Christi in 1999, compared to College Station. They the the students are maybe not as uh, maybe not as career oriented as they would be in a circuit. And then when you when they start working on a scientific problem like that, they really they they love it. And uh, some of them we do operational AI, and some of them want to stay in the computer science part and stay there. I have a few examples. And others start really looking at the, uh, uh, combining the computer science and the and the next. And I think I think most of those students who are we, we're funding, uh, you know, twenty to twenty five students on a continuing basis at, at the time CC, and then NCAR has already used the rest of AI two ES. And I think most of if there is the opportunity, the timing is also important. If there is the opportunity, I think most of them will stay in, in our field. Yes, and also like answer that question too. I think that the the money is one thing, but the second thing is that we have a really interesting problem that the student really want to learn because that if you invest into a car, it could be go up and down, but you invest in the skill set, it's always go up. I think that that's what we that's why we have the student come to us too. They love to work on problems that are going to solve something that people will be using. Yes, that that's I think that's the the big attraction that we can attract a real talent. 
that who want to solve the real life yeah. science problem. Uh, so I just downloaded the paper, so I look forward to reading about more. Um, I really like the construction of the AI, and I like the selection of the physical variables. Um, I guess what I'm asking is that ultimately, um, all the variables are NWP, and then there's SST, right? So um, it's essentially a bias correction, or you're trying to improve the model's output or representation of fog and cloud. So I guess what I wanted, wanted to ask was, um, you know, we definitely care about cloud fog, we care about the cloud base. When is it fog versus cloud? Um, do you find it difficult to construct, you know, given the models change, right? There's model upgrades and there's an instability there. Um, how do we make the AI robust enough to account for model changes and these kind of different definitions in cloud versus fog? Uh, it seems like the architecting that is, is going to be difficult. So, so we're going to be testing if the sea surface temperature is, is uh, from high res, high quality sea surface temperature is indeed important for fog net. One of one of part of the test is the variable row encoder. If we can if we can approach with the variable row encoder the performance of, of fog nets, then okay. I, I suspect that we, there will be a, a gap that, and I think the sea surface temperature high risk will be important. So now for the for the refresh of the models. So we, we've had operational models for a long time uh, since the mid two thousands, and it, it it hasn't mattered too much. But it's, it was for uh, for coastal, so we moved from the NAM, from WARF, from uh, others. Now we use NDFD. We but we train our model with with real data. We go per 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 prog, and then we make the assumption that the model is going to get better and better. And if you have actual observation, the model should should approach that. Now for fog or for for problems where you don't have as much uh, actual observation. Um, yeah, this is a tougher. This is a tougher problem, and uh, we we have not operationalized something as big as uh, as the as a fog predicted model. I think that's an interesting insight, though. If you use the same construction essentially for twenty years, and the models uh -huh. have changed all that time, that really the models are still missing fundamental parts that the AI is accounting for. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. You said something very important about okay. learning in AI, and that is that the location plays a big role. One of the things that we, we, we realize is yes, AI and machine learning, for some reason, spit bubblegum, maybe it does get it right for a location. Yeah. We should be able to use training data for fog yeah. and the Grand Banks to yeah. predict fog in Death Valley or White Sand this range if we get the physics right. Yeah. And we're not getting the physics exactly like that. Because so that's if we do that, yeah. we can then make the AI work better and more robustly in different areas. But, so yeah, that that would that would be great. But I think if you go if you go AI, you go data centric, and you also often look at the uh, sort of extreme events, and we have nonlinear systems, and so the your your verification should be local, not global, on the model. And so that local verification on, on a well, it probably involves some nonlinear pro, nonlinear processes, and only that I kind of place based. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, I don't know if you want. I think the ideal is that if you could have an AI model that maybe has some adaptations for different, not not just one city or one coast, like our our. Uh, uh, our auto encoder goes the whole northwest Gulf of Mexico, which is still, still small compared to the problem that our Air Force does. But I, uh, I, I think, uh, I think because of the nature of AI and because of the nature of the verification, I don't know that you'll get a, a global physics right. You're, I'm just saying that yeah. we can do better so that it's yeah. not just one area. Yeah. And so maybe we just have a, a notion model. It'd be nice if you're following that ship around. For yeah. example, with your window, oh. that you can use the same set of AI type of predictors yeah. um, for, for that whole yeah. ocean. Yeah. Maybe we can't use the ocean for predicting land on. And so there are parameters we're not putting in, for example, net radiation. Yeah. And you know what's going on beneath the sea surface or beneath the ground in terms yeah. of temperature changes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then Raymond love the problem of following the, the ship. <laughs> I also <laughs> picked that on that. Okay. This is a great conversation. I wish we could continue. <laughs> on to the next okay, so the next speaker is uh, virtual. Uh, it's it's Jeff McClay. He'll be presenting a uh, journal review of the cube and caliber clouds post processing project. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Justin McClay. This is will be a quick synopsis of the Cube of Calibrated Clouds project. Am I supposed to share my slides or is someone going to drive? Um, 
Oh, uh, you can share. share it. Can you share? Can you share? Okay. And Jim, I'll give you a, like a three minute and a one minute cue to it. And so you have 15 minutes. Okay. All right, sorry for the delay. So this is a, a quick synopsis of the Cube of Calibrated Clouds project. Uh, if you can't resist the thrill and excitement of some early benchmark results, well, you're in luck because I'm going to show some of those uh, now. And I'm also going to talk about some uh, practical realities that we're facing as we try to uh, spin this project up. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the other performers on the project, uh, my colleague Dan Hodes, senior scientist at the NRL Remote Sensing, uh, Matthew Fernandez, our new data scientist, and Glenn Carl, our software engineer. So one slide to put this um, project in context, it's actually the fourth in a series of post-processing projects for the Navy Global Ensemble. Um, the effort actually began in uh, around 2016 with a project that uh, corrected significant wave height. Uh, it was followed by a project to correct near surface winds. And then um, the effort gathered steam uh, in 2020 with a project to correct uh, some uh, aviation weather variables that were critical to uh, the Navy's uh, long duration UAV uh, operations for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And then this project uh, that I'm talking about today uh, began in uh, last December and it has the uh, objective of correcting uh, cloud variables. And it's tied in with some projects that you hear about later in the workshop, um, Jason Chomkin's JDAC project, and then uh, Weep Christofferson's Unified Cloud Regime Verification. So uh, really quickly, the uh, objective that we're working toward is a calibration system that generates a 40 uh, data cube of unbiased and calibrated probabilistic cloud forecasts from the surface to the top of the atmosphere and across a, roughly the one week forecast interval. And uh, calibration, um, just for the record, means uh, using the historical relationship between uh, the forecasts and observations, uh, their, their joint distribution to adjust the, the mean variance and other moments of today's forecast console. And it's fairly obvious that this effort could have uh, very broad operational impact. Uh, any downstream system that relies on cloud data could benefit, and there are, are a lot of those type of systems. And it's also useful for many research projects. And even though the project started uh, last December, it's basically still learning how to walk. Uh, we do have some accomplishments. I'll, I'll talk about those later. One point about our uh, the way we structured the project, uh, we. We structured it to have two parts. Uh, we begin with developing a benchmark solution. This uses traditional uh, methods and builds off the uh, our, an existing post-processing software package that we have. And then uh, we'd like to move to uh, an advanced solution, which uh, likely would use some form of uh, machine learning or AI, depending on the data availability and the nature of the problem. Um, the objective here is just to uh, obtain the most added value that we can. And then at, at the moment, that appears likely to come from the MLAI approaches. And uh, in terms of uh, effort this year, most of it was devoted to developing this, this benchmark solution. So I have a few procedural details about that benchmarking. Uh, the methods that the system relied on for, for correction are, are linear regression and quantile mapping. Um, these, of course, are, are elementary methods. We, we snicker amongst ourselves about them, but uh, they're simple but effective. <laughs> um, Hamill and Scher have dozens of advanced post-processing papers uh, between the two of them, and uh, yet they still found value from using quantile mapping, uh, for instance, in 2018 uh, study. The variable we're looking at is um, 
probability of column total crowd, cloud fraction exceeding some uh, threshold. And the event we chose is uh, for just for the benchmarking is uh, the sky cover being broken or overcast. So the cloud fraction exceeding uh, 0.5. And uh, we validated it against uh, GO16 observations uh, provided by uh, Jason's project, Jason Jonkin. And one point about the, the post-processing solver is it, it works locally. So uh, it moves through the, the grid points uh, of interest. And uh, if there's one over the Pacific Ocean, say, uh, for training, it searches within a certain radius or box around that point uh, spatially. And it looks back a certain number of days uh, to, to produce a, a cylinder or a, a column of, of training data. And then uh, it's distributed code. So we run it on uh, one node, typically about 16 CPUs. So uh, three slides of, of results for the benchmarking, uh, beginning with this case study uh, of calibration from last February. On the left, we have the raw forecast field, and this is a 48 hour ensemble forecast probability that the total cloud cover is going to be broken or overcast. And uh, I helpfully omitted the color bar. Uh, um, the dark red means probability one, and the zero, uh, the, the white means probability zero. Um, for comparison, uh, we have the GOES observations on in the far right panel. Um, again, dark red means uh, it's broken or overcast, white means um, it's not. And uh, there's probably a little more clouds than you might expect uh, intuitively. And uh, this is in, in some significant part due to the fact that the, the GOES is considering very optically thin cirrus uh, within the um, broken or overcast uh, categorization. But uh, comparing the, the raw and the observed probability field, we see that uh, uh, there's some agreement, pretty decent agreement in the uh, North America area, but uh, the, the raw model has very little probability of cloud cover over the subtropical Atlantic, whereas in reality, there's a lot. And uh, similarly, over the uh, southwest corner of the plot over the East Pacific, uh, the model misses uh, some cloud cover there. And the calibrated field is, is shown in the middle. And uh, it has uh, increased the probabilities of a subtropical Atlantic uh, substantially. And it's not probability one, but it's much better than what the raw model was giving. And it's done likewise over the uh, Eastern Pacific. So um, at least qualitatively, the calibration seems to be doing uh, some good things. Uh, of course, we need to quantify this uh, you, uh, ultimately. And, uh, one way we do this is through a uh, re reliability diagram. So in the center, I have the, the validation domain again. And on the right, the, the reliability diagram. And the idea here is that when, when your system's calibrated, if uh, your forecasts are, are predicting a certain probability of, of the event, then uh, for all those forecasts, you'd like to see an observed frequency uh, that matches that forecast probability uh, in, in some expected sense, which all of that is to say that you want the uh, points uh, in the diagram to lie along the 45 degree line. And uh, we see with the raw ensemble points uh, in black that they are well off that diagonal. Uh, and uh, what this is telling us is that the, the raw forecast is um, under predicting broken or total cloud cover. So if the forecast is saying 40% uh, chance of broken or overcast, in reality, you're seeing uh, roughly 70% uh, observed frequency. And it switches uh, for the high forecast probabilities. There, it, uh, the, the ensemble is over predicting the, the event probabilities. And happily, um, the calibrated forecast uh, points in red lie almost right on the diagonal. So the, the calibration is doing what we expect. Uh, and we'd hope to see this because we're actually optimizing with respect to these reliability diagrams. Um, but it's doing what we want. And then more subtly, you see that uh, the range of observed frequencies that are uh, captured by the, um, 
the calibrated forecast probabilities, if you project uh, the, the red points onto the y-axis, it's larger than the, the range for the, the raw ensemble. So that's telling us that the uh, calibrated system is more effective at uh, dis discriminating or resolving um, categories of reserve frequency. So another uh, encouraging result. And final benchmark result, um, this is for the Briar score. I show this because uh, we're not specifically optimizing to the Briar score. So there's actually no guarantee we're going to improve it. Um, but in fact, uh, what you see here in, in the blue shading is are areas where the calibration uh, improves the, the uh, Briar score and in red it, where it degrades. And um, clearly over wide swaths of the main where the, the calibration is improving the Briar score. And there's a relative improvement criterion applied here too, 30%. So everything here that's shaded is leading to 30% relative improvement, which is, is really good. So the um, so the calibration seems, uh, at least from the, the benchmarking, seems uh, to be uh, suitable or sufficient. Um, so what do we do for our next steps? Uh, what do we do for this planned advanced solution? And here, um, we almost have an embarrassment of riches <laughs> um, in terms of uh, methods that we can choose from. The, the history of post-processing is just so deep. So we, we've hardly scratched the surface in terms of uh, traditional methods. Um, there's, there's MOS, there's ensemble MOS, there's uh, logistic regression, Bayesian model averaging. And then um, if we move to the MLAI space, um, the entry level method is random forest, which has seen application to clouds. Um, then of course, um, neural network approaches, um, many studies applying these to clouds. Um, Behran 2021 used a traditional uh, network configuration, non-convolutional, and saw gains relative to uh, logistic regression and other baselines. Um, Dupuy used a convolutional neural network in the form of a UNET. Diane Henry, um, one of the methods they examined was a generative adversarial network. Um, and then outside of the uh, literature, there are other uh, places uh, to gather uh, intel and uh, uh, information about uh, methods that might be tried. Uh, private industry, of course, Google and NVIDIA are, are uh, experimenting uh, with convolutional neural networks. Uh, then um, Lawrence mentioned the WMO S2S uh, AI challenge just concluded this year. Um, and uh, the winning team in that used uh, some form of convolutional neural network. So um, the trajectory in terms of literature and in terms of current work certainly seems to suggest that um, the state of the art going forward for post-processing is going to be neural networks. Um, but this, um, this, of course, depends on having sufficient data. And it's been pretty well established that um, these neural network approaches require a high quality curated large data sets for training. Uh, there's a nice study by Hopf et al. 2021 that summarizes some of these issues. And here's where it gets interesting for the Navy Global Ensemble because our output files are not archived long term. <laughs> uh, we don't have the space um, or the people to, to, to maintain the archive system. And also only a limited number of forecast fields are output. Uh, one of those is total cloud fraction, and that's what we've been working from. But there's no low, mid, or high cloud fraction. And also, we, we lack the fields required to discriminate cloud cover type, uh, convective versus stratiform. So we don't have, we, we, they simply don't have a convective accumulated precipitation, cloud uh, base or top, et cetera. Um, so um, thinking of ways yeah, we can just... adapt. Uh, in principle, we might be able to back out forecast cloud cover at various vertical levels given the, the forecast basic state variables. Um, but there might be hidden catches and difficulties with this. We haven't uh, dug into this problem uh, sufficiently yet. So we're a little nervous about uh, going full force with this approach. And what we've uh, proposed instead is to generate an in-house multi-year 
uh, NAVGEM ensemble or forecast data set. This would be done in FY24. The pros for this would be it gives us full control over the output and archiving that we don't have with the operational system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, also at the current ensemble resolution, um, it's really not that expensive to run a one times a week ensemble for 15 years, um, especially not compared to, say, the uh, resources required by the couple of modeling applications. Um, in the absence of that kind of reforecast data set, um, some options from the- uh, Justin, do you hear me? I hear you, yes. Yeah, Justin, we have one minute left. Okay, okay. Yeah, less than one minute, yes. Thank you. I will conclude. Um, so uh, we can't use the reforecast data set and we'll resort to some options from uh, the ML AI community. Uh, transfer learning is an option where we use uh, proxy data sets. Uh, data augmentation is another. And last ditch, we'll revert to traditional methods, um, possibly just with total cloud fraction and no discrimination in cloud tech. Um, this will, whatever method we choose will be significant to the Navy. It will be the Navy's first ever calibration system for clouds. And then this is my last slide. I already uh, flogged the, the training data question. Um, there is also an outstanding question of HPC resources, specifically finding GPUs for uh, um, to, to implement advanced machine learning solutions. Um, since, since I'm running out of time, I won't, uh, I won't get into the details of that. Um, thanks. Thanks, Jason. for one question. Now, just a comments for the MCS Cloud Tech is my group have developed its method to identify command core platform and also ammo region using Ghost data and the next right reader. And later on, my former student, Zhu Feng, he developed a database over continental, also globally, for that is a Cloud Tech. It's a command core spread from Apple Park, and that's a data set that should be used for, for your research. Yeah, thank you. That, that would be very useful uh, validation. Um, it, perhaps you can uh, send us a link uh, to the research or the, uh, mm -hmm. the website. Okay. Thank you. Right, thanks very much. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is Matt Matt King. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about optical flow applications for meteorological satellite imaging and cloud now testing techniques. All right, so my name is Matt King. I'm a second year PhD student at Colorado State University. Um, I'm actually active duty Air Force, so major and uh, Air Force weather officer. Oh, hi. Nice to see you. Um, so um, my advisor at Colorado State is a uh, uh, Steve Miller, who is the director of uh, the Cooperative Institute for Research in the Atmosphere at Colorado State, um, and Jason Apke, who is a research scientist at CIRA, uh, he's a optical flow expert. So he's been serving as my uh, technical advisor, if you will. So my ultimate goal for this presentation is to kind of go over uh, some optical flow applica applications for um, satellite imagery and then kind of how it fits into cloud now casting. And so cloud now casting in terms of like predicting where cloud locations are in the zero to three hour time frame. So, all right, can I go next on this one or do I have to click this one? The clicker works? It takes a little bit of time. Uh oh. Uh -oh. You hit the right arrow? Right arrow. On, on the laptop. Right arrow on the laptop. <laughs> this works. Oh, what we do? So is that working? Okay, cool. Yeah, I got to have nice pictures so to keep everybody engaged, right? All right. So Sears Overcast Research, uh, which is sponsored by the U.S. Navy uh, Office of Re Naval Research, it's ultimately aiming to have a advanced global 3D cloud structure analysis based off the state of the art cloud sensing uh, capabilities. So one of the milestones of uh, overcast is having uh, the capability of now casting based off of that analysis. So I'm sure all of you know that for DOD operations, having an accurate cloud locations is very important for 
whether it be aircraft visibility or hazards. Uh, and then ultimately, from my own personal experience in the Air Force, I know uh, firsthand that uh, for ISR, it's particularly important to have uh, correct cloud locations for cloud-free line of sight for uh, surface targets, um, particularly for uh, geospatial intelligence. Man, this is quite frustrating here. All right, we'll just do it that way. All right, so just a quick background. So this is not at all comprehensive, but uh, in the past, like, and as you kind of heard from Evan, uh, the Air Force has been doing vection for cloud now casting for decades. So almost as uh, early as cloud satellites or uh, meteorological satellites have been around. So uh, just the, the top one there for Air Force Avid Cloud Model. So I mean, ultimately it just advects a moisture parameter. So we can do better than that. Uh, more recently, the WARF model has been kind of adapted to take in cloud information and infect that forward in time. And then uh, Steve Miller actually uh, not, uh, a few years ago uh, came up with a method to group clouds together based off optical properties and then forward to them in time. Uh, a little bit more recently, uh, so optical flow has kind of started to become part of the literature, mostly with uh, now casting precipitation and winds. Um, so I'll talk about this a little bit later, but that's it's it's useful to use it in radar now casting, but it's a little bit more problematic when you try to involve satellite imagery. Um, and there has been some people that have tested it. And uh, Jason and I kind of, every, every time we read the literature, we always kind of scoff at it a little bit just because it's a piecewise field. And again, I'll go over that in a little bit later. Uh, and then ultimately machine learning. Machine learning has become ubiquitous, right? So everybody's talking about it. And, and, and everybody's been talking about it as well with just cloud now casting, uh, mostly using uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, and then uh, I believe a talk that you'll probably see later, uh, you know, New in uh, at all 2023, right? So uh, numeric weather prediction for cloud forecast corrections. Um, so yeah, it seems like a lot of people are talking about that here today. So, um, but where I started out was trying to figure out, hey, if I start from the bare basics of what was done before, how can I do cloud advection just using numerical weather prediction? So if I take GFS winds and I blow the clouds around, so so ultimately in, in overcast, what, we're, what we've been using is CloudRx. So clouds for AVHR are extended. So essentially we can get the cloud top heights and the geometric thickness of the clouds. So with that, I can create a three-dimensional grid as an initial condition and then apply GFS winds and then advect them forward in time, right? So I here is just some, uh, some of my results whenever I did this. The truth is on the top left. So that's the truth Claverick set as it evolves through time. And then the top right is actually my best, my best attempt at it. So it's based off of a semi-Lagrangian scheme of evecting clouds. Uh, you have a, a target time frame, and then you take the, the GFS trajectories and move backwards to find your 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 origin the origin time and then bring that value forward. So uh, the other ones uh, didn't quite work as well, and I'll, I'll kind of show that. Um, but ultimately, the, the the method that worked the best was based off the effective layer precipital water uh, product uh, based off of Gitro uh, 2018. So, all right. So results on the eviction, um, we just barely beat persistence. Persistence proves to be very, very difficult to beat. So, uh, but it does three-dimensionally, just using GFS winds, marginally do a little bit better than persistence. So I did a little bit more analysis uh, oh, there it goes. Um, and follow the GFS trajectories to figure out, okay, I would assume that when I evict the clouds, if there's changing or evolution in the clouds, the the skill score for those pixels are going to be lower. And, and based off my analysis of the GFS trajectories, that is in fact what I see. So ultimately, when you use evection schemes, you have several problems. One is incorrect trajectories. So numerical weather prediction is a bit flawed. Two, it's computationally expensive. So something in overcast, if we have a, a five-minute cadence to spit out another three-hour nowcast, that, that might take a bit too long, especially if we're talking about it on a global scale. And then lastly, vection dis doesn't dissipate or form new clouds. So that's a big issue. So the first two issues, the incorrect trajectories and the fact that it's computationally expensive, we think we can solve with optical flow. And then lastly, the... The formation of decay issue, that's, that's a little bit more of a difficult thing to fix, but we're hoping eventually we can use machine learning to fix that problem. So I have early results on that, but nothing quite definitive and you know revolutionary just yet. So, all right, so optical flow. There it goes, all right, so optical flow. So if you go back to the original paper back in uh, the 1980s uh, from Horn and Schunk, 
Optical flow is defined as the distribution of apparent velocities of movement of brightness patterns in an image. So back in um, com uh, computer vision uh, community, so this has kind of been around for quite some time. So Jason Apke has kind of taken the research that's been going on over the last 40 years, and he's been able to develop code to do this for satellite imagery. Uh, I know a lot of people have done it in the literature, but his code is pretty robust, um, taking a lot of the research that's been done. Uh, so, and one of the key things that his code does, uh, which he calls optical flow code for tracking atmospheric motion vector and now casting experiments, Octane. Uh, so one of the things that his code does is that it takes into account occlusion. So if you have clouds that move over other clouds, it's able to take that into account and provide you the, the higher level cloud. So, all right. So you can kind of see, oh, there it goes. So if we apply optical flow uh, to, to imagery, you can actually see where you can get a little bit more information than rather than just looking at the imagery. So you can see where you're, you're seeing the atmospheric motion vectors essentially. All right. So here's some uh, additional optical flow applications. So on the left, you can kind of see a, a high shear uh, thunderstorm environment where we've been able to overlay uh, the um, atmospheric motion speed uh, based off the color. So here on, on the right, you see more of a low shear environment. So, and you can kind of see that it's indicative in the color. So if you're, as a forecaster, looking at satellite imagery, you can get a little bit more information as to what's going on uh, in, um, the, uh, in the atmosphere. So this one is, a, is an interesting uh, application. So with optical flow, you can actually uh, have feature tracking because you kind of know where things are moving. So you're following pixels. So with that capability, you're able to distinguish changes in, say, cloud top uh, temperature or cloud top divergence. So having those type of parameters uh, may be potentially useful for cloud now casting. All right. So something else I want to talk about with optical flow is um, initially the concept of being able to move forward in time clouds. So hopefully I can loop through some of this here. Uh, essentially, if you have two images, you can apply the optical flow or compute the optical flow. And based off of that optical flow, you can theoretically move a cloud forward in time to its, you know, a predicted location uh, later in time. So. Uh, like I said before, in radar, this is there's a pretty convenient assumption that you can say that your your field is continuous. With satellite imagery, you can't really do that. So if you're looking at different images, you can see the ground in a lot of the parts of the images. So those are areas where your optical field uh, flow field is not necessarily continuous. You have areas where you have like zero speed. So what you have to do is you have to work forward your optical flow field, and then you can use sort of the conventional evection schemes to move things forward in time. So I'll show you an example of that later on. But uh, before I get to that, uh, we do want to talk about temporal correction. So temporal correction is pretty cool. So you can actually look forward and backward in time with optical flow. And when you do that, you can basically derive imagery that wasn't actually sampled from a satellite image and then provide that context in time. So I'll show a little bit of some examples. So here in this imagery, you can see from Go 16, uh, if you know like the scan strategies in the in, in the satellite, you have areas where you have five minute imagery, one minute, and, and sometimes if you have mesoscale sectors, you can overlap and get 30 seconds, right? But if you apply temporal uh, correction with using optical flow, you can actually make it look all seamless. It looks pretty cool. So you make it everywhere a, a meso anywhere product. And this is just kind of some more examples of, of doing that. So here's a, another 30 second meso sector. You zoom in. Uh, so this is actually the, the actual 30 second there, and then the interpolated 30 second. So if you let's see if I can move back. Can you say see any difference in the imagery? It's pretty hard. I think if I think you might be able to see just a little bit of some noise, and there is some weird behavior in. And the clouds as they kind of move effect forward on on the the left part of the image. All right, so uh, this is kind of a, a new thing that Jason actually applied with Octane. So on the left is truth imagery. On the right will be uh, an optical flow now casted imagery. So he applies his uh, concept with um, optical flow and using Octane, and then we can actually now cast the imagery. In relatively short period of time, it takes maybe 
a few like a few short minutes to do a full disc, something that I couldn't fathom trying to do with an evection scheme. It would take way too long. But there are some issues with this imagery. So in areas with uh, divergence, you kind of kind of it kind of scatters clouds a bit too much. Um, with uh, convection, with strong convection, it has a very difficult time with with dealing with that. So it sort of just kind of stretches things out because it's it's optical flow and it's basically image warping. So I've been in the early stages of using machine learning to try to now cast clouds. So I've been using sort of a starting from a standard unit architecture, and then uh, kind of adapting that to kind of fit better what we're trying to do with overcast. So um, I've been inputting essentially 20 minutes worth of data of cloud top height and geometric thickness, and then having a UNet predict the next five minutes. And the early results here, next, there we go. All right, so on the left is the, the predicted cloud top height, and on the bottom is the geometric thickness, and on the right is the is the actual truth data from, from the CloudRex data. So uh, it's kind of starting to pass the eye test a little bit. It's moving clouds. Uh, but it obviously doesn't uh, provide any um, capability in cloud formation or dissipation. So we're hoping ultimately that if we start to include optical flow inputs and then maybe perhaps do some feature engineering, uh, we can maybe start to have a now cast that can do a little bit of that cloud formation and decay. All right, so this is what I talked about. Ultimately, optical flow uh, and invection methods can do relatively well in areas where clouds aren't really changing, um, but they they both struggle with, especially with deep convection and, and areas of, of uh, divergence. But ultimately, I'm hoping that machine learning and maybe a little feature engineering and, and adapting to my uh, adapting my architecture can kind of lead to some useful now casting capabilities. So. That is all I have. So uh, some some acknowledgments. The Miri grant was uh, kind of helped to fund Octane in its infancy, and then the ONR obviously award for for my research uh, involving Overcast. So, and if you have any questions, please email Jason Apke because he is a much more better expert in optical flow than I am. So. Well, we still have some time to get questions if they have questions for Matt. Yeah. I know you and I were talking yeah. a lot uh, a couple weeks ago. And I was, I was, uh, um, you know, we, we noticed the same thing. We were trying to detect clouds using brightness temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, same kind of where they were sort of smearing up like that. Right. Um, and we thought about using winds at different heights. Maybe to, to that could, maybe have might have different models that might be where you have like a high cloud, middle cloud, low cloud. Oh, to divide up the clouds by the high, middle, and low. We haven't done that quite yet, but the, so it's a little bit of an issue with the cloud risk data because you you probably have maybe a bad assumption of like if you have a cloud top height and a geometric thickness and you're filling all the cloud, then you can maybe kind of fix that assumption with saying, oh well, the GFS says I have a high, low. Or medium layer, and then maybe there's a space in between. But uh, I think YJ No will, will maybe provide some context for that in terms of the overcast project. So yes, sir. All right. Uh, so uh, Jason, to your question about the smearing, uh, that is a product of the UNet architecture. Is that uh, for the precipitation stuff? There was a paper that compared a, a GAN versus a, just a regular UNet. And UNet is just going to smooth everything out. Uh, the, the suggestion that I would have is that there was a paper. I can never remember the last name, but he, the loss function, he weighted the loss function by the PDF, this precipitation, weighted the loss function by the PDF, and he got most of the way there, but he had to add an additional weighting. It's an exponential weighting. So you're really weighting those uh, limited cases. He found that he got most of the way there before doing the adversarial network, which are uh, pains to train. I can, right. I can vouch for that. Right. Uh, but I think... Um, Tweaking your loss function to really hammer home those uh, those edge cases is a is a good place to start. Right. Yeah, and that's definitely something that we're, we're looking into is custom loss functions. Um, and then one thing that I did with the unit actually when it, when I when I do the prediction, mm -hmm. it's it's one unit that's doing the five minute prediction, right? So it's having to take the prediction and cycle back in to make the next prediction. So what we did was we took the unit and stacked it on top of it itself mm -hmm. and then trained it to do the next 10 minutes. Right. So, so that way it kind of helped a little bit in terms of the accuracy of the nowcast. And, and 
I'm sure that there is some issues in the architecture because we actually try to do a, a depth wise 2D convolution to kind of keep the time component separate as it goes down the encoder stage. But uh, upon further like analysis of the architecture, I kind of realized, oh, I'm mixing the channels after my first my first step in the layer. So. Yeah, the um, the Reverie paper that I'm talking about, where they compared with their, you know, they tried out putting all time steps at mm -hmm. the same time, mm -hmm. and we still got the smearing effect. So I think it's 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 a, a, it's what's going to happen. I have another question. Yes. Like follow up with his question that what is the loss function function that you use that is oh, so so this one was just mean square error. Oh. Just mean square error, but we're I have started to kind of experiment with custom loss functions. So so uh, I'm trying to adapt, you know, have those those edge cases in there kind of considered in there. We also we also use new net and we apply the dice loss function in the compound loss function is kind of improve a little bit. Okay. So we, we try it. And I have another question that what is the metric you use to evaluate your result compared between the truth and your prediction? So that's something that I still need to do because I was trying to make sure that it passed the eye test first before I apply validation. But I wanted to essentially kind of do apples to apples comparison of, okay, I use these metrics for my infection scheme. Yes. Let's use the same metrics for the reconstructed clouds from the predicted Clavrex data from the, from the unit. So ultimately, I got to move, move in that direction, but not quite there. Yes. Thank you. Right. Yes. Sarvej, the mode, talk is hierarchical deep learning for efficient onboard satellite cloud detection and Go ahead. Um, thanks everyone for uh, attending and uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person. I got COVID over the weekend and so I'm trying to recover from that and uh, I'm giving this uh, presentation from my bedroom where I'm pulled up and trying to prevent uh, the spread. So my name is Surveish, and today I'll be presenting some of the work that we are doing at MyRadar to use deep learning to improve the utility of small sats for earth science applications. And uh, specifically, I'll discuss how, do you, how we use AI to overcome the bottlenecks to send alerts directly from space. The mission of MyRadar at a high level is to democratize environmental intelligence in a changing climate. And the main way we do this is by creating situational awareness products, especially nowcasts and alerts that we send to tens of millions of our users. And over the past few years, my radar has expanded the scope of our R&D efforts and are working on our Horus small satellite constellation. We launched our first prototype nanosat in 2019 and three more subsystem validation prototypes were launched in May of last year. The Horus Science Payload, um, which is planned to uh, be launched in the Pathfinder mission next year, includes an RGB camera, a narrow band near IR hyperspectral sensor, and a thermal single band sensor for, for uh, um, heat detection. The sensor suite is also coupled with a low power AI chipset for onboard computation in an efficient manner. And we are attempting to launch a 1U miniaturized platform, which will allow us to um, eventually launch a larger 100 plus satellite constellation with uh, a goal of sub hourly revisit times to improve our now casting capabilities. And this approach introduces size, weight and power constraints, as well as bandwidth and other um, factors that we have to consider before we can operationalize this approach. And overall, the higher revisit Smarter satellite approach is how we aim to reduce the latency for specifically the, deter the detection and alerting use cases, which is our situational awareness mission. On the method side, we're lucky that orbital sensor platforms provide rich data sets and the color image that you see animating in over the black and white image uh, to the right is over the Gulf of Bothnia, and it was actually taken by one of our prototype satellites launched last May. A challenge, though, is that data volumes can vastly outpace the onboard processing power, so data are usually downlinked before being processed. But for fast-changing environmental phenomena like wildfires or clouds in remote environments, uh, this approach can fail to meet the latency needs. And so alerting directly from orbit would help in making more timely decisions, and that is our mission with Horus. 
To alert from space, however, we must overcome several bottlenecks, including power and compute limitations to make sense of the data on board, as well as the bandwidth limitations for downlink. The instruments themselves that I described might take one to three watts to operate, but the X-band radio um, that we to need to downlink the um, raw data can take up to 10 or 11 watts. So we have to be careful with the duty cycling, and this is where AI techniques can help. So first, they can help with retrieving surface reflectance because it requires understanding how the atmosphere changes the solar light spectrum as it's reflected um, through the atmosphere uh, from from the sun through the atmosphere and back from the surface and measured in orbit. And the step is crucial to making sense of the radiance data collected by spectral sensors. And usually this atmospheric composition information, especially aerosol loading, is not available to the spacecraft's onboard computer. And so even if all this information could be determined, um, running the radiative transfer calculations on board to account for this information would be prohibitively intensive to compute. Also, downlinking large data sets, especially those generated from hyperspectral sensors like our narrowband near IR sensor, can be prohibitively time and power intensive for our alerting use case. This is um, <clears throat> sorry. So how do we, how 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 exactly do we use AI to overcome bottlenecks? So let's start with how we can use it to help with onboard reflectance retrievals. So for Horus, we are flying a snapshot mosaic narrowband hyperspectral imager, which means we are sensitive to a relatively narrow set of wavelengths, but five to 10 nanometer spectral resolution allows us to get more uh, detailed information from this wavelength range. Our snapshot mosaic approach, which is visualized on the right-hand side, uses repeating tile patterns of pixels that are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. So any given four by four pixel patch in the image corresponds to a 16 band spectrum. The image on the bottom um, was taken at our field site in central Oregon at the beginning of one of our UAV flight tests. You can see our calibration panels and I'm also in the picture for scale. Just before this, Im this image was taken, we closed the shutter to determine our dark levels. We then used the measurement from the white reflectance target to normalize the response for each spectral band for the flight's lighting conditions using what's referred to as the empirical line method. We also compare these results to what we'd expect from radio transfer calculations uh, using the ModTran or 6S libraries. Example of a high resolution Visnier radiant spectrum of a uniformly white target during mid-latitude summer with typ typical continental aerosol loading is shown on the top right for reference. So there are two big sources for uncertainty and variability that we must account for to constrain the spectral dependence of the absorption and scattering of reflected solar photons. The first is the vertical temperature, vapor, and ozone structure of the atmosphere. And the second is the aerosol loading, which significantly affects scattering and absorption. One way you can retrieve surface reflectances from satellite data is by simply downlinking the top of atmosphere radiances and post-processing results with the known atmospheric and aerosol properties on the ground. You can simply just run all the RT calculations for the possible combinations ahead of time and pre-generate lookup tables as well uh, to accomplish this step in a similar fa uh, fashion to what is done uh, with level two products from MODIS. However, for our use case, this step must be performed on board to generate alerts directly from orbit based on the spectral signatures we find, find in the reflectance data. While the vertical profile of temperature, humidity, and ozone can be fairly well constrained ahead of time, aerosol loadings, especially due to smoke plumes or cloud fields, can evolve on minutes time frames, making it much more difficult to predetermine which lookup to use for a given lat long coordinate at a given time uh, that might be experiencing alert-worthy conditions. And this is where we use deep learning to form a low power onboard classification of the aerosol loading based on the image data from the RGB context sensor. And we all, we can already know whether we're looking at a summer or winter hemisphere and other surface properties based on knowing the Latin lawn of, uh, and time of a given measurement. So we use a transfer learn deep learning network to specify specifically which aerosol profile to use uh, for an onboard AI assisted lookup. And this can be extended to a hierarchical lookup uh, with um, if more within class um, specificity is needed. And I'll talk about that in a minute. In addition, we can use AI for compression tasks. And sometimes we want to still downlink the full spectral data, which can be especially challenging if we're dealing with many bands. And so for this type of problem, we have seen some promising results using convolutional autoencoders for compression tasks. 
the use of AI still, this type of AI still requires training, but it's self-supervised since the model learns how to compress the data to the desired degree before attempting to reconstruct the input spectrum or image. In previous work, we've shown results from an adversarially trained 2D autoencoder for GOES data, but for the purposes of meeting onboard constraints, we focus on lighter weight 1D autoencoders to reconstruct um, larger dimensionality data sets. The third application for AI that we're using on board is AI for super resolution. We investigated multiple architectures to see which ones would be suitable for onboard compute, and we trained them. Uh, this is the work that Dave has done, so he can answer the specific questions about this portion. Uh, so using the mean absolute error and similarity information, um, we as loss of functions with a weighting scheme. And uh, for training purposes, we, we're, we don't have uh, our full sensor suite in orbit yet. So we're using Sentinel-2 data and subdomaining it and batch sizing it and um, training information uh, is provided here, but more details can be, can be discussed with, with Dave in person. So putting this all together, how do we use this approach for uh, alerting direct, directly from orbit? So we follow these broad steps. First, we determine the correct atmospheric profile to use ahead of time for a given lat long, lat latitude and longitude and time and uplink this information to the satellite along with several possible aerosol profiles for any given location and time. This can be sim as simple as using profiles from climatology or as sophisticated as incorporating new sounding information every 90 minute orbit. Um, so from the high resolution simulations, we apply the sensor specific transfer functions, which account for wavelength dependent quantum efficiencies for each sensor band. So we can tell the satellite it's looking at a mid-latitude summer scene over land or a subarctic summer scene or winter scene or a tropical scene. And we can specify some of the uncertainty there and whether it should treat the, the image as containing urban, desert, continental, maritime, or wildfire, aerosol, or cloudy um, cloud cover is, is something that we can specify with the context sensor on board. So armed with this information, we can operate in a low power scan mode with only the RGB context sensor and low power AI scene classifier running, which allows us to draw typically less than one watt of power, which is sustainable for our solar and battery power subsystem. If there is a scene of interest, which could be a wild and urban interface, Face seen for our wildfire use case or low level optically thick clouds for our calibration methodology, we switch into what we call active mode to collect, to collect the actual radiant spectra from the, from the full sensor suite. And we can transform this data on board into reflectance spectra using the AI assisted lookup. We then classify this reflectance spectrum using a spectral angle mapping or potentially an AI method to determine which uh, whether it constitutes a phenomenon worth sending uh, an alert for. And I'll get to exactly the, the methods we plan to use in, in a minute. And if it's something that we do want to alert about, then we can downlink a very lightweight fan, uh, lightweight bitmap or flag that alerts the ground that phenomenon X was potentially identified at location Y at time Z. So that's an overview of the overall um, duty cycling and alerting methodology. So switching to some first results now, the flat stat, uh, which is the, the version that we use for engineering testing uh, visualized to the right here is, is about a um, six inches by eight inches by um, five, five inches high. And um, we were able to achieve 30, second, 30 millisecond inference using four millijoules of energy for um, uh, the onboard AI processing. Uh, achieving 30 uh, giga ops with the AI core, drawing 13 milliwatts of maximum power for 63 milliseconds for the entire capture plus inference, uh, which uses a total, um, or the AI core uses about one millijoule. And so the total energy consumption for <clears throat> acquiring and processing one image is about seven millijoule. And so if we're gonna operate in low power mode at one Hertz for one hour, um, the total amount of energy the power subsystem needs to be able to, to capture and store and, and provide to the um, satellite is about 25 joules, which is uh, well within our um, power budget envelope. Three minutes. Three minutes. Oh, I should be quick. Okay, so um, quickly results from the context and compression AI. So I'm going to focus on the simpler net 
Um, we had to simplify the, the architecture a bit in order for it to fit on our low power um, chipset, but we were able to draw less than one milliwatt and do inference in 15 milliseconds for our context AI uh, for this really lightweight seven layer simple, simple net derivative. Um, and for the compression use case, we were able to achieve 18 to 1 decibel signal to noise, which is suitable for subpixel classification, and uh, between 100 and 150 milliseconds for acquisition, which is uh, similar to near time, near real time um, compression as the data acquired. Um, I'll sort of gloss over this, but basically the reconstructed power spectra are similar to the generated power spectra. So we're confident that we're not introducing significant artifacts and we're preserving spectral power distribution. Um, the results of the super resolution AI uh, table summarized here, uh, and unfortunately I don't have time to go get into very many of the details or the definitions, um, but for specific details on, on the performance of this, please, uh, Dave Ruglicki is available um, for ask, answering any questions over the coffee break or the lunch break. And for a quick visualization of how the results look, um, the AI technique with similarity uh, uh, information included performs well and is suitable for our high power um, processing. So this type of architecture, whether to use for super resolution or for segmentation for cloud masking, seems to be a promising one for what we would use when the uh, low power AI kicks on to the high power AI for this high hierarchical approach. And so discussions and conclusions. There are oops, many use cases where improving latency and time resolution is much more important than improving spatial resolution. And this includes wildfires and defense and, and uh, cloud detection for our calibration routine. AI techniques can enable low power and real-time onboard processing, which allows us to address bottlenecks for compute and downlink to allow generating alerts uh, from remote sensing data at the edge. Uh, we require, and we're in the, in the process of uh, performing further laboratory and field uh, um, results to determine the specifically the high power uh, requirements, for, the high power AI requirements for duty cycling. Um, future work uh, includes ref refining the AI performance, diversifying the training data collected. Our 2024 launch of our science pathfinders will uh, allow us to collect training data for wildfires and clouds. Um, specifically, wildfires are the are, are accomplishing our NOAA mandate for that mission, and clouds um, we use low latitude optically thick clouds for our calibration use case. And so we're going to explore um, the detecting detection capability of uh, these, these scenes, both wildfires and clouds with their alerting demonstrations. So it's gonna alert us when it has training data available. I'd like to acknowledge the audience and funding and collaborators and thank you for your attention and sorry for having to rush through the last bit. Thank you very much. For that. But it's all great. Um, glad you're able to do that. Thank you. Check COVID. Thanks for uh, doing that. Do you have any questions? One thing that really stood out to me was the need for aerosol characterization to the atmosphere. Um, what, were you using anything as ground truth, or you were just trying to determine what type of ground you were flying over? Yeah, so we aren't using yet um, aerosol optical depth ground truthing, but when we collect training data, we're gonna use satellite-based products uh, that are co-located to, to verify the aerosol retrievals that we are performing. But for right now, uh, we just need a broad brush stroke, like is it maritime type aerosol? Which aerosol model should we plug into the success scheme in order to do uh, a rough retrieval? And so that's the, the mission for the science pathfinders is to do the rough cut. And then for um, quantitative estimates, we want to train sort of a high power model that is more robust. Yes. Yeah, th thank you, Sarvish. Sorry you couldn't be here. Uh, but, uh, are, what are the applications that I'll get you're gonna get your startup to, to really get going. Is it fire and, and clouds? How how does the dynamic, the business dynamic will work? So yes, we, we have are on a two-year NOAA uh, grant right now for the wildfire mission. So detecting areas of interest in the wildfire wild and urban interface is part of our Pathfinder mission to collect training data for that. And then also because we are using low latitude um optically thick clouds as a spectral calibration target. Uh, we um, are interested in doing
between cloud masking and identifying which scenes of interest do um, suffer from uh, uh, cloud, um, sort of, you know, in, in some cases contamination, other cases, uh, that's the, the, the target of interest. So those are the two areas we're focused on based on our funding sources, uh, being NOAA and the Navy. Yeah. Does the satellite currently maintain the raw data uh, in addition to doing the processing on it? So if there was an alert, could you then, it seems to me that you're throwing away a lot of the data understood though the power requirements of sending it. So let's say there was an alert, would there be a possibility of then choosing to retrieve that data and pay the power price if necessary in its raw form? Indeed. So that is for the Pathfinder mission, actually what we're, we're demonstrating is that it can so the, the the full full sensor suite isn't going to be on all the time unless the low power AI tells it, hey, there's a wild and urban interface scene or a low latitude cloudy scene, turn on and collect all the data. And then it'll send an alert that it's collected uh, a scene of interest um, and that data is available. And once it passes over our ground station in Svalbard, um, that which will happen every orbit, we have the opportunity to downlink the full data. And so for the first Pathfinder mission, our intention is to downlink all the raw data that we um, identify and then use that raw data to train the models that we are going to use for the eventual constellation. So that's the, the in, initial mission is the, the training data collection, which requires the full raw data. Uh, thank you. All right, so uh, yes, perfect timing, one, one ten. See our next speakers here. Uh, it's an invited talk. It's gonna be uh, I'm really looking forward to this. It's gonna be very interesting. Uh, it's David John Gagne, NCAR, um, and his title of the talk is Combining Uncertainty Quantification and XAI to Understand the Sensitivities of Deep Learning Winter Precipitation Type Predictions. All right, thank you, Jason. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm a machine learning scientist uh, here at NCAR. I run the machine integration and learning for Earth Systems Group. Uh, we do a lot of work trying to bring machine learning to different Earth System Science problems. Uh, today, we're going to focus on, uh, I think, one of the big areas that's come up across all of our problems, which is how, how to, pre how to uh, predict uncertainty, how to understand it in the context of p-type. So the motivation for this, uh, like why I focus on p-type, um, it's because of the, the high impact of the transitions between liquid and frozen precipitation types. So a couple examples here, we have a, a Air Force tanker aircraft uh, covered in snow and having to be shoveled off. Uh, we also have a, a aircraft carrier at the Norfolk Naval Base that's, that's also covered in snow and ice and, and, and is, needs to be cleaned off. Um, and not only do we need to make sure our snow is removed from our, our equipment before we send it in, into battle, uh, there's also a lot of logistics that come into play. Like, like if, if there's a big ice storm that hits the, say, the Hampton Roads area where I grew up, uh, like, are, are the sailors and, and all the other uh, service, uh, service people able to get to the base to clear off the ship? I mean, this, this there's many major readiness questions, not only like wherever the the uh, the armed forces go in the world, but also at home, uh, can are we able to have readiness? Uh, and a lot of this come where this is challenging is when you have these transitions between different p types. So when is that rain going to shift to freezing rain or snow? Uh, how long is that going to last? All, all these questions. And, and while there there has been a lot of work done over the decades for p-type and both with a kind of more physics-based approaches and some like statistical machine learning based approaches there's still a lot of inherent uncertainties in the problem driven by the third by dynamics the nwp models themselves and our observations of p-type also have have a lot of biases of themselves um, by using machine learning plus uncertainty quantification as part of the machine learning optimization process we can uh, i think make a lot of learn both about what's causing the uncertainties as well as making uh like understanding when and what context is the uncertainty high. So uh, I mentioned my group is the Miles group uh, at NCAR. We have a core group of people in, in Sizzle and kind of the blue box. And then we have a broader uh, array of, of scientists and students and postdocs uh, and software engineers uh, spread across the organization, what we call Miles Plus. Uh, we're not all just AI experts. We also have a lot of people that come from areas like, uh, like atmospheric science, risk communication, uh, computer science, uh, et cetera. And we need this combined expertise to to like work across all the challenges on both the machine learning and the um, uh, earth system science problems. 
Um, as the Miles Group, we work across a lot of different labs at NCARTLs with outside organizations. So a few, we're going to talk a lot today about AI2ES, which uh, Fleet mentioned earlier. Uh, we also have connections with uh, other organizations like LEAP and M squared Lines and, uh, and Catalyst, which is a DOE project. Um, we've had a lot of NOAA funded projects. Currently, we don't have much in the way of DOD funding. So if you're, if this is really, this kind of work really excites you, come talk to me after. I'd be happy to talk about potential projects. Um, so with an AI2S, uh, Philippe already introduced it really well, but I wanted to kind of highlight a couple bits of work going on at NCAR. One of the work areas of work is on uncertainty quantification uh, and, and P-type, which we'll discuss today. Uh, our risk communication group led by Julie DeMuth has also done a lot of work with forecaster interviews, talking to uh, forecasters and other decision makers on things like convective weather and winter weather and our coastal products to understand what, what about these makes the products more trustworthy and, and, and how can we uh, evaluate as well as potentially improve the trustworthiness of our products to help uh, make them more successful in their deployments. So, so kind of one of the things we've gotten out of, out of that risk communication research is that uh, trustworthy AI is a perceptual thing. Uh, going into it, there's some ideas in the community that you just do these things and and people will trust it. Like you add explainability, you add physics, and suddenly it just uh, now people will trust it. and that's not necessarily the case because it depends not, uh, on who is the person you need to trust what is it a developer is it a user is it a manager uh, they all have different things they're looking for and what makes it trustworthy for them uh, and and so they have yeah you know, different factors that go in, in, into that that uh, and also different contexts so so like if they're using it in an operational context versus doing science research uh, you, you're looking for different things out of that system and so uh, Basically, the point of this is that it's, but this trustworthy AI is subjective uh, and context dependent, and so we're looking at ways to add more context uh, to help with these sub subjective interpretations of our of our models. And one of those ways is with, uh, if I can get the, it's going a little slow, uh, is with um, basically adding uncertainty and linking that with other physical variables. So when I'm talking about uncertainty, I'm going to focus on uh, predictive uncertainty and kind of like the statistical view of it compared with, say, like uh, predictability. Uh, um, but they are kind of related. So, so in kind of the statistical view of predictive uncertainty, we have two major sources of uncertainty. One is a late, we call aleatoric uncertainty, which is the uncertainty from variation in the data. This is a property of basically like if you look at a certain variable, uh, if we go across the like say, look at a single value on the x-axis, at certain values you have much higher uncertainty because there's an overlap between the red blob and the, and the black blob. Uh, but if you kind of go over here, there's little leg toric uncertainty because for all values of, of, of for x1, all, all the values are um, like, like you get the same class. Uh, so you can estimate this with a single probabilistic AI model uh, and, and, and no matter what kind of form you're using. Uh, the other form of uncertainty is epistemic uncertainty, and, th and this is derived from that there may be many potential models that would explain your data equally well, uh, and, and so so you may be able to get you may have like multiple plausible models and, and a lot of space between the models. If, if if you have multiple models and they all kind of give you the same result, you have low epistemic uncertainty. You have a bunch of different models and they all give you different results, and then you have high epistemic uncertainty. Usually, uh, with epistemic uncertainty. If you collect more data in the space where there's where, where there's high epistemic uncertainty, you can reduce that, that uncertainty is reducible. With aleatoric uncertainty, you can't reduce it by collecting more data examples, but you can reduce it by adding more information. So if you bring in another variable like x2, maybe you can reduce it by finding finding some kind of pathway that separates the classes better. Uh, when you combine these together, uh, you, you you then can estimate the total uncertainty. Uh, to get epistemic uncertainty, usually you can estimate this from an ensemble of deterministic models, uh, but that doesn't give you the aleatoric uncertainty. So to have both, one way to do it is you have an ensemble of probabilistic models. The problem is that ensemble part. You need a whole bunch of models, and they may be fairly complex models to get a good estimate, uh, and, and thus uh, it's computationally expensive and, and may use a lot of power on your satellite or, or run into all kinds of other, uh, other problems. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is an approach to you only use a single model, but get at estimating both of these 
these terms. Um, one way you can do this is a thing called a Bayesian neural network, but those are really hard to train. So we're going to do something halfway in between where we use a fixed neural network, but then estimate a higher order distribution that can allow us to capture both the aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. So to do this, uh, we're going to utilize something called the Dirichlet distribution. Uh, the, this is a higher order distribution that has this lovely property that it is the what's called the conjugate prior of the categorical distribution, which for a classification problem, categorical is basically just, it's the probability of snow versus freezing rain versus sleet. Uh, so you can just think of it's the probability of, different, of cats versus dogs or, or whatever. Uh, so, so what Dershowitz allows you to do is instead of predicting probabilities, you predict these alphas, um, which basically are, are kind of like, how much evidence do you have for a given class? Uh, so higher alpha means more evidence. Um, and it's kind of just just a like big positive number. Uh, and so you can actually represent it as like kind of a count. Uh, if you like, let's say you, you roll the dice once and you get a six and, you, uh, and then roll it and you get a four and then you just keep adding those up and, and that will give you your distribution. Um, and so with the, what the Dirichlet distribution allows you to do is it gives you a, a sampling of pos a model of all the possible categorical distributions you can have. So that allows you to say, in this case, where the is this big blue blob, that means just about any combination of probabilities is 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 highly is highly likely, and thus you have high epistemic uncertainty. Whereas with this, you have lower epistemic uncertainty but high aleatoric uncertainty because basically less concentration of all the probabilities are kind of in the middle. Uh, but then in in this instance, we have uh, uh, down at the bottom here. Uh, we have much more confidence, uh, like basically the distribution is concentrated on one end, so we have both low epistemic and low aleatoric uncertainty. Uh, so, so that's a this gives us a lot of power if we can if we can output this kind these distribution parameters instead of just probabilities, we can then get at both of these terms. Um, but can we take this a step further? Um, what what are like pro, like the problem of probabilities uh, uh, in some ways is that they have to go up to one, and sometimes not, none of the classes you're trying to predict are the appropriate class for, for a given problem. Maybe there's some new kind of precipitation that's falling, hopefully not. But but it, <laughs> it, there also may be a case where, where just the, the atmosphere conditions are such that you don't really know what's going on. It, it, it's very ambiguous. Uh, so you want to have some way to say, I don't know. And there there's a whole chain of uh, math called uh, dempster Schaefer theory of evidence and subjective logic that allows you to, to actually figure this out. And kind of the key part of this is, what if the probabilities didn't sum to one? What if you let them sum up to a value less than one and then let the, the rest of the, the, basically the difference between that and one be your I don't know probability. Uh, and so we can formulate this with, with our, the evidence we are predicting that, that E termed, we basically divide, we normalize it by dividing by the sum of all the E's or some of all the E's plus one. And that gives us our, we call it belief mass. So we're calling it a belief instead of a probability because it doesn't sum to one. But then the the, the difference is our, uh, uh, essentially is a form of our epistemic uncertainty. And and that that turns out to be pretty powerful and we'll, we'll see later how it can be used. Uh, so it's kind of a more practical example. So for our P-type problem, we have a sounding. So we have temperature and dew point from zero to 5,000 meters above the ground. Uh, we have a hodograph, so we have our U and V winds over the same area. Uh, we plug those into our evidential neural network. Um, if you just have a like traditional model, you, you might get either like, say, for a given sleet, uh, you may get yes sleet or no sleet, or you can get a probability, so you get like one of these bars, so a single number uh, that, that, that you can then put on a map or do whatever with. But that, that number, even though it's a probability, doesn't capture the full uncertainty. So we can also then use an ensemble. So this blue area is our ensemble of different probabilities. So we can see, is there a lot of certainty or not in that probability? Uh, but the ensemble, because if you have a small ensemble, it's not, it doesn't capture the full spread. It's under dispersive. Um, uh, it's computationally intensive to, to run. We can instead uh, assume a parametric distribution of the Dirichlet, and that gives us this nice smooth curve that has mass in the tails. Uh, and and can can vary and, and thus give us more information. And then we can take this a step further with the belief mass. And for this problem, we can then take our evidence and say that, oh, it's actually only like a 60% chance of sleep instead of an 80% chance. And that there's actually a 20% chance that we don't actually know what the what the appropriate class is. Uh, so so that can give us some additional uh, uncertainty estimate. Yes. So this is really driven by height and uh, 
we'll say temperature. Are you, are you doing any time on this? Currently, no, but you could if you uh, if, if, like the the basically everything we're doing on the uncertainty side is all on the output layer. So you could do this on any kind of neural network. It could be it could be a recurrent or a convolutional one in time. Get more spatial information. All that's um, yeah. For this, we're just using the sounding because soundings are easy to work with and pretty universal um, for uh, easier to interpret. But yeah, we could add time. Uh, is certainly an influence on the problem. Uh, if you want, if, if like performance is what you're after, there's always ways to add more variables. So, so then, how do you get the neural network to actually train to to predict this uncertainty properly? So we to do this, we combine a uh, maximum likelihood estimation law. So it's a pretty nasty looking equation, but essentially it comes down to mean squared error plus variance. Uh, so in some ways, it, it, it gets a lot nicer. So this this by itself is not sufficient to get get the epistemic uncertainty. This will just get you fitting to the the data distribution. So we have this regularizer term, this uh, KL divergence. Um, so what we're what it tries to do is uh, we're, our prior assumption with this model is that is what we call the no evidence prior is that any class is equally likely. Uh, and, and and so we want the model when it's basically when the model is wrong, we want it to predict the no evidence prior. Uh, so we we have, we have a regularizer that, that does that for us. Um, of course, comes with this lambda up here. The lambda is uh, kind kind of uh, a, a lot goes on with that. You can tune it to your data, so it's not free, completely free lunch. It is, there is some sensitivity, so you do need a calibration data set, and you can't just do it just from your training data. Uh, so so it's you can't assume like. I, I used this lambda for a different problem before. I use that again, but your your calibration data says in a different problem. Um, we found it's not super sensitive for classification; it's more sensitive for regression, though. So something something to watch out for. This. Um, so then, what what can what else can you do with this once you have a, a prediction of uh, of the uncertainty in the evidence? Well, you can actually derive your LA torque and epistemic as numbers uh, from from the uh, Dirichlet distribution. So I have this little animation showing a as you vary your parameters, how, how that distribution varies, you see you kind of you have low evidence, basically your probability is equally likely across all the range, but then it, as you increase the evidence for one class, it goes up. Um, and, and we can also look at the relationships between the different kinds of uncertainty. Generally, LA torque is higher than epistemic. Uh, epistemic is only really high when you have basically no evidence, which I think makes sense. So, um, so getting into the to, to peak type, and, uh, so, some more details about, about our particular implementation. We're using the NOAA rapid refresh analysis. We basically grabbed all of the analyses for the past like 10 years from the from 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 NCEI. Uh, and then for our target, we're using MPing, uh, which is a app developed by NSSL for collecting uh, precip type and hail and other severe weather report data from people from their phones. So basically, you just download the app, uh, say, look out your window, and oh, is it? Snowing, I'll put, press the snow button, and then we get they get a report. Uh, so we, we, we've gotten all those reports. Um, one of the things we found with them, though, is uh, there. Uh, if you look at the raw reports, so this is the, these are the temperature surface temperature distributions for rain, snow, uh, sleet, and uh, ice, sleet and freezing rain. And you'll notice uh, that there's a non-zero amount of reports when the temperature is uh, this is Celsius. So. <laughs> You can see there, there's a there's a quite a few people who are report. It's not not a ton of people, but it's enough to skew the probabilities of basically people reporting snow or freezing rain when there. Is, I went back and looked at a few of these events, and there was no clouds in the sky even. So uh, there we have to deal with adversarial uh, data basically in this problem. So one way we we, we dealt with this is uh, take the wet bulb temperature. So we use our physics knowledge. So wet bulb temperature, and then if it's above three Celsius, we just say throw it out. And if it's if it's rain and below negative three Celsius, throw that out too. This doesn't get rid of all the bad reports, but this gets rid of the really egregiously bad ones. Uh, and, and we found that that made a big difference in our model because uh, like when we first showed it to people and we were like getting, we had like this interactive sounding thing, and we're like it still had like ten percent chance of snow when there was it was thirty C out outside. It's like that that can't be right. Yeah, about forty degrees. Yeah, well, well that's why we use wet bulb because uh, wet bulb accounts for uh, the the um, yeah yeah it's common here in Colorado. 
uh, basically you can get snow when, it's, when the surface temperature is, is, is above freezing if, if it's really dry near the surface. So wet bulb kind of accounts for the, the evaporation and thus uh, you, 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 you account for that snow at 40 degrees uh, when it's like 20, uh, 20 Fahrenheit dew point. So, so yeah, having our, our meteorological knowledge has been very helpful in this problem. Uh, so kind of summarizing like like the model set up, we basically we use a fully connected neural network on this, nothing nothing particularly fancy, uh, but then our evidential layer to predict their different types. Uh, we can also do this for a regression models. So we're not going to I'm not going to talk about the implementation for this today, uh, but but we're but you can also if you're predicting something that has a Gaussian distribution, you can use a prior distribution called the normal inverse gamma to predict the uncertainty on that Gaussian. Uh, and we found that works pretty well, but it's a little bit harder to to, to tune properly. So we're that's, that's something we're still working on. Uh, for both of these, we're we're working on a paper that's going to be coming out in the we're, we're submitting in the next few weeks, uh, and as well as a software package I'll talk more about later. Um, so how how well did our model do? So uh, on the upper part of our our panel, we have we have some contingency tables. Uh, ideally, you want to have as blue dark blue as possible on the one to one on the diagonal for for each of these. Um, so on the top is the wrap, how well the wrap p type performs. Uh, we see it ha has some serious biases for sleet and freezing rain. So so this is like the unnormalized, and then we normalize across the uh, uh, x and y axes basically to to kind of get our, our approximate. I, I can't keep it straight which one is POD and which one ends up being FAR, but. Um, but basically, you, you kind of effectively get that on a per class basis. Uh, so if you look at basically these diagonal numbers versus these, generally we have much better performance for uh, uh, for, for the evidential model compared with uh, the the wrap. So, so especially for things like snow and sleet and freezing rain, uh, we're, we're 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 making big jumps in in, in all those in, in all those areas. So so that, that's something we 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 are. Glad to see that our model is actually helping on, on this problem. Um, yeah, we can look further at our probabilistic verification with uh, this is the attributes or reliability diagram. I don't know why this. Uh, anyway, um, uh, we we found uh, see on the I'm trying to remember what the difference is between the two lines here. Okay. Uh, one is our deterministic model on the the upper row. We have like a it's a regular neural network, and this is the evidential model. So, so one of the differences is for especially for like freezing rain, you'll notice the reds show like how many how many examples there are. The the, the regular model is a bit overconfident, high probabilities, uh, whereas the the uh, evidential model it basically moves more of its probabilities closer to the center. Uh, so it's so it's uh, 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 being affected by the epistemic uncertainty and thus improving. Uh, we're also able to look at something called uh, drop fraction. Uh, the idea of this is. Uh, there's like a ghost in the machine. Uh, uh, basically, we're, we can rank our, our our data by different kinds of uncertainty, and we can see. Ideally, you should see that uh, kind of some somewhat of a linear monotonic relationship between as you increase your uncertainty and remove more data. Your uh, I, I guess as you like I think over here we have all the data and the. Basically, we're removing the most uncertain cases, and as you remove the most, the more uncertain cases, your 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 brighter scale score should go up. Uh, and we're generally seeing that, especially with epistemic uncertainty and the entropy DSTE, which is also another way to derive epistemic uncertainty. Uh, we can also look at this on the map. Uh, so, the, so I think one of the key takeaways here is. If you look at the map in the upper left-hand corner, this just shows the deterministic p types. We just we run the model everywhere, uh, even if there's no precipitation, just to see what what happens. Uh, we see that the highest uncertainties tend to be where you transition from one uh, p type to another. Uh, and one thing we found particularly useful with this is that the epistemic uncertainty, both in terms of our our u term and our total epistemic uncertainty derived from um, Basically, the 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 epistemic var uh, variance uh, they have the highest values when you transition from rain to to freezing rain. Uh, you still have a transition when you go from like freezing rain to sleet and sleet to snow, but but the fact that it's highest from rain to freezing rain can help maybe tell the forecasters maybe focus on this transition area rather than the where the where the sleet snow line is. Um, 
And we can also look at other meteorological features like where the temperature lines and fronts and things like that. Um, to do further investigation, uh, another thing we've done is composite soundings bend by the uncertainty. Uh, in this case, we can compare a deterministic model, which does which have some discrimination based on uncertainty with the evidential model, which shows a much cleaner um, spectrum. As, basically, as you increase the uncertainty, uh, you, you get closer to the freezing line, which kind of which makes sense. Uh, we can also look kind of look at the distributions of the uncertainty for, say, sleet and, and see what what, um, what kind of variants are we seeing there. And one thing we found from this analysis, so this, this was done by a, a grad student intern, Don McImpara, uh, we, we, we grouped our, our, our sleet soundings by how many times they crossed the zero degree Celsius line. If you remember your P-type schooling, and if you're coming from a meteorology program, usually sleet needs two crossings to zero. You, you have this warm nose, and then it has to go above freezing to melt the water, ice or to melt the snow into uh, rain, and then uh, refreeze again before it hits the surface. Um, a lot of our soundings do that, but there's a lot that don't. There's a lot that only that have basically something that looks like this, which is uh, should be like melting snow kind of profile, and this should be snow or maybe slightly melty snow. And part of what may be going on here is is the ground truth label issue. Uh, some people are apparently sleet in some cases is defined as ice pellets, but in other cases, uh, it's defined as melting snow. Uh, so, so this is something we didn't realize going into the project, but but something that shows up in the data. Uh, so so there's a question of like what what should you do with this? Uh, like from a meteorological perspective, do, like do we need to, how should we filter the data? Should we be filtering it to only accept these kinds of sleet soundings, or or sh should we accept these as valid but have some other way to maybe have a subclass? Uh, but but like by digging into the uncertainty, we're able to kind of figure some of these things out that wouldn't have been obvious otherwise. An another tool we've used to, to kind of dig into what makes our models tick is uh, explainable AI. Uh, so the idea behind explainable AI is that we want to ask some questions about if we do some kind of perturbation to our model or or, or kind of dig into it further, what what about the inputs is, is causing is affecting the prediction. So we're going to look at three different methods here. Uh, and this is work by uh, Belen Savadra, who, who was an uh, uh, undergraduate intern with us this past summer. Uh, so she looked at gradient times input, uh, Shapley additive explanations, or SHAP, and permutation feature importance. Each of them asks a slightly different question, even though they all return a similar kind of value. So gradient times input is what features are most influential in predicting the model's output. SHAP basically decomposes a prediction into how much did the, how much of the prediction came from a certain uh, input feature. And there is permutation feature importance is asking about how does the performance of the model change rather than how, how what contributes to the prediction. So they're all related but different questions and thus maybe we'll get different importances depending on what method we use. So if we use gradient times input, we find that temperature near the surface and dew point near the surface tend to be pretty important. Uh, as well as the second most important temperature is temp the 2,500 meter temperature. So this would be like the warm nose. Uh, I also found the wind actually had some importance, uh, but less so than the other ones. Um, we can then plot plot these on the map. So we run our model everywhere and, and do our XAI. And we can see that uh, what lit up was kind of the, the freezing line behind the front uh, for, for all these variables. And we can also calculate this uh, depending on which, which p-type we're interested in. Um, we can also do further diagnostics. So this is derived as the most important height of, of, of the temperature. Uh, for what's interesting about this plot is for snow, we see that uh, as you get near kind of just past the front and near the freezing line, the height goes up and then it goes back down again as you get, get past the freezing line. So snow, generally you wanna care about the temperature near the surface, except when you're near freezing and then you care about higher up. For what's interesting with sleet and freezing rain is that they generally, for most of, even when you're well behind the, the line, you still care about the higher level values. Uh, we also notice there's a strong, like the Rocky Mountains kind of stick out, the, the whole Western US kinds of stick out as a higher uh, level. Um, I'm not sure why that's going on, but but it's something interesting to explore further. So so this, like, uh, that's where I think XAI can be powerful. It can point to like, what makes your model work well and where's the physics align and where doesn't it align and maybe you need to do some further investigation. Uh, with SHAP, we, we kind of see a similar sort of pattern, um, although more focused on near surface temperatures rather than the higher level temperatures. Um, uh, with, with permutation feature importance, we also see a, 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 like this, this ranking is more uniform where temperature zero, dew point zero, 
than 250, 500, 700. Uh, so we're getting kind of different rankings uh, depending on the method. So they each kind of have a different view of things. And we can summarize that here with this giant chart um, where there's some agreement with the top features, but then once you get into the not so top features, there's a lot more variance in what's, what's important. Um, so what we're working on with this now is transferring this to real time. So we've trained on the wrap, we're running it, we've run it on the HER and the GFS. Um, we're working with the risk communication team to develop, to figure out the right uh, real time interface to perform, uh, to like show this to forecasters and get feedback from them. Um, and we've also had an intern at Vaisala who worked with us to test, test this in the road weather model. So far, the, the initial results were like, it didn't do worse than the their existing P-type prediction, but, but we'd like to do tweaks to make it better. Some limitations of this approach, um, you do need a calibration data set with any of these like uncertainty methods. You really kind of want something outside of just your training data to calibrate it properly. Um, it doesn't account for uncertainty in the inputs, so ensembles are still very useful there. Uh, uncertainty estimates will be under dispersive if the model is being used outside its training context. So if you want to, so it's trained as like perfect prognosis, but if you want to apply it like forecast hour 48, it's probably going to be under dispersive uh, in, in, in its estimates. So we, we, we're trying to think of ways to, to, to fix that without having to like do a complete MOS approach. Um, and there, and the no evidence prior may not be the most appropriate prior, for, especially for rare events where one class is much more likely than the other. So, so we're thinking of ways to adjust the training process to, to account for these things. Uh, my group, we, we're also releasing a package. So you, if you want to run this yourself, we have a new package out called Miles Guess. We're working on putting, it'll be on PyPy soon. Uh, but it not only does it have evidential neural networks, but we also do ensembles and Monte Carlo dropout and building some of these diagnostics so, so you can use those. Uh, we also have some hyperparameter optimization packages and object tracking and scaling of your data. And if you want to run your machine learning model in Fortran, we can do that too. So to wrap up, uh, we have uh, evidential deep learning, I think, is a powerful way to capture both aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. And we can dig into the physical reasons behind that uncertainty with things like uh, composite soundings and other uncertainty metrics, as well as XAI. So with that, happy to take questions. Got plenty of time for questions. Got one. Uh, how do you deal with conditional or second order interactions when you're quantifying feature importance? So, for instance, if feature X is the most important, but only when feature Y is greater than 0.8. Um, so, th there are a few ways to deal with that. One is, is uh, you you can group similar features together. So, they're like SHAP is a little bit is the, probably the most robust at doing this. And there's a few recent methods like partition SHAP that like will explicitly like group things in space, but also you can group by variable. Uh, and that can allow you to account for that. Uh, some of it is how you set up the problem. So if you think that if what you're after is interpretability, then maybe don't use the entire kitchen sink of features, pick the things you care about and and and, and do accordingly. You can also like, like for permutation feature importance, you can like, like sum up the, the contributions from one feature, or you can also perturb, permute multiple features at the same time. Uh, so there's a number of ways to do it. They all have their costs and computational burdens that come with them. So so it's it, it's still a non a big challenge in that space, but there are ways to reduce the the effect. The change the amount of quantification if like is it by use case? So if, if feature Y is only greater than 0.8 half the time, but that makes feature X the most important, does feature X's normal quantification become cut in half? It can be in some cases. Um, it, it really depends on how you're interpreting it. And, and, and like, I wouldn't just use the absolute value. It's, I think, good to use this in context. One thing I've been like doing more recently is also doing like regime based in, importance. So, so you like group by some, like, let's say daytime versus nighttime or, or in, in, like mountains versus plains or like, like uh, use it, don't use it as like an absolute, this is important, this is not kind of thing. Use it, look at it in the context of your other variables and and bring in like showing it on a map with your with your meteorology knowledge, uh, I think is a lot more useful than than just trying to come up with a, a importance ranking. Uh, Greg. So it's rather somewhat disappointing. You didn't include the hydrometeors directly as a forecast item in the product. So rain and snow are predicted so correctly already in most cases, mm -hmm. in the neighborhood of 90% hit rates, 
correct in the those extremes, but of course it's the middle ground. It's the hard yeah. stuff. But what about why not just strictly use METARs instead of PING and MPING? Because you do have another source of surface data. And then last part of the question is sorry, uh, you didn't you didn't investigate freezing drizzle, which is a definitely different thing than freezing rain or sleet. That's actually a really tough one. Yeah, so I guess to unpack a few of those questions. Um, <laughs> first part, rain, rain versus snow. I mean, that's one of the things we did find with our comparison. With so we ran the the Vaisla comparison in Fort Collins, where it's mainly rain and snow. Uh, uh, and in fact, the model, the we didn't really see much of an improvement using the ML versus uh, regular P type. So, so we're the uh, next step of that is running over the Northeast, where there's a lot more vari variations, and, and you have more sleet and freezing rain events. Um, and that's, I mean, that's where like the worst performance was too, is in sleet, like, like kind of sleet and freezing rain. Um, uh, we have tested METAR. Uh, the one issue with the one big issue with METAR is that the, at automated sites, you do not, uh, they don't have sensors that can detect sleet. Uh, so if you want a sleet report, you, you're limited basically to the sites where you have a, a human observer. Um, you can also use Coca Raws. Uh, there's actually a, 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 another data set that, that I think is a, a little bit so crowdsourced, but maybe a bit more robust. Uh, we're definitely interested in trying other other data sets for just for the. We've been focusing on MPing because we have, just have a lot of MPing reports, and we are able to get the get it for free because we're in, in the AI Institute with OU. So. Um, but um, yeah, there's definitely other data sources. There's a couple of papers that have come out recently that also talked about some of these biases. So one is by Brian Filipiak uh, at, at U Albany. Um, he, he also did a he did a random forest based one, but looked but kind of dug more into like using Coca Raws and some of these other data sources for it. Um, so there's definitely a lot of interesting research out there, not uh, not just ours. Uh, and then on freezing drizzle. I don't think we have that as a separate category in MPing. And one of the things that I think I think is going on too is that a lot of people are mistaking rain for freezing rain or vice versa. So that's <laughs> almost never at a warm up it's freezing. Yeah. yeah. So so that's that'd be something to look into further and yeah. see see if we can sort out the freezing drizzle from the freezing rain cases. And uh that, 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 that I think that'd be interesting. Uh, the METARs do a poor job with freezing drizzle also. They do too, yes. So that's not going to be there. Yeah, Scott Landolf here to ask. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You do have a question on what? I think somebody called me. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, the, the, yeah. Yes. Yes, the, Scott, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, I had two questions. Um, uh, uh, there's a please use mouse when pointing. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> oh it, it, it's fine. I was oh, able to follow. Okay. Up yeah. uh, <laughs> no, but but I do have. But I do have fully mass mm -hmm. approach. How would that differ from using odds, which also get out get you out of the zero to one and can account for? If we have no idea. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I had. I don't, have, I don't have a good answer for that right now. I, I, I don't know enough of the, the, I guess, the odds approach in that context that to, to, to we should talk afterward. Um, yeah, I think he had a paper on it. Okay. Probably 15 years ago now or something where he proposed odds versus instead of probability for any uncertainty forecasting. I can try to dig up that line. Yeah. Yeah, we'd be happy to be happy to read that. Like, I'm sure we could formulate this, yeah, in an odds approach versus a, uh, you're saying like 20 to one versus, or, or something like that. And, and they don't have to, unlike the prob with probabilities, your odds for your different categories don't have to sum to one. And that's a measure of the overall uncer your uncertainty and even your uncertainty guesses. Well, true. Uh, yeah, that's off. But it, but it might end up in the same place. Yeah, there, there's, I would suspect there's probably some similar kinds of math would probably converge eventually. Uh, Scott does have, he says he does have a couple. Can you, can we hear you? Can you speak? Can you ask the questions? Yes, yeah. here's uh, a okay. I'm just question type one on is that the yeah. ground tour is at a point location, but the sounding are no necessary representative of the atmosphere above the location. How do you deal with this? So, 
in some ways that's where we're having a model that accounts for the epistemic uncertainty can be useful is because it can like account for the non-representativeness error of like the say the model terrain is a little bit off or you know like this is a point uh, area average instead of a point um I can this allow us to quantify that it doesn't really back us out to like getting point to point uh, we i think we'd have to do some further like using different data sets and uh, and thinking about the problem a bit further if you wanted to to like say training on her instead of rap or or using observed soundings um i think there's definitely ways you could uh basically train models on different data sets and then kind of cross apply them is something i've seen as a way to to kind of understand how those uncertainties interact with each other uh, and, and that can be quite um quite valuable from from like the science understanding perspective to to do that and kind of formulate your problems in different ways and not just like grab all the data you can um and then to the you second question that he mentioned he said that you you read do you see the, the yeah yeah i see them um so his question is you mentioned that bayesian neural networks are hard to train what makes it so difficult for this task uh so for uh the reason why they're hard to train is so like what a Bayesian neural network is is like in a regular neural network you have a single number for every weight in the model. In a Bayesian neural network, you you replace that single weight with a with a like a Gaussian distribution. So you have two parameters, uh, and then you can basically have to optimize both of those parameters. So part of the problem is for the same size of network, you have double the weights you have to learn. Uh, the Gaussian assumption may not be the most appropriate prior for for your weights. Um, they're sometimes you just sometimes they, they, they are there's harder to converge and they in terms of their deterministic performance there's from what i've seen in a lot of cases it tends to be worse than the basically a, a, a deterministic neural network because it's just it has many more ways to fit so so that's why people end up using like ensembles or or, or this evidential approach is sort of a compromise and i say it's the right approach for everything but but i think it has some promising properties for for a lot of meteorology meteorology use cases uh, any other questions? Uh, I got plenty, but I mean, I didn't want to yeah. waste time. Um, so one of the biggest ones that I thought was interesting in your presentation that you didn't really address directly, but took up a lot of your slides was the data curation. Mm -hmm. you, there was a lot of time spent um, rechecking things, making sure, like you said, there was adversarial data, um, you know, format things in a way that made sense for how you want to put in your model. Um, I'm wondering, I think those are really important aspects. I think they might be underplayed in a lot of machine learning. I'm curious what you might be able to do, you or other groups are doing to try to automate some of that. Because a lot of that seemed like it was hand curated. It took a lot of, it took a lot of expert time. Um, to what extent can we uh, set things up to kind of take care of that in the back end? Uh, that's a really good question. I I say like um, for most machine learning tasks, not just in for this particular problem, I mean, like basically there's been surveys of machine learning researchers and like 70% of the time is they is generally spent on data curation because you have to understand your data to, to have a good problem. Uh, there's a, there's also a paper that's uh, called everyone wants to do the model, model work, not the data work about uh, data, data cascades and AI really good paper. Um, rec recommend y'all uh, people check that out. Uh, be, like the reason I, yeah. And I've kind of made the same mistake here. I, I like, hinted at, but did not talk about all the challenges on the data curation side. Uh, but but it's it, understanding your data can give you basically doing good pre-processing quality control and understanding how the how the data is formatted uh, can give you much more performance increases than some of changing your architecture. So we, we actually used a fairly simple architecture except for the evidential part in this model. And uh, the biggest changes we saw were like fixing that Q, the QC issues we found uh, or like doing things like interpolating from pressure coordinates to height above ground level coordinates. That, that also allows us to apply it more generally without needing like like the model actually performs surprisingly well with pressure coordinates, but but you get weirdness when you're in mountains and other high terrain areas. Um, but uh, the question of how do you automate this? Uh, yeah. It's akin to what we do with DA, right? There's a yeah. lot of QC and things that need to happen with DA. And I think part of where you're going is that, you know, if we want to automate a lot of these things in near real time ops, we want to do all these algorithms, 
all the lessons that you learn as you go kind of have to be encoded as you go. And so, I, you know, I'd just be curious to synthesize some of those uh, lessons into kind of broader architectures and helping our AI ML. So, you know, doing this, yeah. curating the data, I mean, I've worked in the business world with ML. We had to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is anything new. Yeah, we, we, you know, you start off data engineering, getting, planning out the correct place to get the data, okay? Uh, transforming the data into the correct way for the model, do the feature engineering for the inputs, okay? And you automate that, not you just, you just don't, you know, do it one time because the products we're running are running all the time, okay? Yeah. And me be taking that data from uh, sources and having to, again, curate the data to the model uh, real time. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, that's something we have to do on the research side as well. And we're, we've been working on trying to deploy these things toward real time systems and dealing with outages and, you know, those, and all those issues. So, so yeah, we like, like for the, 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 the say wet bulb temperature uh, correction, that's something we, we, we figure out a script for it. Now we can just do that with any new MPing or wrap data that comes in. Uh, some of the things like we, we've been trying to build more libraries to to yeah, automate some of these portions. That's why like a lot of work has been on. We have a like our so so going kind of going back to like bridge scaler. This library is just to make our uh, pre or like scaling of the data more portable because that's that's an issue in, in the models and coming up with other ways to pre to do different to like scale the inputs. That that is more respective of the physics of the data. Um, or in terms of some of the other automation for for I, one thing you can do is sort of iterate on your machine learning, or you train an initial model that that may have issues, but then look at like one thing we I'm interested in looking at but haven't dug into too deeply yet is basically like you can use the machine learning prediction as a first guess of like like. Like because you, if you have a probability distribution, you can actually then, like if you get say five reports in a thirteen kilometer box, you can then use that the multinomial distribution to say what's the probability, uh, like given if you know your predicted probabilities, what's the probability that you'll get this exact set of five like three snow reports and two like freezing rain reports, and if that probability if what you actually got uh, the probability that's way different from your predicted probabilities, either your model is wrong or your data or your or there's a a, a quality control issue, so. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Take them out, you know, in an automated way. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I definitely think there is a lot of work done in the, yeah, probably more in the private sector. Uh, with with those kinds of automated QC and checking your, when your model is starting to go out of sample, than necessarily in the re, on the research side, but um, yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of use cases for that, and, and it's kind of more more to dig in. I also point out uh, Kyle Shaw is in the audience. If you want to wave, he he has he actually has a paper on some automated deep learning quality control that looks at consistency between like a radar image and uh, uh, the rain gauges. Uh, in, in, in a mountainous area. So so we're able to like, kind of learn, like the model's able to learn, sort of to do a consistency check. Uh, so I think, yeah, so there, there, I guess there, there's definitely some stuff going on in that area and we could do a lot more because yeah, we, we see these issues all the time. There's, a, in our group, there's also uh, some work being done on camera images, uh, I guess in AI, the AI Institute more broadly. Uh, and one of the things we worked with on our risk comm team was, um, coming up with a, so we have to hand label these camera images first before we can classify them. Uh, but to make the hand labeling process go faster, one thing we do is the, uh, uh, basically the, the the risk communication team came up with a code book. So basically their way and, and a measure of intercoder reliability. So in their case, that means you have a rubric for classifying one image versus another. And then you have basically a way to test, like have, have two people label the same images and then do do their how how closely do the labels match and if it doesn't match well we need to retrain them or or get other people in or fix the code book and and so so having more consistency in that process is all, like we found that to be very valuable and that's also something we could save out and and we like get that paper's coming out uh, or being submitted very soon. Captcha for that from Google. That's exactly yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, they do it on a massive scale. Yeah, a little more data, but. Mm -hmm. DJ, I have a question related to the uncertainty. So like with Sharp, we can understand what feature important. Mm -hmm. Can we have a fair way that we can figure out what is the uncertainty came from? Like it is came yes. from the model, it is came from the data, it come, came from the location, it come from the season. Can, can we have you know, a way to identify that? Or it's just like a, a mass potato? <laughs> um, in some cases, so like one of the benefits of directly predicting uncertainty is you can actually use XAI on the as, with the uncertainty as a target. So we've played around with that, and and it can tell us like like which variable, which at least which input variables did the uncertainty come from. And if you did it by regime or or like applying it to different models, then you could get at some of these questions. But you still need your scientific expertise to set up the experiment in terms of what thing are you varying and how you subsetting your data and all those pieces. Like we got that. Yeah, we've experienced. I didn't have those but those particular experience in this slide, but we we have we have done some work work in that area. So, uh, uh, Josh asked the question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry. I think we're we're at we're at two o'clock. So we're up. Uh, thank you very much for working. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Evan Krell from Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, and also part of AI2ES presenting the influence of feature aggregation for explainable AI for high dimensional geoscience applications. So looking at really three things today, unfortunately, the previous talk had a lot of good intro to XAI, so I can go through some of that rather quickly, but we're really gonna look at some of the challenges related to applying XAI for like gridded geospatial data. We'll do a case study on FogNet, which has also been talked about this morning, and then we're gonna expose some of the challenges that we encountered in doing XAI on this kind of data. And then we're gonna to look towards some of the things we're working on to create some new methods that deal with those challenges. Oh, I need to use the mouse. So really the research question we're focusing on here is given that you have this like gridded spatial or sometimes spatial temporal input for a model and you wanna explain it, which which parts of this like, data cube influence the model's decisions for for reasons we'll see it is often useful to group them instead of explaining each individual grid cell there's reasons to group them but we also have seen that how you choose those groups can greatly influence the actual explanations that you get such that two grouping schemes could give you more, like opposite interpretations of how the model what the model learned. So quick intro to XAI, not too necessary because of the last one, um, right? We can use it for model verification or for gaining scientific insights. In this case, this was a, a model trained to differentiate between wolves and huskies, but this XAI technique highlights which of the pixels it's actually looking at. And it turns out mm, the vast majority of like Google image wolf pictures have snow in the background. So it just learns that snow equals wolf, right? So because your test and training data set are from the same Google images, it looks like this is a really high performance model, but it's not useful, right? High performance, but bad. And the same, there's some pitfalls in doing so, but you could also say, well, if your model has learned and is you know, achieving high performance, is there something that it's learned that we don't know, right? Can we extract some signs from that? Um, so that and other reasons, it's interesting to, to dig into what have these like complex deep learning, other kinds of machine learning models learned. Okay. And there's different, there's actually many, many, many kinds of XAI methods, but the ones you often see are divided into local and global explanations or local says, given one sample, what was the model looking at? For example, in this image, right? It's detected dog and it's saying the dog's face is why the model said dog, which is what, what you wanna see, right? Um, but you can also run it over a set of, exam of samples for a global explanation, which one of the questions was already about that, right? Like if some things are only conditionally influential, and you're running it over this set of samples, you can really hide a lot of information by coming up with one single explanation that tells you about 
a whole model, especially if we're dealing stuff like in this kind of community where you have a lot of imbalanced data classes, because that global explanation is probably only telling you about the correct rejects, right? You're not really digging into the specifics of storms, clouds, different things. Feature effect are methods that say, this is how this feature was used to influence the model's actual output, whether or not that helped make give you a better predicting model. And feature importance is how does the feature help or hurt model performance overall, right? And geoscience models, just to give an example of, what, of the kind of models we're dealing with in this talk, we're talking about gridded data like this, where you have some kind of feature map, and maybe it's multiple different features stacked together, or in this case, you have the same variable, geopotential, but at different time steps, as put into some kind of complex machine learning model. And the emphasis is on complex model because as we've seen this morning, they often do outperform simpler alternatives, right? I mean, you wouldn't use a complex model if the random forest gave you just as good a performance, right? But the problem is, as you increase the complexity of the architecture, the difficulty of determining what that model actually learned increases as well. Hence, XAI methods, right? So the big thing that makes these geoscience models a little bit different in terms of XAI from a lot of the tabular data, which is you know, tabular data is what most of the like, XAI packages are designed for, either that or simpler like RGB images of, you know, most of the literature out there has pictures of like cats and dogs and boats, right? Which is a little, not always easy to translate to the kinds of problems we work on. So autocorrelation is a major part of these kinds of input data and they greatly impact the ability to really use XAI methods effectively. Because just intuitively, every, each individual pixel, the surrounding pixels tell you so much information about what that pixel would be, that if you take it out of the model, you probably don't change the output at all, right? And XAI typically results by seeing, well, what happens if we have this feature in versus what happens if we have the feature out? And this is exactly the kind of data that we deal with, right? So you can have just a simple 2D map or 3D maps, um, 3D because each channel is temporal, or in the case of Fognet, it's a mix, right? So it gets a little bit more complicated because each set of four adjacent bands is the same variable at different time steps, but then the next four is, the, is also four time steps, but it's the next like altitude of that variable. So the autocorrelation happens here, but it also happens with a skip here because you have it in the autocorrelation in time and in space. So what does this actually mean for XAI? We'll look at this example with just a hypothetical cloud detection model. We're not worrying about what cloud means here. We're just saying you have a model, you give it a picture and it says yes or no, there's cloud in the picture. Just, just something real simple, right? So, a typical XAI algorithm, similar to this one right here, assesses how important each individual pixel is, right? But in this case, if you change this pixel, you didn't really change the image in any meaningful way. And you would really hope that your model was so robust that one single change, it shouldn't, you shouldn't change this and now it says no clouds anymore, right? So your output should not change at all. But following that logic, that means if you applied a typical XAI algorithm to this image, then it would say that no pixel in the image was important for the detection of the cloud. But that doesn't make sense because then you have to ask, so why did it detect the cloud, right? If the image didn't, it's like it's not magic. Something in this picture had to be the reason it made that decision. But a conventional XAI algorithm are typically going to just put zeros everywhere or give you some weird artifact. Often it seems to pick things in the corner, I think, because it sees them first, but you're not gonna get much information. So instead, what people start doing is say, well, let's look at super pixels, right? Because now if you're taking this whole chunk of the image, there's clearly textures and things here that are related to what the model has learned to recognize as the clouds. So changing this super pixel, you probably get some decrease, at least a little bit in the, um, the output prediction, right? 
or if you even were intelligently able to like grab the whole set of similar pixels and take those out. And so removing that could lower the model's detection confidence so that you're able to actually measure how much those pixels influence the output. And so we're saying that for meaningful XAI results, you are probably going to need to group your grid cells in some way and then explain those groups rather than the individuals. The problem is there's not a lot of guidance on how to do that, right? Um, so we do make some kind of assumptions here is that a coarser group is a more reliable ranking or it gives you a better, better XAI result. Like if you take out the entire image and call that one group, you're going to clearly see the influence of that image on the output. The problem is that your resolution of insights is low because you didn't really learn. If it's the whole image, you just still didn't learn anything. With more granular groups, you start to run into the problem of it's harder to trust the image. It's harder to trust the XI results because you know that there's all this autocorrelation and you know that this problem exists. But if it is true, then at least your the resolution of the insights is higher. Now you're able to say something more specific about the region in the data cube that you're trying to explain, right? And uh, based on our observation, something we've seen is that when XAI highlights an influential feature, it really does suggest that that has an effect on the model because changing it affected the output in some way. But what's not true is that not being detected does not necessarily mean that those not detected parts of the image, they could be more important than the ones that were, right? And as we'll see in our case study, when grouping schemes at different granularities disagree, this could suggest something about the scale of the learned feature and give us some information that no one grouping strategy presented. So here are some of the geometric group grouping schemes, right? So you can have your, you can divide it into super pixels. And that's what this is here for some simple RGB data. Um, you could divide it into saying, well, let's just explain each channel because that's like one, one variable map, right? Groups of channels, for example, the five physics based groups of fog net or super pixels within each channel. The problem is you might want to try all of them, but you don't have the computational resources to just try every possible combination. So there's got to be some strategies to doing so. Um, you could even have somehow use the data to decide within each channel what size the super pixels should be. And that is done by something called partition shaft. And we have our own modification to do it to each channel separately instead of just one. Fognet, we've already seen. We know about the five grouping schemes with things like wind, et cetera. So we've applied some methods that we've already seen, like permutation feature importance, loss shaft, group holdout, which is actually retraining the model, and feature effect method, channel-wise partition shaft. And here are the results for feature importance, which is what we really want to highlight. So each column is a grouping scheme. And we want to see, like, here, this is applying XAI methods to these five groups and to each of the 384 channels and then to eight by eight super pixels within each channel. And we want to see how does this influence, if you had just picked one, what your takeaway is about what the model actually learned. And if you did it on super pixels within, which is like default by some of these algorithms, you would come away with that the first three groups don't help your model at all. I mean, maybe a little bit group one wind, but it's really only looking at group four and five. So that could be, that was a reasonable interpretation, especially group three seems to be not used at all. However, if you apply it to the groups themselves, you find that all of them are, are important. And the ones that one grouping scheme suggests is not used at all, in fact, contributes 20% of the model performance. So what this suggests or what, how you need to think about XAI outputs is when you say you're evaluating this super pixel, what you're really testing is how influential is this group in isolation? You're not saying how influential is this group if it was part of another feature at a higher scale. So really by comparing these at the channel groups, the channels and channel-wise super pixels, what it suggests is that we see that these 
groups one through three like diminish as you get more and more granular, which suggests that it's learning higher like like wind profiles, right? It's learning things that are in three dimensional instead of two dimensional, which is the reason why we wanted to use 3D convolution in the first place. So this suggests that in these two groups, you're learning specific things. In other groups, you're learning like large scale features across the grid. And other things we've done is applying like feature effect results. And we looked at, well, how does the grouping also affect how you can take your group of local explanations to kind of get a better, like an overall model insight? Because it's too hard to look at, you know, hundreds, hundreds and thousands of specific maps of XI outputs. And if you just did it on the groups, you learned almost nothing because it just shows that, well, you know, they're all e pretty much equally important. But the problem is this is a imbalanced data set, right? So actually your aggregate of all these explanations is really only reflecting the correct rejects because that's the majority class. So depending on how you aggregate and visualize your set of local explanations actually changes your perception of how the model works as well. And then we also look at them in the form of maps and there's just a lot of different ways. We're trying to argue that one way isn't enough. You need to, well, let's look at this, right? So pitfalls are based on one way, you could have said that it doesn't use groups one through three at all, which is actually completely wrong. Or you could say it only looks at information around the target, which we see a lot here. But since we know that it's not picking up on these groups, we actually don't have information about where it's using, for example, wind and thermodynamic profile. So that would be another potential pitfall is to just assume, well, it's not looking at offshore wind. In reality, it uses wind and we don't know where. So it's important when you're using these methods to understand what exactly they're telling you, how they're probing the model so that you can correctly determine like what makes sense to pull from the XAI method and what's a pitfall. Like that tells you something about the model that your methods don't really measure. And now the, the last thing, is there's a lot of assumptions made here because if we knew the correct explanation of the model, we wouldn't need XAI. So that makes it very hard to determine which XAI method is correct. So we're working with CIRA, with some Dr. Ime Iverdupov and others to build a set of benchmarks where we know what the explanation is so that we can better evaluate the influence of different grouping schemes. Thank you. Questions? So you just talked a bit about autocorrelation of the data is kind of a particular issue for geospatial data sets, yes. leading to some of these issues in the understanding what's going on. Right, right. right. Um, there are a bunch of ways to look at spatial dependency that are simpler than just like looking along one axis in the data set or something like that. Have you considered other things? That's say, what we want to do, right? So we have in mind trying to use the statistics of the data itself, to like determine the groups as a much better way than just saying, well, like these are totally arbitrary, right? So you're going to have groups that have both coastline and off the coast, like water and land mixed into one group. But this is what the algorithms typically do. You just tell it a re target resolution and it divides it. But what we want to get towards is like, I mean, this is a very simple example, but just using the data itself to determine what the groups should be. Um, there's some challenges to using the correlation to do so because, you know, if you have images that come from different places, your feature is like a coordinate. So the coordinate across images means something different. So when you're trying to come up with this global explanation and say like, how important was this region of the map? In the case of FogNet, it makes sense because we always are looking at the same location. But if these are satellite images from all over, how do you decide how to combine those? So there's a lot of challenges, but yes, we are wanting to use like, like spatial statistics and different things to generate these groups. Um, and that's really why we're building the benchmark so that we'll know if it helped or not. Good question. 
So you're, you're, this is basically a, helping your helping the subject matter ex, matter expert intuit what's going on. That's my impression of it. Yes, fair to say. Yes. Like we worked with uh, Waylon Collins from the National Weather Service, who's the one who originally came up with like what the inputs to Fognet should be. And in our upcoming paper, he has like a couple pages where he looks at the XAI and you know interprets them. And we're specifically trying to use the things we've learned from the comparison so that we can know which claims make sense to make and which claims the XAI doesn't really tell us that. Even if in some of the maps, maybe it looks like it is telling us that. So that's it's kind of a mix of the domain expertise, but also the computer science telling this is what the method actually does, independent of what you could how you could be misled if you just looked at the map that says that's the explanation. Great context. All right, we have to move on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Wait, so our last slide is actually this twin red from RML. Uh, it talks going to be comparative assessment, machine learning based forecast collection models with different triple state funding. Um, hi, my name is Chuen Nguyen, and today I will be um, talk about a summary of our research project. So the goal of our project is try to develop a physics-based machine learning that can use a combination of the data from the numerical weather model and the satellite data to improve cloud forecast. Oh, so why it go so fast? I'm sorry. Okay, it's go ahead of me. Oh, so... Um, for the for the satellite data, we we use data from GOES, and for the uh, numerical weather forecast, we try to use COAP and also NAPCHIM. And when you look at the images here, let's look at the data from the far right. The go this is the GOES reflecting, and in the middle is the GOES cloud type retrieval, and the far left is a NAPCHIM cloud type that forecasts at the same time with goes um goes data here so just by visualization you can see that napgm not also carry an error in the location but it's also carry error in identify cloud type the reason is that at the same atmospheric level the forcing mechanism for different cloud type can be very significantly how it's formed how it how it moves and also you you we cannot capture a 3d Q of cloud in the two dimension. We will have multiple cloud type in one pixel. There, therefore, is is motivate us to try to develop a machine learning system that use the input variable that could talk about how the cloud form and how is is move based on different cloud type. And we have um, five different cloud type here. You can look on the far left. Is that the upper Tropospheric and the mid tropospheric, the convection, the deep precipitating, stable and unstable. So we have six cloud type here. And um, this is an overview of our methodology. First, we, we will use either co-apps on NAPCHIM and fusing with the GOES data. We collect five years data from 2018 to 2022, daily UTC 12, 15, 18, and zero. For, and then after that, we have the, the, the feature already fused together in the same risk side. We will try to use the uh, KBEST to see, see that which is the, the best feature for its cloud type to use. And then we also try to see that what kind of data dimension that we can use is it 1D or 2D. And then we also try to split the data in a, a manner that the, the testing data and the validating data have all year long so we can see the seasonal effect on the data. So after we have the data split in and for training and, and get ready for the model, we're testing with for a, a few different models. We're testing with the DNN, with the XGBoost and the CNN. And CNN showed that it's the, it's the, have the best result. And after the, D, the CNN gets selected, we also tuning, changing different structure, the hyper parameter, evaluate a test set. 
and then identify the, the what is the error came from and improve it for the final model infrastructure. And this is a, um, at the end of the day, we have 24 machine learning models. Each of them have its own set of predictor and predictance. And also that um, we have each model for each hour. So this is the, um, I don't know how, how to do it, but this is the order predictor that we combine and then from the goals and the NAPCHIM data. And then we use a prediction from the goals mass S and then we, we use, this is a sample for the unstable cloud CNN. We can have the two different different kind of output. We can have a probability from zero to one. Zero is like zero probability to have cloud and one is like 100% is this cloud. And then after that, we put a threshold to have a binary output, which is you see in all the far right. And um, this is um, an outline of our UNet architect. Is our, um, our unit is a um, is a um, is an encoder and decoder pathway with skip connection between the cor corresponding layer layer. We use three and three uh, three by three um, convolution kernel with a uh, like as a max pool of like two by two stripe of two and the loss function we use a dice loss function with binary cross entropy. The optimization Adam and the activation function is sigmoid. Um, first, when we first developed the model, we we train and testing model on coax data, and then we try to testing and run it the same infrastructure but with different input data set with different risk side for NAPGM to see that can the model transferable for different data, and if you see here on the um, on the far uh, left is the um, the ETS score comparison between the original NAPGM before its CNN application and then NAPGM after the CNN application and then co-app original and then co-app with CNN array application. So the red one is the correct CNN for NAPGM and then the dash red is a NAPGM original and the 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 solid blue is a co-app, the CNN result that apply for a co-app data. And then the, the dash blue is co-apps before correction. And then the, the red light is the goals of action is that we try to do a test is that we just apply wind to the, the cloud and see how it's moved. And when you look at the data here, the ETS score is the uh, a measurement that's how well did the forecast yes event corresponding to the observed yes event. And if you look in the four, one, two, three, four, five, five chart here, you can see that the CNN improved the ETS score for all cloud type and all hour significantly. Is, is also is proof to us that there is a good site of transferable for the CNN and capture the, the error in both co-apps and NAPGM. And the second thing we have to, to run that we, we run the same model infrastructure with NAPGM with the, the, the ATL CNN is, is a big grid. And then the, AT, AT, the VA, the VA NAPGM is a smaller grid. So we see that how is the risk side could affect the machine learning model. And when you look at the ETS score of both of the cases, it showed that somehow that the larger grid, the CNN did better because maybe it's a lot less noises. And, but bo in both cases, it showed that the CNN correct the error for the NAPGM in the bigger side or a smaller side really well over all the lead time and, um, and for all different cloud type here. Another thing that we look at is that, yes, the model improved the, the, the result, but how is the seasonal effect take a, into the account of, of the, the prediction? So in this case, we try to compare, we calculate the, the mean cloud fraction for the warm season, again, the cold season. And this is one is, is the comparison of the goal observation, the co at six hour forecast and the CNN at six hour forecast. An ETS score, the bias, and the POD and FAR. The POD is is the indication of 
how is the yes is real yes, that model correct? And then the FAR is a fraction of the predicted yes event actually did not be predicted correctly. So you can see here that the CNN improved the model over, overall in the warm season because it's also improved the, the correct hit and it's also reduced the fall alarm. But for the, the, the cold season, it's also improved, the model improved overall the data, but it's mostly improved in the correct hit. So it's not really improved in the fall alarm as much. So there's a seasonal effect in, in the model. And then we take a look at the second thing in the model that the, the model just can do as good as how good the input is. So we were to take a look at the, when the co-apps have a really, really bad bias is like extremely under predicted. And in case that the co-app typically do well, and in the case that co-app do under extremely over predicted. So in this case, we can look at this is, we calculate about 38 cases, which is that the co-apps have a bias less than 0.75, it's extremely underpredicted. And you can see it, the left is a goals of observation, co-apps, and then this is the correction. The, the model can improve the, the overall accuracy and then also improve the ETS score, especially the bias from 0.66 to the 0.88 in the extreme underpredicted. And in the typical well predicted, when co-apps the bias between 0.7 to 1.5, the model could be you know, understand the, the capture the complexity of the data well enough that improve the correct hit and also reduce the, the fall alarm. And in this one that we take a look at when the model have extreme over predicted. So when in the uh, case of when model extreme predicted, the, the CNN not do as well as in other cases. So this is one of the thing that we need to do more um, thought into that to improve the model furthermore. And also understand that why that in the this case that is over predicted, the model improved overall, but is not as good as other cases. And um, in for the initial result is indicate that the machine learning CNN could could able to capture the complexity of the data, improve the systematic error, and able to transfer from a different transfer from the different data set from co-apps to NAPCHIM from a different predictance predictor set, predictor set, and risk side. So this is one thing I want to put a thought, maybe we can talk more in the panel that we are thinking about the, the spatial information, you know, what the error, what the location error is, what the type of error is. But one thing we, we I think that we can improve the prediction when we can incorporate the temporal information that when the season is, because you can see that the seasonal does affect in the CNN also in the co apps data and NAPCHIM data. And also that the second thing is that when we want to go global, what we want to get is uh, operational, we have to solve the problem of the image scale because the co apps have a 0.5 kilometer resolution where NAPCHIM have a five degree. You know, and we have a different risk side of every information. So somehow the, can we put it together so that we can have a model, a general generation of the model could show the problem that consider all the information, the spatial information, the feature, you know, the characteristic of, of the dynamic of the cloud. And then we can figure out if we can have a way to see the cloud top base and the, the cloud base high so that maybe we can move further with a three-dimension cloud forecast system. And my talk is Venus here. <laughs> Welcome for any question and comment. Thanks, Ray. Yeah. So I, I think you mentioned there at the end, you're using the half degree nav gem and the five kilometer coamps grids. Yes. yes. Did, since I remember running that coamps area for Jason for seven years, um, 
did you look at any of like the higher resolution, like the 1.67 kilometer coamps part of that, or did you just only focus on the five kilometer grid for coamps there? Um, as right now, we have a, a several extra slides, but we, as right now, I think that we look at the coax five kilometer, we look at the Neptune 45 degree, the GMS, and the ERA five point. A quarter degree. Okay. That's what the data we look at. Right I'll leave your comment. Um, we did look at that. The problem was it was the area was too really small. small. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, you use an LSTM, an RNN is a competitor to the LSTM. Did you look at using an RNN? Um. Yes, because I think in LSTM is is I from my knowledge, LSTM is a type of of, of RNN, but the, the difference between the, the genetic RNN and the LSTM is that the LSTM is separate the temporal information. So I my goal is that not on, only do you go a short term that we want to have a good model right way, we want to identify where the error came from. So I want to, to layer it up like a lasagna is not a, a mashed potato. So that we would the would would the LM, LSTM is slower is is have is disadvantage. However, it's have the way that we can put the gate that we can separate the feed. temporal information. So we can see that how much the, the temporal information, how much the seasonal affect the, the model error, the data error, because the CNN is will be carry its own error. Okay. Yes. Yes. I, I just have a comment. <laughs> and maybe I'm totally off base. The, the nav jam doesn't look very good in this example. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and the model actually looks really good, US model. Yes. Oh, um, and I'm sorry. That, 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 I put in the back of the slide. We can. I have a few other extra light slides if you guys want to have entertainment instead of break. But <laughs> this one is a comparison of the temperature to see that because this is one of the things that um, they, um, DJ and also just talking about that we spend seventy percent of our time to curate our data. So Jason had to look at all of these and see that okay. And what temperature from what model that we can use for our machine learning model? So this is a comparison. And then finally, when you look at this, NAPGM have a lot of error in the boundary layer. So that finally we have to use the temperature from the ERA5 model instead. I should, I should clarify that. We, yes. So we, we, we train it to the ERA5. Near five cloud types based on air five temperatures. Uh, but we still, when we make the forecast, we still do use the NAVJAP as, as, the, as the predictor. It's just that machine learning is, well, in part, it, it's, it's fixing the errors in, in NAVJAP. And that's, so that's why you see the solid line is above the dash. You know, well, I, I'm just looking at the co amps over there and knowing that it's you know about. Uh, 11 in the morning, you haven't told the heat about them, and it's picking up the urban areas in Ohio and Michigan really nicely. Um, that seems realistic to me, but maybe if ERA was better, it was better. I don't know. So and, the reason and, we yeah. use ERA is uh, we wanted to do this globally. Um, yeah. Clips is very good. I'm yeah. very impressed the way Clips did this kind of error. There's been a lot of work to use. And for Ed, this one, we just look at one example of the May 8th of 2020. Maybe on other day, it's different. One of the things I learned here is that maybe the, the data quality could be changing day to day too. Uh, I remember May 8th, 2020, sitting at home. When am I going to be allowed to talk? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add from Ben Mock's perspective, I think two days earlier, we had put a bug it accidentally into Navjum okay. that may have caused some issues that we had. I think that was about that time. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's in Ohio in particular. It's got the temperatures. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, so probably we're wrong. Thanks. Thanks. So that was the end of our machine learning session. Um, so we're going to be changing gears a little bit here. Um, we had one and this is our last talk before the break, so hang on. <laughs> we have one 
on a submission for our probabilistic cloud forecasting session. And so Matt Janiga from the Naval Research Lab is going to give his talk on extended range prediction of clouds in global couple of ensembles. So it's really more of a forecasting talk, I guess, as opposed to a verification talk. <laughs> that's I guess that's why I there sounds the right session for me. Um, yeah, so a lot of this work is uh, motivated by um, maybe it's a conference. But I heard that it was announced. Um, I was like, okay, I've been looking a lot at subseasonal and extended range prediction and the Navy Herb System prediction capability are a couple of models. So I think I'd look, look at uh, total cloud cover and see if there's anything that can be done with it on sort of these longer time scales. And also going down to some of the war fighting centers in San Diego, um, asking around, is there any sort of uses you guys have for extended range prediction beyond just the traditional, you know, surface winds and waves? And cloud cover was one of the ones that came up. So that was another um, thing that encouraged me to take a look at, you know, what can be done in the latest generation models. So on these time scales, um, of weeks to months, which, you know, there's some different applications you have to sort of think about what are the uses of this? Um, and it's different from what you're typically used to on time scales of hours to days. So um, you're thinking more about, you know, force positioning, uh, situational awareness, uh, sort of overall preparedness. Um, and it's much more probabilistic. Uh, so maybe it does quite a pitch in this session um, because you don't really have a good idea on exactly what's gonna happen one day, two weeks out, but you can say something about, you know, general characteristics of maybe over an ocean basin. Um, and the tools that we have to use for this are these coupled Earth system models, and they provide information about these uh, slowly varying modes of variability, such as the Madden Julian oscillation and ENSO. And we can leverage this to predict the sort of sensible weather that we're interested in, um, in this case, uh, cloud cover. So, uh, just review of what's been done before, previously on extended range cloud prediction. Um, one of the things I want to introduce here is this uh, paper by Matt Wheeler, and he was looking at the concept of a seamless verification. So as you look farther and farther out, you don't want to just be looking at a three hour window or a daily window. You start to want to be looking at like a week window or two weeks. And as you go into seasonal prediction, you want to be looking at months or three month windows. Um, and this is a paper that I did in 2018. Um, this is mostly focused on equatorial waves trying to see how different models are able to predict them. And because OLR observations have been around for a long time, that's one of the ways we look at ectoral waves. So I looked at Navy ESPC, uh, ESIMDF, and, and NCEP CFSP2, looking at the week one and week two anomaly correlations. So you can see um, the areas at week two that are yellow or orange are not covering a whole lot of area. Uh, however, these were based on control forecasts. So I'm not looking at the ensemble. Um, we didn't have that yet for Navy ESPC. Um, so week two, you're not a whole lot of skill, <laughs> um, but a few areas around the MJO uh, area, the Indo-Pacific and in the Equatorial regions where ENSO is important, that there is some skill there at week two. Um, and where this is coming from is mainly these low frequency signals and the MJO. So what I did here is I took these 45 day forecasts that I padded them previously with observations. That's how I was able to apply Fourier filtering and pull out, you know, what is the contribution of um, low frequency and MGO signals to skill? Here I'm just looking at the correlation on the left here between the low frequency model forecast and the low frequency filter of the observations. And then you do the same thing for the MGO. So you can see here, you know, the MGO skill really stands out in East MJF, although NCFCSP2 is summer MGO isn't as good. So there's uh, sort of a hole there. Um, I just want to emphasize that the this is not explaining all the variance. It's just explaining a small part of the total variance, but this is where the skill is coming from when you're looking at the skill of the unfiltered weekly averages. Um, as I said, there's a lot of outstanding questions here. Um, what is the benefit of the latest generation of a couple of global ensembles, which has changed since about when I did this in 2018? Uh, what is the potential predictability if you were to say, make an assumption of a perfect model? Um, and I'll go into that. And then also, what is the impact of spatial averaging? Because when you're looking at uh, two weeks out, maybe you don't want to be focused on individual grid points, but maybe a, a certain search radius. So those are the questions I want to look at here in the study. And the data I'm using uh, are the ESIMWF 11 member reforecast from 2002 to 2021. And then for uh, 2021 and 2022, I'm using 
uh, Navy SPC and sub csv 2 UKMO and eSIMDEVS operational uh, ensembles. For the uh, verification, I uh, used the ERA-5 reanalysis just because I just did this study over the last couple months. So um, I found some issues with the um, grid satellite observations where you have the boundary between satellites. And that was, I think, probably uh, adding some complication to interpreting the results. And I'm just looking at, standing, looking at anomaly correlation here. Uh, there's better verification metrics, but for just a quick look at is there any skill um, at these time scales at all? Um, I just want to fix for standard anomaly correlation. And for the potential correlation, what I'm doing is I take, for example, the ESIMDF uh, 11 member ensemble, I take the seventh member and I look at the correlation between that and an ensemble mean, which excludes that member. So it's if you had a perfect forecast from that ensemble member, and that was really observations of reality, how would it compare to an ensemble mean? So what is the sort of potential correlation if you got rid of all the model biases and all those issues that we have? And then I'm looking at different temporal and spatial radial uh, averaging as well. And now let's look at a few different domains here, which I think are maybe interest to the Navy, uh, the Western Pacific and the North Atlantic. So the outline of talk here, I'm going to look at the potential and actual prediction skill in this 20 year data set that allows me to sort of kind of look at the sort of geographic variability of the scale, the seasonal variation. And then for the two years, um, just a quick look at how these different models compare. And then I'll talk a little bit about how I think some of the current products that we have um, could maybe be expanded to uh, address this cloud cover issue. So you're just showing quickly the climatological cloud cover in the winter and the different domains I'm looking at. Um, so the, the shading indicates that you have these, this high cloud cover in the extratropics and the uh, into the Arctic regions. And then the contours, uh, the thick black lines show the areas where there's a lot of variability. So, um, for example, one area we, we might not want to focus on too much would be this area, you know, just off the coast of South America, where it's pretty much always clear and doesn't really vary much. Um, we wouldn't be very interested if their model was skillful of that because it's either always <laughs> cloudy out here or really never cloudy in those regions. So these are sort of transition regions that I'm focusing on. And then in summer, um, just I just picked the same regions here as well. So. Um, you can see for the potential and actual correlation here, um, for days four to eight, um, you know, potential is higher than actual to do the issues in the model. Um, and the uh, scale here starts at 0 0.5 anomaly correlation. So it is different from the previous figure I showed. So one thing you showed that when you, when you are using an ensemble, you do get a, a fair amount more skill. And you can see that for week two, the actual correlation is skillful over a fairly large area. It's highest in the tropics, but extends into the subtropics as well. Um, this is when you apply a, a week, an average to, to the data. So it's average all the data over week two and then compare observations and forecast. And then for the bottom here, I'm doing the same thing, but I take a two week window. So I'm comparing the average over week two, sorry, a two week window between weeks three and four between model and observations. And there it's pretty much as skillful right around the equatorial regions where ENSO is really important. And this is the winter and you go to summer, it's a little bit less skillful overall. The MJO is not as strong in terms of its teleconnections, the extropics in the boreal summer, but you still see at week two, there are a number of areas where there is some uh, skill there. And that was just looking at you know, the just individual grid points. And that's maybe not the most useful thing to look at when you're looking two weeks out or three weeks out, you might wanna look at a radius. So. I decided to look at the uh, correlation for a 500 kilometer radius uh, of the data average beforehand or a thousand kilometer radius. And when you look at the daily averages, um, you can see that you get several days of additional skill when you look at these uh, daily averages. One additional uh, benefit of that is that when you're looking at like 70 or 80 degrees north, the grid points are smaller. So the real average interest is that sort of latitudinal um, smaller areas as well, which does reduce the skill. So um, on these plots, um, it has the original um, gross gridded data, two and a half degree uh, data, um, 500 kilometer radius average data, and the 1,000 kilometer uh, solid is shown and uh, dashed is potential. Um, and so it's a lot of focus here on this swap. <laughs> so this is showing, for example, at you know week two um, for the Western Pacific or the North Pacific, it you know depending on what radius you're using. 
um, you generally have a, a skillful forecast. But as you go to week three and four, it was just in the Western Pacific. And this is for the winter. So now I'm gonna go to the summer here and it just kind of drops off a little, quite a bit overall. Um, and these are looking at these sort of seamless windows. So, you know, weeks three to four, week two, day to four to eight. Um, but we may want to just you know, pick a certain window length of, you know, four days and look at, you know, days zero to four, day four to eight, day eight to 12. When does it drop off where these, you know, forecasts are really no longer that useful? And it seems to be that in the winter, at least, uh, day eight to 12 has some potential. So it's that far end of medium range. Um, as I said before, uh, things kind of drop off a little bit overall in the summer. And um, we might not always use a four-day window. Maybe we we'll want to use a seven-day window and look at the weeks. And for this case, you know, week two, there's a lot of, you know, there's still a fair amount of skill in these different regions. Uh, week three, it's kind of on the fence. And then, you know, beyond that, yeah, probably not very much at all. And then again, things drop off in the summer. So these are looking at 20 years of data. Um, and one of the things I found when I, you know, decided, okay, now I'm going to look at the operational forecasts for 21 and 2022, um, that it dropped off, um, you can see for week two here. Um, I would, if I went back and forth, you can see that these did drop off. And these were La Nina years, so uh, the MJO was not moving as far into the Central Pacific. Um, there was just kind of less skill overall uh, during these La Nina years, but you can also see that the Eastern BIF model is the, the most skillful of the models. UKMO is uh, second, then uh, NCEP, uh, CFSP2, and ABSPC kind of swap spaces. And um, in the current version, just taking the raw output are not really that skillful, at least in these years for week two. And then again, yeah, summer, you know, overall drop off. So, um, in AVSBC, we've been running this um, operationally since August 2020. Um, it is a 45-day forecast with 60 members produced each Sunday. It's 37-kilometer resolution version of NAVGEM. Uh, in version two, which um, we're finishing up the VTR testing on the ensemble, we've already done it for the deterministic version, which has a higher resolution, 25th uh, degree ocean. Um, the atmospheric resolution will be increasing. Um, we'll also have a one-way coupling uh, to waves where the atmospheric models forcing wave model. So there's a number of products that are currently available for an ABSPC that um, include you know, the MJO and uh, OLR. Uh, I have, I've seen quite a bit more skill in the MJO and OLR, so it seems that it's mainly these biases that are affecting the total cloud cover uh, skill in ABSPC. But, um, so it, well, one of the potential products could be these sort of anomaly maps, looking at the weekly average anomalies of total cloud cover or some sort of you know, probability of cloud cover exceeding some threshold. But there's still, I think, quite a bit more work that needs to be done to figure out you know, what products would be most useful and what are most skillful. Um, and this is showing the MJO skill for the uh, deterministic uh, BTR period uh, forecast initialized between September 2020 and um, July of 2021. And you can see that maybe species deterministic uh, skill here in the, the black line uh, when we compare it to a just a single member of the operational ensemble is doing you know fairly good compared to these models. So the overall extended range prediction skill of ABC is quite good, although it does seem to have um, less skill overall than the other models for cloud cover. Although that's not a field that we've really given too much attention and to or really looked at much beyond uh, this talk when I just started looking at it. So in summary, uh, cloud cover, uh, it seems can be can be skillfully predicted over large areas of the tropics, extending to mid latitudes at um, forecast windows of you know, days eight to 12 or, or looking at week two. Um, and there could be potentially skill in certain situations, for example, a strong MGO event. We see this for other things such as surface wind prediction or uh, set and range prediction of tropical cyclones. Um, and you do want to think about, you know, your temporal and spatial averaging and when you look at these really long lead times. Um, I have preliminary looked at this issue of, you know, variability and scale between different seasons and different operational models. And there, there is a very bit, a fair amount of variability, but that's something that needs to be looked into more. Um, and in the future, uh, I think there needs to be, you know, a closer look at in other ways of conveying this information BI, size is looking at weekly averages of the ensemble mean and the uh, anomalies, um, looking at more probabilistic products 
Um, in addition, the large variation scale over time between season to season, El Nino years versus La Nina years. Um, something that we've always been uh, thinking about in terms of these uh, extent range predictions is uh, forecasts of opportunity. So when you have a really strong signal with the MGO or ENSO, um, and there's you know a forecast of some high impact event three weeks out, is that something we can trust from the model looking at the ensemble spread and saying, okay, it's a high confidence uh, forecast uh, is that you know reliable? And then you know in the pipeline as well uh, after version two, um, you know looking at sort of the physical co uh, causes of these cloud cover biases, we looked at a number of other things such as the MJO and tropical cyclones, but haven't really focused on cloud cover um, specifically. Um, we do have a few um, methods of correcting for biases. One of them is analysis correction based out of inflation, where we apply model tendencies derived from the uh, errors in the um, short forecast for data simulation. And then this has shown some you know, improvement for the MGO adding several days of scale, but does it also improve, for example, cloud cover? And then you know, ways of post-processing the forecast to address the biases as well. So uh, thank you and uh, happy to answer any questions. Time for a few questions from Matt. Great for the break. I have just one comment. You so you used um, what was it, ERA five? Yeah, for, just for, the, for, for the verification. verification. Yeah, uh, just yeah, a comment. So maybe have a conversation with Lewis from NASA Langley and the Sierra Group. Uh, to try to talk through some of those things that you were seeing. Yeah, I had, I had downloaded the series data. I'm uh, just looking at primatology. I had a couple of conferences, but I just yeah. <laughs> thought yeah. we could get in like a month or so. So yeah, no. Um, I, may I, have I would like to look at that as well. Um, I'm a little bit confused. Can you give me a, a quick define when you say if to look at if it's useful or it's skillful? So what is your definition of I just, useful? Yeah, I use a threshold 0 0.5 anomaly correlation as sort of a, a rough estimate of whether it was skillful. And that generally tends to match with meeting climatology for, for the RMSDs. Um, so you 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 a combination of RMSDs and, and... Oh, so I so when the anomaly correlation is greater than 0 0.5, it yeah. tends to also be when the RMSD is better than climatology. Okay. But I didn't look at that specifically, but as a rule of thumb, it tends to be when okay. the forecasts are useful. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, gosh. Um, can you comment a little bit about the like phenomenology of, of the, the things that cause the skill like in days 48 a week two? So what I'm getting at is I understand MGO and the equatorial waves, mm -hmm. right? You know how they're propagating the speed and there's a whole right. equator that yeah, you, they go far and you um, can do that further in time. Um, but in those, in those medium to long ranges, where are we getting skill? Is that runs in the mid latitudes? Is that the long waves? Like where are we looking at? Where we got skill dropouts and where are we still preserving skill in that? So um, my guess would be um, it's the connection between the MJO and the velocity wave trains that you know typically occur when the MJO is in certain phases. You tend to have you know propagations of velocity wave trains emanating from all that heating occurring at the MJO. So there's pre preferred regions of troughs and ridges, which I would imagine would be correlated with cloud cover. But yeah, it tends to be like the MJO and the NSO is what's driving the subseasonal skill. So that sort of you know falls off as you move to the tropics and then you start to get this sort of teleconnection scale which is not you know perfectly correlated but you know has some relationship with these well that's helpful i guess i just kind of wanted to better understand the complete yeah. uh, breakdown of skill in the mid-latitude to polar areas we're quite we're, we're more than this yeah. yeah okay thank you If there's no other questions, we can go to our break a little bit early. <laughs> so I'm at NOAA GSL and verification group there, and we really have kind of two main areas that we look at. One is doing a lot of verification for the FAA, so verifying other uh, weather-related products, turbulence, icing, um, two that I'll talk most about today. And then we also uh, do have a group that's primarily providing feedback to the modelers and helping with the model development of the HER, the RRFS, things along those lines. And we both have some interest in clouds. So what is our interest in clouds? One as, uh, so turbulence, 
I don't think I did that. Um, turbulence forecasts have been around for over a decade now, but just finally, as we're as they're transitioning from 13 kilometer input data from the RAP to three kilometer input data, they are now getting to explicitly including in cloud turbulence in addition to clear air and mountain wave turbulence that have been part of the product thus far. And since our job is to evaluate how well those forecasts are doing, it's important for us to know, well, where did the models get the clouds right? So it was this failure to identify in cloud turbulence because the algorithm missed it or because the model didn't put clouds there and there's not much that the algorithm can do in that case. Aircraft icing, also a problem we had, that was touched on a little bit this morning on the, some of the problems with icing. I think that focus was more on drones. This is more aircraft and especially general aviation. Most of those planes don't have any anti-icing uh, equipment on their plane. So encountering icing is, is bad news for them. Just a little bit about the host of problems that icing on an aircraft can cause. So again, if if we're looking at icing, we need to know, well, did the model get clouds in the right place? That's when you encounter icing supercooled drops in clouds. In the past, we have used CloudSat and Calypso together to try to estimate or to get an idea of where clouds are located, because otherwise all that we can use are aircraft uh, pilot reports, but of course, pilots try not to fly into areas that are going to be a problem. So that gives us a very skewed data set. Um, and CloudSat and Calypso, it, it gives us a lot of good information where there's a pass and the uh, of the satellite through the domain, which is pretty limited. And especially we were looking in Alaska before, and it turns out that it only hits certain parts of Alaska certain times a day. So you can't pull apart geographic effects from temporal effects. So we are now starting a uh, an investigation of a 3D cloud product. We heard a little bit about it this morning. YJ will talk, she's here, there she is. She will talk about it tomorrow morning, I think around 11, tune in then. You get more information about the product itself, but we're looking, so it's for CONUS, it goes, in Alaska, it's including the uh, some of the polar orbiting satellites as well. I think model background field, you'll get all those details tomorrow. Um, you can see, and it gives not only where are the clouds 3D, but also gives you some cloud phase information, which again would be great if you're interested in uh, aircraft icing. So as part of that, and looking at, we want to say, okay, did the model get the clouds right? It's, well, where is the model? What, it turns out that saying the model says there are clouds here is not as simple of a question as it seems. There are lots of different ways to define clouds. So we saw the inferred clouds um, that there you were at three kilometers and you could say we, we get some cumulus clouds, not all of them at that scale. But even, oh, and I'm sorry, the uh, formatting got a little off there. So that's the uh, the left image is the satellite mapped onto the onto the HER grid and the image on the right is the is the HER forecast. And this is for, we just split it up into layers to look at it and turn, the modelers typically just take the cloud and ice fields to say, here are clouds, ignoring precipitation because they don't want their cloud coming all the way down to the ground. But if you only use those cloud and ice fields when you do have precipitation, you end up with big holes in the middle of your clouds where it is precipitating. And so, we threw all of the um, all of the water variables into it, and we get a closer look. You can see a an interesting uh, problem in the Pacific, where the model really liked the marine layer, throwing clouds everywhere. <clears throat> if we go up, look higher in the atmosphere, uh, that nicely disappears, but so do a lot of the other clouds. And somebody mentioned earlier that the, about the satellite picking up on some of the optically thin cirrus, and that could explain some of the difference here that the, the model might have trouble picking up on. Um, but it turned even if you look, I'm not showing the middle layer here just for conciseness, but middle layer is kind of like the high layer, but has a little more cloud. So that was the daytime. At nighttime, a lot of the same problem, but again, you see a big 
and and once again that's satellite on the left and model on the right but you see this big under prediction except out over the oceans and that's low and high more of the same story so just real quick we had just two weeks of data from the spring and just as a quick side note we use the her instead of the rrfs because it's stable it's well established um lots of uh fiddling with the model right now with the rfs trying to get it to um get it ready to transition to operation so blue orange green are low middle and high layers we've got the csi on the right and the bias on the left and interestingly the low level actually it gets has a really nice bias score but i think a lot of that is overdone because of the excessive clouds that you get over the oceans if you if we masked that out i think it would look more like the other layers and having a pretty strong under prediction of cloud um, and you do see especially with the middle and high layers you see some of that uh, hour of day dependence it does much better in the afternoon evening hours than it does overnight but how good is the satellite is the, is the, is the satellite especially we're talking about layered cloud and all that and so there are Oh, I didn't get the updated. There are 130 aircraft worldwide, about 110 that operate in the US that have a water vapor sensor on them. And so the idea is, well, let's look where these planes are flying and look at the RH values. And does that correlate well with where we have cloud? And various studies have been, been done through the years looking at the performance of these sensors relative to soundings. They even had a field program several years back, Rockford, Illinois, where they launched a bunch of soundings and had planes coming in so you could get them at about the same place since you tend not to launch balloons where you have a lot of planes flying. So otherwise co-located data can be a challenge. Um, and here's an ugly table of, of data and the key there. So these are RH, um, we're looking at bias and standard deviation of those RH differences. And this is, looking at the, uh, using the RAP model. But, and so the red is kind of flagged as being, well, these are either really strong bias or excessively noisy, but is that because those sensors are bad or is that because the model has the clouds in the wrong place? And so we end up with a nice circular, we got, we're using the model to say, are the airplane measurements good? So we can use the airplane measurements to see if the satellite product is good to see if we can tell whether the model's good. Um, so we're still playing with that and trying to get around that issue. So um, again, we're going to be looking more at the at the plane and trying to get a uh, get around that issue of a of a circular problem there. Um, we're going to be looking again once we can get some good truth data that we are confident in. We thought about having a little tag time for our group. We have trust issues, so we don't believe any of the data. Um, we're gonna use that to look at both the CONUS product and over Alaska. We have some icing forecast products we have to evaluate in both domains. And so we're gonna be looking at them separately. Uh, again, we have that in cloud turbulence evaluation that we have to do. And then also, I, I focus mostly on the FAA work, but we have some work on the on the model development side, also for aviation, where they're interested in cloud ceiling. But then you run into the question: Well, what does scattered at two thousand mean in model space um, when we're dealing three kilometers? And um, and that led to a an interesting and contentious discussion with some of the modelers and the guys especially focused on doing the clouds at the best way to try to level what the clouds what the model is doing and what the METARs are the information that the METARs are giving you one possible um, solution to that is sometime early next year I believe is the target that the raw salometer data the backscatter data from the salometers is supposed to be made publicly available and so we won't be limited to just the um, 
the text from the METAR saying, you know, and there are up to six different levels that they'll report clouds, but we can perhaps use that backscatter data to get a better sense of where, where a good cloud base is. Um, and then we also have another, another FAA project coming up that is some folks from MIT that are looking at webcams and they previously, we'd previously done some work in Alaska where they were trying to determine visibility based on these webcams, doing ed edge detection and kind of tagging known objects in the camera field. We know that this is 12 miles away. We know that this is four miles away. If this becomes obscured, then we get a sense of the visibility. Now they're trying to do that. Alaska again, but also there are some, some of these cameras operating in, in the CONUS in Colorado and somewhere in New England, I think, I can't remember where. And, but they're gonna do, look at cloud cover instead of visibility. Um, and again, a single cloud cover measure from METAR, what that means, how do you take that? I can report some coverage of clouds at multiple altitudes. What does that mean for just a total cloud cover for this area? Um, so that's, some, that's an evaluation that will probably happen next year. And that, I don't know if I had a good, oh yeah, so sorry, I had an example. Um, and that's all I have, so thanks. Time for a few questions. And the third results could be more things to find. <laughs> <laughs> have you thought about how you'd use the statistics to validate the aircraft data? No, I we did a lot of things with the icing, but they couldn't use the vehicle threat score. Because of the miss, yeah, yeah, you know, your body sample at the end of the odds, yeah. So, what's the specific so question? Are you going to use the same national statistics that, say, Barb Brown used? Or Pretty much, yeah. I, um, I guess for those, Barb Brown back in 99 or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe even a little earlier, I had a paper talking about this problem that with the pyreps and the pilots avoid the bad weather. And so the sampling of yes events, observed yes, observed no, is skewed. You know, that you don't know what the right distribution is. You know that the information you're getting from the OBS is not right. And so it precludes looking at something like a false alarm rate or doing a CSI because you can't go across the columns. Um, and so you're limited to POD, POFD and what you can do with that. And until somebody comes up with a better <laughs> uh, a better way to do that, we're yeah, kind of stuck there. Yes. Well, but I used to work in sensors. Um, do you know if, if there are any maintenance records on the sensors that are on the aircrafts to see if they're checking them for calibration or anything? So, well, so that raises a, an interesting thing. And one reason why we started looking into this, so a, um, a company based in Canada recently purchased the, I guess the sensors and I think they own the data too, technically. And they have told the FAA, they don't think the sensors are good and they all need to be replaced. Um, <laughs> they might have some other interest in, in doing that. Um, but yeah, so that that kind of kicked this off. They do so they they go through they go through a process and there's not really any maintenance done, but the every two years when the planes go through their heavy maintenance, those sensors are checked in some form. I don't know the exact details of that. And if they find something bad, they can swap it out with spares that they have. But we don't know. We're able to track it by tail number. So we can tie it to a particular plane and a particular sensor. So that was that ugly table that I had. Um and it varies. And there are some sensors that are, again, if we ignore the problems that we're going off the model, there are some sensors that are repeatedly bad. We looked at three, uh, four, four week periods looking around the year. And there are some that were had high variability values and stuff every, all 16 weeks. So those we can kind of, and there are some that are always good. And then you have a good number in the middle. And on any given week, about 80 of them seem to be producing reasonable numbers. So that's still not bad. When you were comparing the model to the satellite, I'm assuming that wasn't raw satellite, it was level two data of some sort. Was that 
the ECO2. Yeah, well, it, the, it had run through the full processing that Zero does to produce that 3D. Oh, it's from Zero. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you. It is from Chi Chuan Dong from the University of Arizona. He's going to talk about uh, the observations that any of the three his group uses to evaluate work. <laughs> All right, thank you for everybody. Yeah, so my name is uh, Xi Chen Dong it's from University of Arizona. Yes, my group has been working on the cloud since uh, has been working on the cloud in the last three decades, and mainly using the ground base and also satellite remote sensing, and also how to using this observation to evaluate wolf simulation and also climate model. Is a, in today's talk, I mainly is a focus on is MCS cloud and also precipitation from my former student. I will mention their name. Is the first I want to is briefly introduce is our 3D uh, products, MCS cloud products, and how to using this observation to uh, evaluate is a wolf, is well, model simulation, not wolf. And the second part is how to using it, how to evaluate the NOVA is wolf simulate MCS precipitation or grid plan under different tsunami pattern. And as we know, is a uh, either MCS or deep climatic cloud, they do have a uh, two component. And the first component is we call it, is a climatic core. They are mainly related to the precipitation. Well, it's uh, hard to use in the crew. And mainly using the precipitation part for climatic core part. And that's a really important for hydrology. A second part is related to the anvil part. And this is very important for the radiation. And they because they cover large area. And they are supposed to impact weather and also climate. Well, if, if we want to know is from here, from the satellite, we can see the large coverage from the space. However, they can, cannot get the vertical profile. To get this uh, vertical profile and also spatial coverage, we do need using the both satellite and also radar together. For example, satellite can see the cloud top from everything. And well, for the connection uh, under the cloud top, is this is a chromatic core and this is stratal form. There is a satellite is hardly identified where is chromatic core where a stratal form and also is a sick animal and what is ever. This is mainly measured by next right reader, not is observed by the ghost or is a satellite. And satellite can get is a scene series and everything just a cloud top. So when we get it both together, ground-based observation and also is a satellite, we can get spatial coverage and award vertical distribution. And we also know where is the precipitation on the chromatic core and also stratal form and other region is there is only cloud, no precipitation involved. Well, if you want to the, say the vertical distribution from the radar and it, this is a time series, this is a height, you can see this is a chromatic core. You can see cloud radar get the attenuation and we also get the stratal form region and also anvil, thin anvil and the thick anvil. Well, this is give you the vertical distribution from the radar. Well, so, if at least is always a classification from the our group by the former student Zhe Feng. He will present his result tomorrow. And red color represent the chromatic core. Green represent is a stratal form. Both they have a precipitation. And the yet uh, the blue represent is the animal part is contributed by the uh, ghost data. And this is a what we cut in this direction. Get the vertical distribution. How this stream is uh, moving. And that's why I uh, using my computer to say this is moving. This is uh, from the middle night, says how the stream, how the storm is coming from the, you know, the Texas moving to the arm HTP side. You can see how the st storm is moving horizontally and vertically. This is give you the basic idea what is storm look at, where is the chromatic core, where is the for, where is the ammo part. That is give you the basic idea how they looks like. And this is maybe give you some more information. And for today's talk, the first part is I want to briefly introduce a 4D data, uh, database and also really 
application. The main motivation for this study because the most uh, is a model underestimate is a stratiform region so for precipitation part. That's what happened, and that is necessary for us develop with some new as uh, my MCS microphysical property to evaluate or improve the model model simulate in the stretch form regions. And here I want to briefly talk about how we develop uh, the retrieve algorithm and uh, then is uh, how we apply this retrieve algorithm to improve the model simulation and uh, what is the statistical result we can get. And the developer algorithm is the first we based on the DOE ARM MC3 field campaign or ARM AGP set. That is uh, April to June. 2011, and basically for this study, we got this so complicated is ARM ground-based observation, including different radar, lidar, and the active and the passive room sensing, and also including the UND is a citation fly in the cloud, get a microphysical property, and also D, uh, NASA ENR2 is a carry on some remote sensor. That is we need God, and you can say this is how the system moving, and also is where is the aircraft is fly trajectory from cloud base to the top of 400, 800, uh, four, four kilometer to eight kilometer, get the vertical in, information. In this morning, I mentioned what is a cloud, what is the cloud definition? And what I want to say, what is the true cloud? What is the ground truth for cloud? And no matter it's from surface satellite, now I want to show is this 35 gigahertz reader can provide a vertical profile. This is the time and what is a melting band. And this is a, give us a vertical distribution. However, the cloud reader signal attenuate by the maximum dBZ. Well, because there is a only sensitive to the cloud. However, when we're using the three gigahertz reader, we can detect as a higher reader dBZ, 60, but they miss some is upper part cloud. So what is my point? If you want to get as a true cloud and also precipitation, we need uh, using the different is a sensor to get a ground truth value. Well, this is a one case from the MC3E, and this is a cloud we show May 20th and 2011, and this is a next by radar, and this is a time, this is an aircraft, okay? And the black line, and what do we say? This is from four kilometer to eight kilometer, and we got the size distribution from four kilometer to eight kilometer. What we see here, there is a, at the upper part, they mainly get higher ice particle concentration, but with a smaller particle. When they go to the lower part, they get a lower concentration, but it's a broader size distribution. We, based on this size distribution, get this, uh, some gamma distribution, then we based on this gamma distribution input you in or retrieve organ using the next right reader, we retrieve ice water content and also it's a based on ZE and ice water content relationship. And this is a what is it from aircraft. So that way we can retrieve what we call 4D MCS DCS microphysical property, for example. If we got a six kilometer ZE radar effectivity and a six kilometer, we can retrieve ice water content horizontally, 2D, and also it's a six kilometer. And when we got a change with the time and vertically, so that's we can get a 4D MCS property. This is what we call retrieval shows the different cloud microphysical structure, both horizontally and vertically, as they evolve with time in stratum ruin and the single animal part. And any times when we develop a new retrieval algorithm, people always wonder how accurate your retrieval. That's we need the aircraft in situ measurement to evaluate our result. And here we got the four profile up, down, up, down. And here we got this uh, four profile from five kilometer to 10 kilometer. And this is a black line is aircraft and black dot. And the blue is from retrieval from our next right. This is ice water content. This is a particle size. Well, this is just one case from statistical point of view during the whole field ex experiment. This is what we got average. This over retrieval, we can see over ice water content retrieval is about the 34 uncertainty compared to aircraft and the particle size is about the 19%. And this will give you the ballpark. Maybe individual case is got a little bit larger uncertainties. Well, after we get this is a retrieval result, how can we improve the model simulation? 
This is from G1 Fan is at the DOE GP, uh, PNL. They using bin model to simulate what is uh, ice water content and also green water content within stratoform region. And it's a black, red color is a model simulation and there's a green color is from over retrieval. What do we see from here is model or ice main ice water content at the upper part, you compare these two together. And under my ice, the low level ice water content at low level, you can see around here. And this is a compare over observation retrieval. And also ice re rain water content, we also compare is a do the retrieval. And you can see they are over estimate compare over retrieval. That is a, what is a, oh, it's a, or is a contribution to improve the model. And also what is the physical meaning from this study is the same plot of based on the model. Uh, here is uh, using the timeline. This is uh, what is from beginning storm at the end of storm. What is a climatic core precipitation and the straight form as word content and straight form precipitation. And just from here, as in the beginning, precipitation, climatic core contribute heavy precipitation around here. They are strong upper motion, bring a lot of ice and water in the climatic core. Then the second part, some ice particle is a detrain from the CC, are detrain to the SR regions. And this is the ice water content. That's why behind is a climatic core precipitation. And once this is the ice water particle move to the stratoform region, there is a large ice particle travel, survive long distance, fall into the dry layer, you can see here, and into melt into rain and form the stratoform precipitation. This is why there is a is a little bit later than the ice, uh, a stratoform ice water pass. This gives you the, what is the physical meaning for this uh, comparison. And for the statistical result based on three years, and this is a uh, spring, this is based on the summer. And what do we say here? Latitude, longitude, or northern, southern grid plan and northern grid plan. What do we say? More precipitation during summer than the spring, and the more precipitation over the east than the west, no matter spring and summer. And what is here? Same longitude, and here is a diurnal variation. This is a middle night from noon to midnight, and the midnight to the is a noon again. And what do we say? This is a precip is a MCS is a a frequency or currency, what do we want to say? MCS or currency and precipitation peak right after midnight, and this is a special characteristic MCS or great plan and different to the other regions or the world. So this is a very special is our great plan. And here is the summary for part one. And for the uh, database of MCS ice cloud property has been generated using nice right radar effectivity and aircraft divided particle size distribution and validated by aircraft in situ measurement. Three results are using to, these results are used to evaluate model simulation, where is uh, that we show is before, and also spatial variability and nocturnal peak MCS uh, precipitation are primarily driving by MCS or currency rather than precipitation intensity. So this is the end of the part one. And the second part is uh, supported by uh, NOVA research to operation program, where is the job is using our observation to evaluate NOVA NSS Wolf simulate precipitation or SCP and NGP again. And this is a more than eight years data and also it's a, a warm season. Okay, all right. And where is uh, using, we call this a self um, organized map to identify Synopic pattern and basically we got a six as type. And if you don't know exactly, and the basically upper part we call it is tropical cyclone and low pressure. And here is a lower part we call it is a subtropical ridge is a high pressure. And when we are is a talk about is here is type one is mainly polar jet stream cause upper level divergence and surface low is generated and the 
type two is sub uh, subsidence emergent is strong at its high center, but the weaker throughout is uh, other is regions. And what is uh, is uh, for type one mainly occur during the April and the May, but type two is a uh, based in a later summer. That is a different synonymic pattern happen. And also for the this is a observation and this is a wolf simulation. And what do we say here? Type is one is a precipitation higher than type two. That's for sure. You can see the mean value. And also for special pattern, type one, zonal gradients from west to the east. And type two is a meridional gradients from west and north to the south, uh, south to the north. And there is a model get a negative is uh, simulated. And here is we show the diurnal variation. The white color represents daytime and the green represents nighttime. And we got a uh, six type here. And class one is two. You can see there's black cut line represent observation. Is the red color represent the model or estimate? Is a blue represent the model under estimate? So that's what we say. For type one and four, when we get is a less or flat diurnal variation, both model is model great with observation very well. Okay, and when is we see the get a strong diurnal variation, and you can see there is a model is a, get is a big difference. What is the big difference? You can see that during the daytime they agree well, but the nighttime model finish very soon. That is a compare with the observation. That is a problem for the model simulation for strong diurnal variation. And the last slide before is a summary. And this is a from is a precipitation is a in total precipitation. And this is a coverage. And the red color represent the combined core. You can see is a represent as a white one, and the blue represent the stratiform precipitation. In here, what do we got here? Is a commodity core precipitation for the 10 time larger is right is a straight form, but the RA coverage is a straight form about four times is, is about is a commodity core. And basically, for this is a model simulation. And what do we say? Commodity core intensity coverage is a better simulated by is a model than is a straight form. And that's a summary for part one. Is a self-organized map work well for separation synopic pattern. Is that nice mean astrotropic cyclone versus subtropical high and the dominate precipitation? Look at the SR and the CR. And the wolf is a better match in overall is a chromatic core green intensity and coverage than SR straight from region and the better simulation in straight uh, astrotropic cycle run in subtropical range. That's all my talk and thank you for your attention. That's my group is, is a contribution for this group. Hopefully we can collaborate with this guy and you know this guy is right 10 years ago and uh, go to the AGO become famous and get his uh, cover page. And also this is my group is at Arizona as so this is our unit. My group is the one to contribute for this study. Thank you for your attention. Back for a few questions. Yes. Yeah, um, I was curious about the observing system uh, you used. I might have missed it, but you're using NEXRAD. That's a S band 10 centimeter wavelength type measurement. Um, not too sensitive to probably the ice crystal size microphysics of the cloud, but maybe sensitive to more of the aggregates. Mm -hmm. um, the comparison you did with the um, model versus observations and showing the kind of the biases um, where I think the model was overestimating um, upper and maybe underestimating in the lower part. Yeah, this one. That's a totally different. It's the model or estimate okay. uh, upper part is yeah. other eyes. Yeah, so the model, saying that the model overestimates ice, um, is it partially because the model is actually, maybe that ice really is there, but the S-band just can't see it because it's not big enough particles for it to detect, or maybe I'm just missing. Well, well it's, that's a good point. It's, we, we thought about is a problem, and we are is a, try to say, that's it's a, we, if we don't trust our is a retrieval, that's what we thought about. And you can see, this is how the aircraft in situ measurement. And where is basically is a 
when we develop a retrial algorithm, we are uh, trying to use the aircraft centimeter. And what we say is uh, you can see the particle size is really large. And you can see this is about is, uh, what is uh, four millimeter. Okay, this is large. And for, I'm pretty sure smaller particle is, that's why I cannot say it, but it's where it's get is a large ice particle is mainly get melt and get contribute precipitation. And that is a, maybe can partially answer your questions. Yeah, thanks. I have a question related to when you classify glasses based on SOM, did you explore the correlated between the classes, like for example, class three and class five, do they are correlated in some way? Because SOM reserved the spatial of the data. So somehow the, the class will be, for example, that the class two will be maybe closer to class three or <laughs> yeah. you we, see that pattern? Right, it's weird, it's a try to, in the beginning, is um, this is my first PhD student, Aaron Kennedy, he generated 24, class. I said, that's uh, too much. And Ryan is, uh, we are classified. What is the similarity? And that is a uh, six is a minimum is uh, we can provide. They are one and two. They do have a similarity, but uh, they do have a different. Yeah. Um, and we are, if we are want to generalize what is going on, they are all these related to astrotropical cycle. And this is also la last one related to the subtropical range. That is a uh, that is the precipitation different and the model performance also different. I mean, the, the six class already regrouped from the 20. Right, 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 right. Mesoscale models and cloud, even cloud resolved models have struggled with representing strata form precip for a very mm -hmm. long time. Does this provide any guidance on what's What's wrong? Is it not training ice crystals properly? Are there issues with the fall speed and depositional growth? Or like, how can we use this to help? Well, that is a, that's a good question. Actually, I'm mo not a modeler. It's my job is to collaborate with the modeler. You can see we have a lot of, the, of collaboration with the modeler and how is a model is a, get such a problem we still discuss. And this is a, one is a case you, you, you say what's going on here. And model is least supposed to be, is the ice particle supposed to be, is based on the oil retrieval, or also aircraft. They get this to be small ice particle and higher concentration, then start to melt through the collision collision process, get a large ice particle before fell to the melting band. That is a theoretically or oil retrieval, what is aircraft data? It should be, should be, but the model get a totally opposite. That is what we found in the compare with a bin model. This is a really high is a resolution spin model. Is a, we can work on with other mo other modeler to work on something together. We do get is a more and is a is a ten years or thirteen years data over the continental U.S. and we can provide this information for modeler to work on together especially work on the with the DOE is uh, some modelers. DOD, yeah. Okay, yeah, let's thank our speaker. So the next thing on our schedule is a panel discussion. Um, our excellent AV team, support team, is gonna set up a table here in the front for our panel members. Um, so, we're just gonna sit tight for the next few minutes while they get set up. Ray Lee, uh, well, there is the panel first, right? Uh, over on the right here is Ray Lee. He's a uh, complete miracle. Um, he works for uh, model verification. Hey, you, know, you saw all the talks this morning, so I'll just say these <laughs> Ray Lee, uh, Steve Fiorino, Jacqueline Schmidt, and Kevin Kuchak. So they're all from the operational community. And uh, you know, well, uh, we have three apps uh, or two apps and the Air Force assistants for the quarter. Great miracle. Uh, I'll, I'll just shut up and let <laughs> Ray, Ray, this was Ray's idea, actually. So, Ray, you have a tough start somewhere. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Uh, I'll, I'll push a little bit of the blame back on Jason. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I did my you know, registration, and five minutes later, Hey, I saw you see you didn't select an abstract. Are you not going to give a speech? I was like, 
I thought we were going to have a panel discussion. <laughs> that is really good. Yeah. And that's kind of how this came about. Um, for those of you that saw my presentation this morning, I'm glad I followed Evan because he got to do a lot of the cloud stuff because mine had a grand total of one slide about clouds, I think. <laughs> um, kind of the reason I was thinking a panel discussion would be a really good idea in this case was along the lines of that for fleet numerical in our case we get all of our stuff pretty much from nrl so we don't really do much development at all on our side any development that we're doing is very very limited to can we make the model run faster instead of can we tell how good the model is or can we make the model that all comes from nrl <laughs> so in order to have nrl and they work very closely with us so they have a good understanding of what's needed from the operational sense but in order to help them figure out where to be going with the research concepts to improve the operations i was thinking it might be a good idea for the operators up here to kind of be almost kind of pulled with questions from you guys of where you think from based on what we were presenting today of that there's opportunities for lots of improvements, lots of things that maybe there hasn't been actually any effort put into, or maybe that the research is going down a path that may or not may or may not actually be able to be used in an operational sense. So that's kind of what I was thinking with this panel discussion. I don't know if you guys think that that's you know, a worthwhile aspect or if there's something else we should also look at trying to add. But I'll stop at this point and see if you guys have anything else you want to start with. Uh, just as definitely the oldest guy here um, is the <laughs> just going back on the operational side. I'm not very operational now, but I was once um, like like Air Force weather officer uh, Major King back there and Jacqueline's husband uh, Major Schmidt uh, is back during Desert Storm 22 years ago. Actually, did provide forecasts, and but that was for aviation. And I will tell you that even way back then, the point display model, anybody, anybody, um, it actually provided very good wind forecasts. And guess what? The operators didn't use it. <laughs> and they were dropping dumb bombs from 40,000 feet. And they were wondering why they missed. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's some of the operational experience, but that was done for aviation. So one of the things that I think is really changing, especially from an operational standpoint, is we don't just make forecasts and provide now casts and weather effects, uh, you know, on, on weapon systems just for aviation anymore. And directed energy is a classic example of that. Uh, for high energy lasers, it's slightly different. And for high power microwaves, you need a, another unique set of, of effects. And it turns out that I believe, and one of the things we're trying to do at AFT, and and this community can help is we take measurements of pressure, temperature, humidity, and wind really well in lots of different places. Um, we also do some visibility. We can do better. And we would help out these other communities if we did a couple of other things with our observations. And then our numerical models would do a wonderful job of forecasting them. Because one of the reasons why we do a pretty good job with pressure, temperature, humidity, and wind is we take lots of observations. Um, and we don't do as well with some of the other parameters like aerosols because, well, we don't take as many observations. Why don't we measure particle counts and not just air pollution particle counts, not the stuff from 300 nanometers to 10 microns, but also the stuff from five nanometers up to two and a half microns. And if we do that, we can make the calculations like you saw at any way um, with just a set of optical properties that we validate. Uh, additionally, for DE anyway, and I won't talk any more about it. We need optical turbulence. And there are ways to measure that for put that in the model. So uh, I, I was hoping that we could maybe you guys have some questions on that. We might be able to answer that. The other thing is um workforce development. And so we need more people who who understand atmospheric effects, not just make weather forecasts. And we need them in the DOD, we need them in the civilian world. And that's one of the things we're trying to do at the Air Force Institute of Technology, and so is the Naval Coast Guard mm -hmm. School. Um, so we, we like to take our interns and tell them, we can get you a clearance and we can get you a weapon system to work on. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> please, stay with us. So um, that, that kind of thing, too. If you're interested in that, if you're looking for ways, you know, just have questions on it. So I think I've talked enough. So 
But Jacqueline is a classic case. If I could get her husband to get stationed back at Ray Patterson, uh, we'll turn her into uh, a graduate student at this well. Kevin, Jacqueline, sorry, I'm done. <laughs> I don't have much more to add. <laughs> Covered, so I'll pass it over to you. Sure. So, so I agree. Um, this is a, an opportunity, I think, for for those of you who are doing research to get a perspective from operations. I think that's that's one of the things that I certainly would like to spend this time on. I'm very interested just in the work that I've been doing in recent years. Of like for for a long time, it seemed like we, like the world I was in, were the ones that cared about clouds. There wasn't really a whole lot else, and now it seems like it's just kind of exploding. And so. This is the time ground floor like to get together and, and sync up right and to make sure that we are synergistically working together um, to move things forward and not just working in pockets you know doing doing sometimes a lot of the same work um, and then from my perspective one of the, the valuable things is like there's there's a lot of science that, that gets done where it's like hey we showed that we can predict something better or we understand something better but that doesn't get you anywhere close to getting into operations. There's a lot of things that have to be done to get things into operations that are just like pragmatic things, you know, the, the you know, making sure that you've got the databases and then those sorts of things. And so that's another perspective that I can help bring to the table is to explain, like, in order for this to actually get all the way to the finish line, here's the other things you got to think about, which are not necessarily pure research things, but are things to consider in terms of how you're going about your work. That, that. I know we were talking about that this morning. You were saying that communicating that to the frontline operators and then and then having that two-way communication is one of the biggest things that we're missing right now. Yeah, I can I can speak a little bit more to that. And that's where like I'm up here as an operator. Um, but when I talk to the users, they look at me as more like a researcher because I'm I'm kind of in the middle of, the, of those two things, right? And that's that's my job, I feel like, is to bridge that that valley. Um I, I would say that the meteorological community, the research world, and we have just amazing progress over the course of, of my life, for sure, and before. Not a lot of that's getting into the decision processes, because the decision makers aren't taking advantage of it. Maybe they don't know that there's advances in there, and I can I can tell an anecdote or two on this. In my, my, I guess my favorite one, favorite is maybe the wrong word, is the <laughs> Hurricane Michael that hit Tyndall, where they had billion-dollar aircraft down for maintenance in a hurricane-prone region in October. It's like we give them a perfect prediction that that hurricane was going to come 10 days ahead of time and nothing they could do about it because those aircraft are down for maintenance. And, and I guess maybe they could have gotten a semi or something with that much lead time and, you know, took them out of there. Um, but but who is doing the work to integrate all of this information properly into decision processes? I just don't see it happening in a lot of places. I know the Weather Service with their Weather Ready Nation concepts is trying to do some of that from like an emergency management point of view. I don't see anybody doing that in the DOD, and I could be wrong about that. I obviously don't see everything, um, but I, I think we could use a lot more of that where people sit down with a with the non-scientist decision makers and say, um, you know, here's what the technology can do. Here's what we can give you at these certain lead times based on you know the, the, the capabilities that we have and work with them to, to build a process for them to say like, okay, at day five for a hurricane approach, you know, the 10% probability of, of, of happening, like these are the steps that we take. Um, that way they don't get behind, you know, on, on those things when they happen. And then, oh, by the way, if you, you know, are in hurricane prone regions, you know, these are the things that you should never do. Um, the other anecdote I have at, off at where I come from is that they had a very high value uh, aircraft um, that they would either fly out when severe weather was, was threatening, which is a big expense. And then in Nebraska, severe weather threatens for several months of the year quite frequently. The other option was to put it in a hangar, but the hangar wasn't quite big enough, so the tail stuck out. And guess what happened when the tornado hit? Like it wasn't a real all that big of a tornado, but it damaged the tail because it was sticking out of the, of the thing. And it's just like, again, yeah, who was in that process to make that decision that that was a, a good idea? People in this community need to somehow get into that form. So that was kind of what we were talking about earlier. <laughs> Is that because there's a lack of trust from the decision making the decision makers that they don't still believe that the models are correct no it's it's a hundred percent that they have their mind on everything else they're doing because weather is kind of an afterthought right and and, and you can think about it in your own life you know sometimes that it catches you off guard even though you're in a person who does weather right like people just don't really think about it until it's like oh i heard there's a storm coming and then they start because they haven't thought about it right so that's where my big push in the air force and i'll, I'll move to this group too is that we can't, as weather people, we can't expect that the people are going to come to us and ask for help. Some, sometimes they will, like the people that launch rockets, like they understand how much weather affects them and they absolutely come and ask for help. But a lot of places where at Tyndall Air Force Base and the year before Michael, I bet they weren't thinking about this at all. 
right? And because it how how long it had been since a hurricane had hit them? Probably a long time. And so unless you have a really you know savvy leadership that really evaluates all the different risks and threats, somehow I think the weather people have to go knock on doors and say like, hey, you know, we're here to help you figure out how to best you know use environmental information to make sure that your operations and processes go well. That truly is the way it is for the Navy too. Like some of the Navy's training programs, we, hey, Fenmock, can you provide us this data? Why do you want this data? It's sunny, it's 75 degrees. Don't you want to train with actual weather? No, we don't want to have our training schedule disrupted. Just give us this data. <laughs> You're training your METOC professionals on no METOC. Like what, what are you training them? Like, because it really goes down kind of what I was mentioning with the stoplight idea. And as soon as I mentioned the word stoplight, I saw you smile this morning, right? Right. <laughs> if weather gets involved in any decision making, it's literally green, yellow, red. That's the extent. And trying to properly, yes, for that Hurricane Michael case, you probably could have said yellow, there's a chance of hurricanes. But what that actually gets represented to, to a senior leader is, well, I can mitigate this sort of thing. And they'll just go along, and then you end up with billion dollar aircraft caught in a category five hurricane. So there's there's a lot of cases where even if weather is actually considered, it's considered very much as the afterthought of the oh we'll throw it in there, but we don't want it to mess up anything. Right, and it's not until it starts messing things up that they start to think about what they should do, and then they're behind they're behind the loop. Right? Exactly. <laughs> I've been hearing this for as long as I've been in the Navy. You know, they they say we're the all weather Navy. We we don't need any weather information. Yeah, and then they get hit by something. So how do we get through them saying, well, this this is important? Uh, how do how do we get people to listen? Well, you have to bring up examples. Yeah. And so you know, one one of the classic examples that helped a lot was uh, with in two thousand three when we went into Iraq for Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, there was the big pause for the dust storm that was completely, you know, unanticipated. Didn't know what to do, and it changed kind of the flow of things. So it was like, hey, we need to work this into our war game. But for example, war gaming is something where it's kind of like B Y O W, bring your own weather or your own we weapon system. And the weather in those war games is not coordinated. And this is where, again, numerical weather prediction is fantastic. Because it can give you a global, not just for the theater, but how everything ties together. And, and so as a community, we want to infuse not just into operations, but also into that operational simulations and war game and make sure it's across the spectrum, too, so that, you know, you're doing your air tasking order planning, uh, not just for the kinetic weapons, but for the other weapons as well. And the weather days in advance, which we can give you an idea helps tell you, is that going to be a good mix or a bad mix based on those kind of probabilities I, I tried to show. I know it's a blank screen right now, but just imagine <laughs> you know, those histograms. Um, but, you know, if you if, if a planner has that, and, and I had an opportunity to work with some of these guys, it's, it's, there's always these, generally in the Air Force, it's pilots who uh, get the opportunity to work in the guidance apportionment targeting shop. And they plan days in advance. And back, you know, 20, 25 years ago, the only question they'd ask me is, when sunrise, sunset? Because I need to know thermal crossover. Right? You know, that's, that's, right. It's like, there's so much more you need to know. And, and so, you know, and I try to give that to them. So you're, you're asking the question, how do we get involved? We, we, we have to go in and show them. We can improve the situational awareness, you know, months in advance, days in advance, seconds and minutes in advance. Um, so that you understand how things are going to work, because a lot of times, you know, you don't know if your system worked. Like with lasers, it, you don't get a catastrophic boom. Sometimes you just want to blind the candle. So you got to know in advance, I'm only going to need to dwell a second, and then I move on to the next target. That thing may still be flying, but it's not working. And when you start telling the, the, the operators that, they, they change their tune a little bit. And then you got to work on it some more. <laughs> I think I saw a hand earlier yeah. also. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm just curious. I, I know for weatherman from Air Force and Navy, what is your job to get this prediction, whatever, to report to the officer, hey, hurricane coming, you guys need to move airplane or warship, whatever. 
I know it's moving this airplane to different airport cost a lot of money. However, if th this officer did not listen, do not listen to you, get a severe damage, who will be responsible for that damage? The reason I asked more than 10 years ago, when we are in the DOE meeting and we heard is a B2, is, is a air, is pilot jump off the B2, right? It's a get this B2 crash. We talk about one B2 is a one billion. It's almost all over yeah. whole the scientists study climate change for one billion. They, this guy just jump out, right? So all scientists, <laughs> money stops. So somebody, somehow, when your report is an officer, like it's, hey, I don't care about it's get damage. Who will be responsible for it, right? Yeah, this this is a complex issue, and others in the DoD yeah. can see it. We've, we've always made, you know, I, I don't want to talk too much about the history of like why we've been deterministic, and we still largely are, um, and 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 how we produce, how we put information out. Because ultimately, and this goes back to the thing I've been talking about of like the weather community should be giving risk information, mm -hmm. not not telling them that it is or isn't going to happen. You should be giving them risk information, and, and then they need to have processes in place that say, how do I deal with this risk? They do that with everything else they do. They do operational risk management, as it's called. And you know, when you're talking about like, is somebody going to shoot a missile at me? Like they do all sorts of that. But with the weather, it becomes very black and white. And it becomes very much like, hey, weather forecaster, you got to tell me. And if you get it wrong, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely not how it is supposed to be. It should be communicated as a, a risk like any other. And then the commanding officer who assesses all of the risks and all of the purpose of the mission then owns whatever you know comes out of that. But they like to push that off to the to the forecasters because, and again, in weather, I feel like we've made this mistake of, well, we've told them yes, no forecasts. So they they sort of go off of that. It's like, well, you said it was 100% chance. You, know, you said, yes, the mission was fine, and then it didn't happen. Well, then it does become your fault because you didn't communicate to them that that wasn't actually it, that there was a you know, spectrum of possibilities. But um, I don't know how that's all shake. I mean, we've been pushing for a long time to do ensembles and to do RM. It hasn't really bled into everything. It's bled into some things. Again, that what I call the power users, again, like the rocket launch people, like they, that's how they do it because they know that if they don't do it that way, it's not going to work. So, yeah. So uh, I'll give you my perspective as, as an Air Force weather officer and briefing commanders. Mm -hmm. So whenever you get a forecast and you tell a commander, they don't want to hear, well, there's a 30% chance and they, they think you're tap dancing around the issue. Mm -hmm. They need to know based off of your expertise, if you think it's going to happen. So, and that's kind of a difficult thing because you, you're, from your perspective, kind of thinking as, as like a more of the model perspective, like, oh, well, we need to have that probability. But when you're, those are the grindstone and you're standing in front of your commander and going, yes, sir, I think it's going to happen. I need, you need to have your KC-135s at the other base so they can take off so they can deal with the operations over Libya. Right. So they, they, they need that sort of concrete it's, 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 and it's fine that they need it, but if the science doesn't have it, then you're just sure. hurting yourself. But you're that's, lying but to that's, yourselves. Yeah, but that's that's the the job of the forecaster is to provide that expertise information. So that's kind of why they're there. It's the integration piece of Air Force weather, right? So yeah. you're supposed to be integrated with your units, so you can tell your commander, hey, based on my expertise and the forecast that I'm providing you, this is this is my recommendation. Right. And so so I think it, it is a little bit of a fine line. Yeah. But when you're when when commanders have a bunch of decisions that they have to make, you're just one extra thing. And now it says weather people, we tend to be like, well, weather is important. Believe me, talk, you know, and, but you got to go over there and tell them, hey, this is my recommendation. And they take that into consideration and they make their, they make their decision. But the commanders, they, they have the burden of, of, of that decision. So you have to do your best job to, to provide the best information that you have based off your expertise. Right. So you can see the philosophical debate just among yep. people here, yeah. here in yeah. the Air Force, right? Because because I say that that is absolutely the wrong approach. It is wrong for the commanders to do that. And it is the and they own any any negative aspect of that should be on them and not pushed onto the briefer who they forced into making a yes, no decision when that's not what the information that they had. Now, now all that said, what I do agree with is that I I personally believe that, that weather forecaster's responsibility is to figure out with a 30% chance of X, what my commander ought to do. And so that means they're talking to all the other people in the mission space about, hey, when the weather's gonna be like this, what should we do? When the weather's like that, what should we do? Because it is not the commander's job to have to piece that together. That's his staff's job, right? But when it comes down to like, the weather guy just decides yes or no, we're doing the mission today based on what is basically a guess in a lot of instances, I just can't sign up to that as being a proper way to do business. I mean, I'm fighting against it. Mission specific thresholds. 
Yeah, and, and, and the responsibility for that largely lies, again, I say on the weather forecaster to talk to the mission people and, and about how the weather affects their their, their equipment and to, to go through all of that. And then they can say, okay, I got a 70% chance of that today. I know from talking to everybody else that that means we should not go. And then they can say to the commander, hey, the weather's bad today, not go. So, so it's kind well, of the same with what yeah, you're saying. Well, but... you're, you're ultimately making a recommendation based on the information that you have, right? right? You're not saying, sir, you are not flying today because you don't say that as a weather person. You say, right. my recommendation is that based off the XYZ, yeah. there's this probability of, of adverse weather or you're going you're gonna to encounter severe turbulence during your test mission. You probably don't want to fly. So right. that's my recommendation. Right. Ultimately, the, the, the decision for the operation is it's only commander. And, and, Absolutely. and I found that it helps if, if you're educated enough that you know enough about, you know, the, the weapon systems that you can offer backup plans, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the way I saw it when I was a weather officer and back when I was like a lieutenant and the first three letters of my rank spelled lie, yeah. and that's why I was a weather officer. <laughs> <laughs> will happen to you again when you get promoted to lieutenant colonel, I will be a liar again. Uh, so anyway, the bottom line is that is, is you give them a forecast and, you know, that that's bad. I don't want to hear that. I can't do what I want to do. And it's like, but what you need to do is is what's your alternative? What else could you do with that weather to at least get something out of that, yeah. right? Uh, same with climate change. We're not going to change it back. We need to adapt to what's happening, right? And it's the same thing with weather. So that's where I was getting out that guidance of horsemen targeting shop is, guys, look at what we're saying here based on expected performance. This is a Winchester day. Forget your lasers on this one, okay? It's all kinetic. Yep. But no, on some other days, no, 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 your, your directed energy systems might be your solution. They're a lot cheaper. Save your, your very expensive JDAMs for the really bad weather, right? And so you got to have that kind of education. That's why I say that workforce development is extremely important. I want to bring back these weather officers and others who can who can help offer these kind of educated decisions and not just depend on training because training is what you do with a child, teach it to use a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> what you do with graduate education is that, sorry for that. The line of yeah, and, and a lot of what you just said is kind of what I was talking about before, like that needs to happen way more than it currently happens to have yeah. those educated conversations about just as you went through, like you have options, yes. and the weather is how the weather impacts those options. Nobody does that. And well, I don't say nobody does that. A lot yeah. of people don't. Do that. Well, the other point to all of that is, is you have the rank structure. Sometimes, like you'll have junior enlisted sailors going up and briefing <laughs> ship captains because the officer or the chief is too busy dealing with some other situation. Dark cloud. So, trying to convince like a nineteen or twenty year old that's been in working with meteorology for 18 months to tell the captain of a ship, no, sir, you have to turn the ship. That's pretty much impossible. And then all of a sudden, the ship could all of a sudden find itself unable to complete the mission because it's sailed off into where the wind's not strong enough for them to launch aircraft. See, now the aircraft carrier can't launch the aircraft or the aircraft can't be loaded with enough weapons to complete the mission. So you have the rank structure versus in a more civilian setting, you could have some junior person. It's, should we really be doing that and actually really be able to feel OK with questioning it? They're not going to say, no, you have to do this, but they'll be willing to question that. And you don't get that so much in the military because of the rank structure. Uh, I see a couple different hands. Uh, uh, one thing I, I was I was curious about in this line of, of decision making and, and I guess kind of deterministic and things and options, how, how many I guess decision points are there in the lead up to a particular weather event? I mean, are, are we made, are there opportunities to like hedge or increase readiness? Basically, have people like ready to fly the planes to another base, but not necessarily going ahead and flying if if you think it's only a like a twenty percent chance, but it, but it might look bad. Is that an option in this? And what what kind of guidance would, like, I guess from the maybe research side or development side, what kind of gui guidance would help support those kinds of conversations? Well, in terms of tropical storms and aircraft that are flyable, they do pay heed to that, and they do an excellent job of clearing out aircraft to places like Ray Matters. Uh, what Evan was talking about was what they don't do a good job with is, um, is worrying about, hey, when a plane goes hard broke in maintenance power lines, right? And it's gonna be there for a while because we can't move it. Um, you know, 
what do we do? What, what's the planning ahead? This plane's hard broke. It's on the Gulf Coast. It's we're moving into August and September. We need to figure out a way to either really protect this kind of thing or take the expense to move it out of here if we really think it's something we, we might not want to lose. That's the part that they're not doing, mm -hmm. right? Is if it's hard, we're going to ignore that. And so that's what we're trying to get out there then. Yeah. And some of the hard stuff that ends up being super expensive, we, we got to take action. Uh, I have a question that what do you thinking about the potential that we have a machine learning system that do the decision making for us? Okay, give it based on the, the TC condition, based on the cloud condition, based on a little bit of everything put together, the ocean condition and the machine learning, the, the expert of field put the information in the machine and then machine learning will make a decision. Okay, this is red, don't go yellow, green, or something that mitigated is a middle demand. You that absolutely could do that. And you know what? They might believe it more than the people. That would, that would, not, that would, so, you know, that, that would really give the, the, the weather person briefing the commanding officer. Yeah, yeah, I right. think this would be a potential for us because we need something that that's strategic is one way. Because maybe you were breathing differently. You breathing differently. And maybe each of us have a human bias. Breathing, right? Yeah, different <laughs> too. So each of us have a, a human bias and, you know, trust each but then when is the machine learning or a model say something, it is black and white. So yes or no, and we also can collect it as a history data. So, okay, this red, you still go, mm -mm. or something like that. It's, we need a middleman that, that could solve the problem in, in, a, in a generalized way. Could, could we come up with something like that? No, the, pro the problem is that what, what is yellow and what is red is has to be figured out. And that's the part that's not generally happening. Like like you said, if there's a hurricane coming, they've, they've usually thought that through because that's, but but these other more nuanced things, somebody's got to figure out and say like, we need this much lead time for this action. We need this much lead time for that action. So it needs to go yellow at this percentage and needs to go red. Like like what you're saying totally makes sense as long as you have all those business rules and that's the part we're missing. Yeah, I think we can do like red with the probability of the red and then with the timing leading. And so we, all of we can, you do, we can yeah. add all the things is, and it is a potential for machine learning because, because it can handle a large data set and it could moving around. And then you can have it after this view, you can have a, some kind of like a weather burden awareness campaign so that we just teach them one structure and it is a middle main and right in the middle so that can communicate the weather person or more of the, you know, more thing that we need to put in the decision and the captain that are ship. So give, give them a leverage too, so they don't have to think too much. <laughs> so so it, it seems like this would be a great uh, NCAR, NOAA, UCAR study that could then help operationally yes. uh, weather folks everywhere. Yeah, yeah we just, also have to be up at the relatively extreme events though, an aircraft getting caught in a, in a weak thunderstorm of just rain, who cares? An aircraft getting caught in a severe hailstorm with softball sized hail, that's going to do damage. Yes. You could leave the aircraft on the ground. You don't even necessarily have to put it in a hangar if it's just, you know, garden variety thunderstorm. If it's going to be a severe hailstorm, you don't want that aircraft outside. You want it at least in a hangar, if not off, off, off the airport. Yeah, and I think so, that's the perfect solution for us. We have a full room with the scientists because we could put all of our knowledge together and make it something that can standardize and then we'll be like let's work for us and let's work for the ship and then more safe for everybody history and i think the history is a time and play to change the history and it's like it's making everything easier and it's so also make everything find a part it's like a lego we can play lego but where to start the four of you here where we can start <laughs> let's have a drink <laughs> we'll talk about that I think that's a complex situation you have to think about it though because you know, your thresholds are going to vary by mission by location by even commander preference and you're yes, one and guy that's going to be willing to do things more risky I, I think that it, it's a neat idea but it has to be highly adaptable so yes. there, are, there are people who I mean we've worked with at MDS who are expertise in management decision making systems and we're able to you know Say like you have like a like I say a distribution of a weather event and there's there's tails of the distribution 
and the impact if you term this in terms of value you know cost loss to or damage you know that doesn't necessarily scare scale linearly with your you know your distribution of your you know temperature anomalies or wind speed anomalies if you start to break stuff you know that value cost can go up quite you know rapidly but there are people who are who do this for a living who are you know decision systems you know, experts and so that's just you know right. bringing into you know another yeah. collaboration between meteorologists who you know once it starts to get in this area like engineering decision uh theory and you know management decision making processes it's out of our area of expertise but yeah. need to collaborate with those people so that that information can get to as you said the um the captain of the ship who has to make the go no to the decision based on the base available information and then information not not might not all be weather information Actually, all of the petroleum company have that they call it cost function. So they will compare you based on the traffic, based on the weather, based on how far the truck, so that the truck has to follow an exact route to different gas stations. <laughs> and, and actually, it's happened for at least 10 years ago. It, it started build a very, very simple, but now it's, it's more high, high tech now. But it could be done, but with weather, I think is we need uh, a tons of people to move the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I I hope that we can start somewhere. And please move the Rockies to along the U.S. Canadian border. And <laughs> stop all the smoke and the cold air. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. <laughs> Part of that mountain. Part of it, though, is is that when you, when you talk when you're talking about force protection type issues of let's make sure the plane's not going to get caught in a hurricane that's where those sorts of programs come in but yes. the other aspect that's obviously unique to the military is, is you also have to meet mission if you've got to put a bomb on a target at a certain time because that's when the target's going to be available that weather concern you've got to figure out the way the best way to mitigate the, that weather to the mission if it's even possible to mitigate <laughs> And, and right now, I think we cannot make a one general, you know, one size fit all model, but we can see that what is the, the, the missing, what is the situation that we can create a prototype, that a prototype that, that we can have a mitigate machine learning to do something and train them something, because it will take about five years to get it going. So you had a model view and then you talk to people and it's, it would be a middleman and then you had to raise an awareness and you need to send out the uh, survey to see that how the user thing about is how we can gain trust is 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 a long game but but where to start is like we what is you think what is missing what is the situation that we can try to build a small level it's a prototype that, that's what I my my question is no, and, and my, that, my no, that's piece. that's exactly right. You got to build a prototype. We're being asked to do that with uh, computer systems that incorporate sensors and numerical weather prediction into a little laptop that you can take out into a field, say, a Pacific Island, and yes. uh, you can provide instantaneous uh, assessments of how a laser weapon system will perform in that particular Pacific Island. That yes. is a big push, and the and the words they're using are. Don't worry about making that prototype perfect at this point. Go early, go ugly with your capability. All right. So, and and what we then need is an opportunity where it it doesn't have to actually work. Patriot Systems, Desert Storm is a classic example. Yes. It didn't really work, but everybody thought they did. And guess what? We spent a lot of money actually making systems that now do work, but we needed that lucky event. And so yes. I, I don't know how you plan for that. But if you at least position yourself to be ready with your prototype, yes. uh, you're ready to take advantage of it. Yeah. So I, I just think, you know, if we can think about any bit of us, think about prototype that how we can make it as a first idea to, to get it going. Because other things do it, like, you know, petroleum company do it, you know, like even people build hospital build. Uh, school, they will look at everything around them and in the weather and the things, you know, to the cost function, to the way to build a hospital. So they, there's the system out there. There's a lot of things that could take multiple in information and put it in a cost function and help us to make the decision already. But the thing at the bottleneck is that how can we make it happen? How can we bring the, the um, 
the different expertise of the field together and how can we convince our user like, okay, just listen to it, try it, give it a try. <laughs> I think that does, that's what I think. I think it's, that's what <clears throat> bothered me too because we could do a lot more, but I don't know where to start. Sounds like the, it's something you brought things together. <laughs> who who makes the rules? <laughs> How do we know? Sometimes the operators don't even know what the rules are. Uh, how would we go about talking to someone? Is is this something the operators have to come to us about, or is this? Yeah, like can you send me to somebody to talk to? Like, hey, yeah. You know, know? What's interesting is there are pockets in the in the in the DoD and and. You know, in the whole infrastructure of the U.S., where we do this right, um, but they're only pockets. <laughs> <laughs> and and unfortunately, what's important is we do need to make sure that the people who help in those pockets that are doing it right uh, have the background and the education, the experience to be able to do it right there. And so that's one of the reasons why we do need to keep trying to be able to make sure we bring it to the wider set of operations as well. Um, and and so that th there's enough of the developed workforce that can support those pockets where it's extremely important we do it right. Yeah, and I think that one thing that like for us as scientists we could improve more is that is, is that in our science com communication too that that somehow that we could communicate science as part of the decision. I know there's been a question kind yeah, of in the back right. corner waiting oh, for a while. Sorry, well, yeah, I didn't want to. I'm sorry. No, no, um, <clears throat> um, appreciate discussion of the finer points of military culture. I was curious, I know earlier we discussed cloud definitions specifically, and I'd be interested to hear from the panel, you know, between yourselves, what you guys think. How should we be defining clouds? Um, and it seems like there's been some discussion specifically on particulate size densities as a more gener generic way of, of talking about what we currently call mm -hmm. clouds. And then from whatever you guys think we should define them as, do we have the sensors in place to produce OBS relevant to that paradigm? I'll jump in on that. Um, I, I know I, I put stomp this a fair amount of mine. Um, I think what I would say is that whatever context you're working in, just be clear about the context that you're working in. So like stop calling it cloud because your cloud's not the same as his cloud as her cloud define it, right? And then that way, when somebody's looking at that work and say, oh, I see that you are working in the visible spectrum for your problem, and then they can take that for what it's worth for their problem, whether it is or isn't a part of it. I don't know that there's necessarily a need to, to dictate a common thing for everybody. I think it's just more about being transparent with how people are defining um, what they're doing. So uh, real quick, I want to give an opinion on that is, is that obviously it's in the eye of the beholder and that's what we do, not just with clouds, but also with visibility, for example. It's what people see in the visible part of the spectrum, 550 nanometers, right? You know, somewhere right around there. And um, but that's not really quantifying it. That's, that's a bad sensor. So what I'm getting at is, I don't know if it's super important that we exactly define a cloud. I do want to get back to what you said, which is, we need sensors that measure what's actually going to affect all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum to some part. And that's why we need to measure the particulates out there so that we can then, I can tell you what the visibility is, even if it's 101.5 kilometers, right? Um, and not just be, oh, uh, 10 statute miles. And oh, if I were in Europe, that'd be stack of nines. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, so uh, it just, so that way we're quantifying. And it's the same thing with clouds. Uh, we can use even you know our different sensors in space to help us say microphysically what's happening there and then that's what we put into the models and then then we take care of it in any wavelength of interest if we're looking at extinction or in terms of what it's going to do microphysically to produce weather so it, I, i'm thinking that worrying so much about exactly defining clouds beyond what's in the glossary right now uh, may may be not necessarily the way we need to go. It's more about making sure we sense the minimum amount we need to, to really understand what's going on with the atmosphere. So I think there was a question yeah. in yeah. further in the back yeah. first. 
follow up on, on Shwen. So question about artificial intelligence, machine learning. So when you started answering Shwen, I was a little surprised because you guys seemed all very enthusiastic about using an AI ML so, uh, method. So my question is, if we in this room give you a, uh, an algorithm for a, mach a new machine learning for something that you're predicting and could replace one of your existing tool. So question number one, would you ask different questions than if it was an NWP or DA or something like that? Or, or would, would, there, would there be things that you want, want to know because it's AI ML? And then the second question is, how about your stakeholders? Do you need to do something special to tell them that, yeah, you can use this AI ML? Yeah, so I, first, what I liked anyway, and I don't know <laughs> the rest of the panel is, yeah. is just being able to say, hey, you know, here's my decision and AI helped me make that decision might make, you know, yeah. give more impact to what I'm telling. That, that's what I like, right? Now, as for what I would ask differently, for me, it's still, you know, do do I think if I'm going to like the AO model myself, is do I think it covered the physics enough, or do I think it missed certain things? Tried to apply something where the physics is right here, but not right here, and uh, you know, those are the questions I would ask. I, I don't know if that's the other, and I don't know if my customer that I might be supporting would ask those questions. I think that the customer would just be impressed that I'm trying to do something scientific with AI and incorporated someone other than, you know, the atmospheric physicist. I brought in mathematicians or other folks who actually understand artificial intelligence and machine learning <laughs> rather than you're a weatherman. Right? <laughs> so can I share yeah. the story of just see turtle and how that you can slowly now the state the, the state listen to you and... i'm sure if you want to yeah. well, how about you do it <laughs> no, I'll, I'll just very briefly I, I, we've been we've been using ai ml for cold studying sea turtles preparation and those are big decisions hundred thousand dollars over you know this is not army like uh, decision mm -hmm. but they didn't people in in the late 20 uh, 2000s the 2010s they didn't care and then one of my long-term collaborators 12 12 15 years uh, just when AI became popular, he said, so those models are artificial intelligence? <laughs> and then suddenly the light bulb went and, you know, then he started asking questions. And so I think the, the attitude towards AI ML is changing quite a bit now because it's not, not, not anymore like fancy, fancy methods. It's something that resonates. And uh, so I'm, that's, that's also where the question comes from. I, it, it feels like we're going to have a different, different kinds of questions and that we need to be prepared uh for for it it's, uh, but that, the, the long story is that i'm sorry I can't <laughs> there's a longer story yeah. <laughs> the longer story is that now every year that after dr tiso look at the model sample model the ipm run and then tell them that okay this period of time that you had to shut down the ship and then come out and save tiny the baby turtle and they do that so how how many turtles we save a year now? That be so it depends how big the cold stunning events yeah, are. So <laughs> Eighty percent on a small one, and then closer. not so good during Yuri. And don't let the ship come in, and then close that period of time. And actually, they make the the, the action with that. So I think is it, it takes ten years to build the trust and build the habit. And I think beside knowledge, beside trust, I think also habit. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good point. Like, there's still sailors that I've encountered that ask me, why should I use an ensemble model? And after initially giving them the bug eye stare of, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so even though we've been training ensemble models, continuing that example in Navy A school and C school, like the schools that those high schoolers are going through after they get into the Navy so they can learn to become observers, become forecasters. They get out on their ships and their chief says, no, I, I've always been doing it this way. You're going to do it my way. But chief, what about this? Do it my way. Okay, chief. And that's kind of, again, the rank where the old salty chief that you always see, like, you know, portrayed sort of thing, tells the forecaster, do it this way. And the forecaster ignores the ensemble models that they were taught about. Yes. It's been continuously fighting that. So building a habit of once we have some sort of machine learning type program that could be used, that's going to take even longer is yeah. to build that habit up. It will be take 10 years. And then if we start now, it will be happen in 10 years. And I mean, I think timing is an element too. 
So I, again, there's there's good aspects of numerical weather prediction that we we've, we've all been able to see, um, but the you know people making decisions, the common person out there uh, haven't haven't always been able to see that kind of thing. Um, when I first started at AFIT, uh, I, I hinted at this before. One, one area that I really helped was the the guys doing nuclear fallout, and in this country we stopped doing above ground atmospheric detonations of nuclear weapons um, in 1962. But we have all the data. But we launched a single balloon back with each one of these things. And um, and they were trying to figure out why the fallout pattern that was measured in the days to months after those detonations curved and did funny things when the balloon said the winds were this way. But so I introduced them to reanalysis. <laughs> and I said, I can tell you what the weather was, best scientific uh, assessment on June 2nd, 1952 for your, for your launch. And all of a sudden when they looked at that and then looked at the update six hours later and then, you know, update, wow, we can match these patterns. So it was a watershed event. Now we're gonna incorporate numerical weather prediction. We, we absolutely don't need any new tests. We don't have to worry about, you know, trying to collect other data with proxy type you know, fall out, or we can actually just use this older data and use the reanalysis. And what I've also found is that when you first started getting your cell phone forecasts, right, how many days did they show you? You know, hardly, you know, maybe two or three days. Now you, you actually get like 10 days on there and you can get hour by hour stuff. And it's not that bad. And you point that out to people. It's like, you know, my son's asking for, you know, his, his wedding, which is next Friday. And so I said, just look on your phone now. Stop asking me. <laughs> You're right, you know, I, I've gone as far as the model for you. Now, it, now it's on your phone. And so this is starting to help me people, the light go on. And, and then if we tell them AI was behind that and AI is behind this decision here, boom. Oh, well, maybe, maybe that'll help. So that's why I really agree with, you know, throwing that. No. I, I don't think it's right now is that AI just stood alone, but AI with a human expert together is like, that's a, a good marriage for now. I mean, yeah. for now. <laughs> so one of the, one of the concerns that I have from my world, and I'm not an AI ML expert, but just watching it evolve, and, and you brought this up a lot, Steve, is coherency yeah. that like, we have to present to our user base, a three-dimensional, four-dimensional atmosphere that is coherent. And so if AI ML is predicting one aspect of it this way and another aspect of it that way, and they don't match up, you know, like the precipitation is this, but the radiation fields didn't respond to that. Now we talked to, we actually had a, a Atmo.ai company that, that talked to us about, they were, they were doing actual, like the, the full global model. And then just from their perspective, it was, it was just working that, that as they tried to do the AI ML, like actual full model, that it was, you know, being relatively coherent. But even there, they were maxing out at like 49, I think was, was it something like that predicted variables. And we, we predicted our goal model like thousands. And so like, and, and again, all of those things need to be coherent because you can't plan, you know, from, from those. And so, so for me right now, AIML is kind of around the edge of like the modeling, the NWP is still the core, but you got AIML around the edges, either post-processing it better, or maybe helping with EA techniques, or maybe helping figure out the physics problems that are in there. Um, and, and so that's kind of where we're seeing things. Doing better parameterizations. No, yes. but, you know, I hate parameterizations, you know, because when you look under them, I said spit and bubble gum earlier, there's absolutely spit and bubble gum in every parameterization that's in a model. And every modeler knows this, right? You know, and if you go back and look at the code, and, you know, the old Fortran code on things, I don't know why I'm putting this in here just because, and guess what, we're still using it 40 years later. <laughs> right? You know, it, it, so I... That's why, I, uh, again, AI can help a lot with that kind of thing. But yes. but I, I want to say one more time, the correlation is huge in the coherency uh, yes. that you want to get all those kind of things. It's one of the reasons we started in what we call the weather cubes business is we wanted to get it right for different extinction for directed energy. Yes. But then the basically the guys flying jets said, do you have winds, temperature and humidity aloft information? I said, of course. And it corresponds with all the other information we're giving you. They were interested in that because then they could do the performance of their jets in the same war game scenario. And it, it all it all makes sense. And then we could get the logistics chain right. Right. Yes. Um, and, and, and make sure that we're tying back to whatever's happening in the next theater over. I know I've said that before, but it's worthwhile saying it. 
Yeah, I think this is a good place to have AI for, for weather because as we see that the, the weather data is very, very complex because <laughs> even we our predictors also carry its own error. There's every model, every instrument carry error. And in order to, to create a machine learning that it could work is right here. It's not Google, it's not IBM because we need a, a collaboration between the expert of the field with the machine learning, with, with the, the computer scientists to make something that is, is work for the, the complex data. And because we have, you know, day by day different, we have season different, we have geospatial different, we have region different, we have local error, we have global error, and we have like 3D data, we will have different kind of error, before the data we have different kind of error because the finer resolution you go, the more noise you have ahead of. And it's, it's, it's like, um, like it's, it's when we first look at it, it's like we're chasing our tail here, but 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 that's the problem we have. I that's that's my opinion. Jason, I think this was going to 1720, right? It's true. So we've we've only got a couple minutes left. Uh, I think uh, if there's any other questions out in the audience that have left before we then answer those and then go to a wrap up, maybe. Yeah, maybe let's wrap it up with what you. Yeah. What do you want to say? What would you like the scientific community to know? Just, just. So, are there any other questions? Want... First of all. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, since I started and we went that way to go, <laughs> Evan, how about you start this time? <laughs> sure, and I'll, I'll maybe set the tone of. I think I've said enough. Thank you for listing <laughs> <laughs> all the quantifications that I've had, and so I'll pass it down. <laughs> Well, I'm definitely the novice up here in, in comparison to all the expertise, but one thing that just continually is the resounding thing is communication. And weather is super complex, you guys know that. And even as Dr. Fiorino has alluded to some of the things that we've been trying to put out there for the directed energy community, they want a single value, they want a single address, but that's not how it works. And so probabilities and risks are really hard for people to grasp onto. And that, that's not just for the DOD, that goes down to the public and the general forecasts and knowing what to do. You know, do I respond to severe weather better or not? So it's something that we need to work on. And maybe again, AI is that maybe a step forward to simplifying things and going from there. Thanks, that's um, all. So just, we need to add some sensors, something that measures particles. We need something that measures turbulence, make it part of all weather sensing and numerical weather prediction, it's its time. The communities are starting to be believers. You guys are doing a great job. It's not just clouds. NWP is really something that's, that's changing the world. And it's good in that respect. I definitely agree, you know, the communication side of trying to get people to understand the probabilities and believe the probabilities. And also along with Evan, I've said enough here, but I will end with believing the probabilities. My my college's AMS group, the t-shirt we always had for being in, you know, coastal Florida was 50% chance this person's a meteorologist, <laughs> which immediately made everybody laugh and immediately made everybody, well, what does that actually mean? <laughs> so uh thank you very much for the questions. I hope we gave you guys many things to think think about and ideas that can go forward. Uh, Jason, do you want to wrap up? I just want to thank you guys all for talking to us. Thank everyone here for coming and having a very productive discussion.